A Rebel Witch, a Supernatural Spy Academy series. Spellcaster Spy Academy Book 2, written by Ashley McCleo, narrated by Ashley Stenner. Chapter 1 Afternoon was well underway when my friends and I pulled up to the iron gates of Spellcaster Spy Academy. Eva gripped my hand as Hunter spoke the password that would allow us entry. It's different this time, isn't it? Her eyes, the color of cornflowers, never left the cold metal that surrounded the school. I leaned back, contented to wait as Headmistress Wake's blue magic shimmered and swirled around Hunter's car. It seeped in through the window cracks and car vents, rippling across my skin and lifting every hair follicle in an effort to validate our worthiness. Undoubtedly, I replied, watching the Academy's prophetess symbol crack in half as the gates opened to allow us entry. How could it not feel different? So much had changed. At the start of last year, my peers knew me as the only witch in the last 40 years to claim the legacy route into the Academy. Not thinking others would see this as entitled and lazy, I waltzed right into school to find that many people resented my choice. Now I was one of two head junior spy masters for the grind year. While everyone would have bet on Alex, my boyfriend, being a shoe in for the male head junior spy master slot, I doubted that many believed I would snag the other position. I barely believed it still. Are you ladies nervous to meet with headmistress Wake? Hunter asked his bright green eyes latching onto Eva in the rearview mirror. Yeah, I'm nervous about that. Who knows what the battle axe will say, Eva whispered as she peered out the window. My heart ached for my best friend. While I'd been through a ton of shit last year, she'd undergone her fair share of traumatizing experiences too. You know that Hunter and I will be with you every step of the way, right? Alex twisted in his seat, his Caribbean blue gaze hard. I realize the headmistress didn't ask to see us, but I don't care. I'm not letting either of you deal with this alone. Ditto, Hunter said. For the billionth time since our little group had formed, gratitude overwhelmed me. My three best friends had been my rocks for the last year. As we began our grind year, the most difficult level at Spellcasters, I had a feeling I would lean on them even harder in the months to come. Finally, the cloud of blue magic dissipated, and the gate opened wide enough for us to drive through. Hunter pressed on the gas. Took long enough. He was right. It had taken a long time for the wards surrounding the school to accept us, much longer than last year. After the events of our calling year, I was very grateful that spellcasters had tightened their security. Not that I truly believed any magic would keep out a royal demon determined to break in, but it still made me feel better. Needing a moment of introspection before my meeting with Headmistress Wake, I gazed out the window. Dense trees lined the miles of drive, flashes of blue lake, and the gold spires topping Merlin Amphitheater, the birthplace of so many of my nightmares, punctuated the greenery. When the trees finally broke and the academy appeared, I sucked in a breath, as impressed by the school as the first time I'd laid eyes on it. Spellcasters always reminded me of the perfect mix of a Gothic cathedral and a German fairy tale castle, with its stone gargoyles, beautiful stained glass windows, and green topped towers at the four corners of the estate. It was unlike any place I'd ever seen. Hunter pulled around to the right side of a main building, where the students who kept cars at the academy parked alongside the staff and visitors. Some of our classmates were in the lot unpacking suitcases from their cars. Among them was a girl I hadn't expected to see again. Holy crap, I breathed. Look, it's Phoebe Pudiator. They let her re-enroll. Phoebe's parents had insisted that she leave school before our Beltane trial last year. As she hadn't completed the final trial, everyone assumed she'd been expelled. I wonder if Diana had anything to do with that, Alex mused. They've been best friends since they were young. Eva's lips flattened. She didn't like Phoebe much. Not only because the girl was rude to me last year, but because Hunter spilled the beans that he'd messed around with her before he met Eva. I understood how she felt. 
I'd experienced jealousy after I'd learned that Alex had kissed Diana before we started dating. I opened the car door and exited. Let's go find out what happened. Hey, Phoebe. I said, once we were close enough for her to hear. Phoebe had been talking to her mom, and when she turned around, shock flitted across her face. I supposed her reaction was natural. When she'd left the academy, her best friend and I still regarded each other as enemies. I'd never have approached Phoebe during our culling year. We're surprised to see you back, I continued. Phoebe's eyes darted to her parents. To be honest, I'm a little surprised to be back. I opened my mouth to respond, but Phoebe cut me off. Can you guys hang on? My parents are about to leave. We took a handful of steps back to give her privacy, and Phoebe went about saying her goodbyes. A few minutes later, her parents drove away, and Phoebe turned back to us, her face more relaxed than moments before. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to sound so short. It's just that Dad is scared to death about the curse of our year. We went to war over me returning to Spellcasters. I didn't want him changing his mind last minute. The curse. I'd forgotten that many of my classmates still believed that the curse was real. I wished that I could tell them they were safe, that the so-called curse was really more of a prophecy and only applied to Alex and me. But I couldn't. Telling the truth would mean spilling too many dangerous secrets. His concern is understandable, I said. Of course it is, but that doesn't mean I'll just accept not being able to follow my dream, Phoebe said, especially after I convinced him to let me come back. It took nearly as much debate with the headmistress to make it happen. Like, seriously, so much work. Thankfully, Di vouched for me. Did you have to do an internship? Alex asked, clearly curious about how deep nepotism ran at Spellcasters. Phoebe nodded. Kind of. Her eyes flashed to Eva and me, and she bit her lip. I assumed she might know a little of what happened during our internship. Thanks to Dad's connections, a master poisoner took me on as an apprentice. Not my first choice, I'll admit, but Headmistress Wake approved it. Beggars can't be choosers. What about a Beltane trial? Hunter asked. I will have to take my own mini Beltane trial within the first week of classes, Phoebe shrugged. It sucks because I don't get a partner, but it'll be worth it. Sounds like you lucked out, Eva commented flatly. Definitely, Phoebe replied, and then her eyes lit up. She threw her hand into the air to wave at someone behind us. Hey, girl. I turned to find Diana, headmistress Wake's daughter and my once enemy, approaching. With almost unparalleled self-assurance, an aquiline nose, a statuesque frame, and long blonde hair, Diana always reminded me of a supermodel walking the catwalk. As soon as she reached us, Diana pulled Phoebe into a hug. When they broke apart, the headmistress's daughter faced the rest of us. Welcome back. I heard you four experienced an interesting summer internship. That's one word for it. I muttered. Diana arched an eyebrow. Her steely blue eyes latched onto me. Right. Well, Mother is waiting to speak with you and Eva in her office. You can leave your luggage outside the car, and someone will bring it up. It's all tagged, right? We confirmed that it was, and Diana waved for us to follow her. Although I didn't need an escort to the headmistress's office, I said nothing. The only other night I'd been there, Diana's other friend, Tabitha, had been killed. No one wanted to be reminded of that day. Alex and Hunter trudged behind us, and while Diana shot them a surprised look, she didn't comment or stop them. We entered through an ivy-concealed side door near the back of the academy. I'd never seen the doorway before, but wasn't shocked by its existence. A place like Spellcasters was sure to have many secrets I hadn't discovered. Some I probably never would. As we walked down the corridors, a sense of coming home overtook me. A tension that I hadn't realized I'd been holding in my neck dissipated. Diana spun around to walk backward and face us. Notice anything different? We were passing the main entryway to the school. Two stairwells, with a black and green banner bearing the spellcaster's prophetess mascot hanging between them, 
curved and climbed up the three primary levels. The hallways led to upper-level classrooms and the towers, in which initiates, second years, academics, and staff lived during the term. My gaze climbed upward to the only other distinguishing factor of the entryway, the enormous, circular, stained-glass windows that depicted the four elements. Even though witches didn't use elemental magic, that was a fey characteristic, we still revered nature, after all. Our power was just modified energy, and that came from nature too, albeit indirectly. But as far as I could tell, the windows looked the same. Unable to deduce what Diana was referring to, I shook my head. I give up. What changed? Her hand twirled in the air, and graceful, thin fingers wiggled. Wards. They added about two dozen since last term, half of which were put in place after your internship. She darted a conspiratorial glance left, then right, before locking eyes with me again. So a fay court is working with the demons, huh? I'm not supposed to know what happened during your internship, but Mother couldn't help but get overexcited when she told Father. I overheard. Yeah. I said, Eva actually discovered it. Diana's intense stare, so like her mother's, shifted to Eva, who sighed. <sighs> I found fey runes covered in blood all around Portland. Somehow, the combination of blood and runes, which don't usually require blood, lets demons into our world. Hmm. Diana chewed her lip and turned back around, apparently needing a minute to absorb the new information. Good luck. I barely understand it. And I witnessed everything. Even before we found ourselves fighting for our lives in the dank Portland underground, everything had been so damn confusing. We hadn't had any idea what the fey runes or blood meant, or why Eva's demon scars reacted to other demons' presence. As a greater demon had made them, and not a royal of hell, they shouldn't have been so sensitive. Nothing like mine, which was a curse from Queen Ishtar herself. Or so we thought. During the battle, we discovered that the succubus who had scarred Eva had been carrying King Lucifer's child. His essence and blood ran through the succubus, and now by extension, Eva. My best friend was demon-touched, just like me, which meant that she had a target on her back, too, and most likely that we both had a crap load of questions to answer before Headmistress Wake set us loose in the academy. I inhaled a deep breath, preparing myself for the formidable witch who was the headmistress of our academy. Let the fun begin. Chapter 2 Headmistress Priscilla Wake closed the door, sealing us inside her office. Take a seat. She gestured to the chairs in front of her desk. I arched an eyebrow. The only other time I'd been in her office, there had been two winged back chairs. Today, there were four. The headmistress had clearly expected Hunter and Alex to join the meeting. Eva and I claimed the middle seats, and our boyfriends winged us protectively. Immediately, my best friend began to squirm. I placed a gentle hand on her arm, letting her know that I'd take the lead. You wanted to talk about our internships, Headmistress Wake? Yes. The master of our school situated herself in her chair gracefully and nodded, business as usual. I'd like a full debriefing of what happened, straight from you two ladies. Fine. Not about to lay the burden on Eva, I launched into the story. Nothing I said seemed to faze the headmistress. Not news of the fey runes that had been covered in blood to transport demons into our realm, or the battle we'd fought below the city of Portland. Emotion had no place on her face, and although I recognized that it shouldn't, she was a trained spy after all, her reaction frustrated me more with each passing minute. And that's what happened. I finished and leaned back in my chair, waiting for her to grill me. Instead, Headmistress Wake rose and went to her liquor cabinet. She plucked a crystal decanter filled with brown liquid from her stash and served herself a two-fingered pour. 
As if she'd forgotten that we were there, the headmistress turned to look at us. After a story such as that, I'd offer you some, but you're underage. That makes total sense why we take a mixology workshop every year then. Hunter muttered under his breath. Wake shot him a glare heated enough to singe the hair off his head, but said nothing before tossing the drink back. When she returned to her seat, she folded her hands in front of her. Since last year's Beltane trials, I've been conducting research on demon-touched witches. So the two reported cases. Alex muttered. The headmistress didn't shift her gaze from Eva and me. Yes, those cases, Mr. Wardwell. She leaned forward so that her elbows rested on her desk. It seems that while the afflicted witches shared symptoms, their experiences of being demon-touched varied wildly. Some hypothesize that it comes down to the royal demon's intent when they touch you. All we know is it's not only the act of touching that produces a mark. Otherwise, many black witches could make the claim that they are demon-touched after making a deal with evil. It's because of this, individuality in marks, that I must ask. Are you too in control of your demon marks? A deep line formed between my eyebrows. I hadn't expected that question, although perhaps I should have. If she made her way into this world, Ishtar would be able to control me through my mark. The same could be said for Lucifer and Eva. Thankfully for us, the King and Queen of Darkness were still in hell. I considered Wake's question carefully. So far, my mark had reacted to a demon's presence, but I'd never felt out of control, and until the Hellgate opened and spilled demons into our world, I suspected that it would stay that way. Or at least, I hoped so. I'm in charge, Eva confirmed. Me too. We both felt demons in Portland before we saw them. Although, like you mentioned, the sensations were different. But I never felt out of control. I was hoping you'd say that, the headmistress said. Clearly, other students know that you have been through difficulties, but they know little else on the matter. I would like to keep it that way. She arched her brows. Eva and I nodded. I didn't really feel like spreading the word around that Ishtar, the Queen of Hell, could control me, or that Lucifer could control Eva, or even that we could sense demons in our presence. Only our families, the Paranormal Intelligence Agency, and the Spellcasters instructors knew, which I preferred. Fitting in was already hard enough without being demon-touched. I also want you to know that we've enhanced the Academy, Headmistress Wake continued. The number of wards we've set up on the grounds and within the school is unprecedented. As you may have noticed, I've reinforced the boundary gate myself. Visitors will be permitted on school grounds only if they have met certain stringent requirements. Keep in mind, that's nice and all, Alex said, uncharacteristically cutting her off. But we're in our grind here. We have to undertake missions off Academy grounds, so it seems almost pointless to spend all this energy when we'll be in danger anyway. I'll ignore your rude interruption, Mr. Wardwell, Headmistress Wake glared at Alex. After all, you've been through a trying time, but don't let it happen again, she resumed, addressing primarily Eva and me. As I was about to say, the wards are not just for your safety, they are for the safety of all the students. We hope that if Mr. Alexander Wardwell and Miss Dane do not go on missions together, that threat will be lessened. As I recall, Alexander, you mentioned that the Royals of Hell have made it clear that they want you and Miss Dane, or am I wrong on that point? We can't be separated, Alex said, his tone firm. I could practically feel the frustration vibrating off of him. Odie and I have to stick together. That means going on our missions together. Headmistress Wake's lips flattened. I understand that you are an item and wish to look after one another, but honestly, Mr. Wardwell, I cannot allow such things. It's much too risky, like putting a target on your backs. And seeing as this is your grind year, the trials before you will be risky enough. She shook her head. And then there's another matter of a certain event taking place at Spellcasters this year. An event? Hunter leaned forward curious as ever. 
Like initiate trials? Or a dance? I refrained from rolling my eyes. Yeah, Hunter, she's talking about a dance. You will learn of them tonight, at the Grind and Crucible Welcome Feast. Why can't you tell us now? Eva asked. It would be unfair to the rest of the students. The headmistress looked as though she wished she hadn't said anything at all. As much as I believe that you, Miss Dane, and Mr. Wardwell are capable witches, on this point I'm immovable. You will not be sent on missions together, and that is final. As I respect what you've been through, I wanted to be the one to tell you and inform you that we'll be doing everything in our power to keep you safe. But we have to be together, Alex shot out of his chair. Mr. Wardwell, sit down this instant. You don't understand. Odie and I, before he could press harder, I grabbed his arm and squeezed it tight. It will be fine. Let's go. My gaze shifted to the headmistress. Are we excused? Headmistress Wake gave an impressed nod at my unusual restraint. Yes, that will be all. I stood and pulled a seething Alex behind me. While it was sweet that he wanted to stay by my side, it would do no good to argue with the headmistress on the matter of our missions. She didn't know that Alex and I were descendants of the famed wizard Merlin and Morgan Le Fay, the notorious witch who some believed was part Fay. No one did, except Eva, Hunter, Alex, and me. Even after the Queen of Hell branded me, we hadn't told anyone else. It felt too private. And because we weren't sure how Morgan and Merlin, or m and as I thought of them, were related to all this, we wanted to keep it to ourselves. At least for now. Chapter 3 When we exited Headmistress Wake's office, Diana was still waiting outside. That was fast. Her eyes darted to each of us in turn. Yeah, I glanced at Alex. With his fists clenched and his jaw tightened, he looked ready to explode. I shifted my grip from his upper arm to the tight ball of his hand and squeezed. Most of it, we expected. The rest, we'll mull over. Diana took in the whole interaction with hawk-like intensity. Right, well, I guess it's time to show you to your rooms. My eyebrows pulled together. We all knew the general location of the second-year tower. I'd assumed they would label our rooms, and entry would be voice-activated, like last year. Why do you need to show us the way? Hunter asked, clearly on my wavelength. Diana twirled her hands high in the air, once again indicating the wards. Spy master level students have their own floor. Our level includes additional security to prevent jealous pranks from other students. My stomach dipped at the mention of jealousy. Few people had as much reason for others to be jealous of them as I did. I'd sucked at everything at the start of last year and completed the term at the top of the class. And then there was the matter of my family's influence and wealth. Both incited envy in others. I'm the first spy master in our year to arrive. Diana placed the word in air quotes because the school was her home, and aside from her summer internship, she'd been here the whole time. So I get the job of showing the rest of you how to break the wards and gain access to our floor. After that, we use normal voice activation to enter our rooms. She led us to the entryway and up the stairs to the third floor. We turned the same way we would have gone if we were heading to our old tower, passing paintings of ex-spy masters and celebrated headmasters as we went. Diana chatted the entire way, which I was sure the rest of us appreciated. It gave us time to think about our meeting with the headmistress. About halfway down the hall, I was snapped out of my musings when we took an unexpected left turn down a narrow side corridor. I cocked my head, lost. I would have passed this hallway daily to get to the initiate tower, but somehow I didn't remember it at all. Where did this corridor come from? Hunter asked, once again on my level. Thank the universe I'm not the only confused person here. Diana's lips curled up in a smile. It was always here. It's hidden from initiates. A lot of things are. Mother believes that fewer distractions allow us to hone our focus better. 
I snorted a laugh because the hallway we found ourselves walking down was the epitome of distraction, lined as it was by old weapons, artifacts of espionage, and accolades that the school had earned from the United States government, and even one from the Irish government. Each item was interesting and clearly valuable, as they were kept behind sturdy, likely magically reinforced cases. But one artifact caught my eye more than the others. It was an ancient blade, studded with a ruby handle. I paused long enough to read the name inscribed on the metal. The Realm Slicer. A shudder ran up my spine. That doesn't sound ominous at all. We proceeded down the hall for a couple minutes more, until the corridor ended. A single door, painted a dark spellcaster's green, stood at the end. Why is it green? The door to the initiate tower had been basic black. From what I remembered, most other doors in the academy were also a neutral hue. But maybe they painted them yearly? Diana grinned. The doors to the student, academic, and alumni buildings are all painted spellcaster's colors. The initiate one is black because we're often kept in the dark or clueless at that stage. But as grindier students, we've earned green. Good grief, this school and their freaking symbolism. I wondered how many other things I'd missed when I'd been floundering through my initiate year. In fact, only one of my friends looked unsurprised. Alex. He'd probably read about the doors in one of the bajillion books he'd devoured. What are the other colors? Eva asked. Crucible students get silver. Diana said. Academics and alumni earn white since they're the most enlightened. If you ask me. Well, that's all interesting. I interrupted. What do you say we get inside? I have to pee. I didn't actually have to use the restroom, but I wanted to avoid a lecture, get to my room, and regroup a little. Right, Diana said. The voice activation on the tower door coincides with your fingerprints. Make sure your right pointer finger is on the handle when you grip it, and say your name. She demonstrated, and the door clicked open. The aroma of coffee filled my nostrils, followed by Sage, telling that a staff member had been in the tower to cleanse it before term. Both were scents that I associated with the initiate tower, but another aroma floated around the grind tower. Something unusual, almost acrid. I tilted my head, unable to place it. Rue. Alex wrinkled his nose. Diana nodded. An additional measure to ward off demons. She walked through the door. About half our class was already inside the tower, chatting and catching up with friends they had not seen in weeks. The grind tower looked much like the initiate tower except nicer. They had upgraded our furniture. The tables were all a dark, gleaming wood, and the chairs and couches were a rich brown leather instead of gray cloth. Whereas our old dorm had one fireplace, this tower had two. The change was most welcome. It meant more people could sit in front of the fire during Maine's bitterly cold winter. To my great surprise, there were even a couple entertainment options like a pool and ping-pong tables in the common space, a luxury we didn't have last year. A tightly wound spiral staircase climbed toward the bedrooms. Domed at the apex, a lunette window allowed natural light to stream inside during the day and would give us a glimpse of the stars at night. Wow. I breathed. It's beautiful and more welcoming than the initiate tower. Mother says the higher we rise, the more privileges we accrue, Wait till you see our rooms. Diana waggled her eyebrows. A grin spread across my face, only to falter a second later when I realized just how many people were staring at us coolly. My eyebrows knitted together at the cold welcome from students who I considered friends. What's up there, butts? Eva whispered as we walked by a small group of people who blatantly turned away from us. Diana waited until we'd climbed halfway up the stairwell to answer. When they arrived, they got their rankings. Some aren't happy with where they're placed. Oh. Right. The rankings. I take it those who looked like they've had the most poo shoved under their noses got emissary spy? Eva asked. Yup. They think they deserve sorcerer spy. Or maybe even spy master. Diana arched an eyebrow, which made my stomach twist. Don't worry. Mother says it happens every year. 
We are all competitive at spellcasters, or else we wouldn't be here. Once they realize that being in our good graces is to their advantage, they'll warm up again. I scoffed. Diana was always so confident and blunt that it took me by surprise. Although in this instance, I hoped she was right. I spent the majority of last year being disliked. I didn't need a repeat. We climbed to the top floor and came face to face with another green door. Diana pivoted to face us. This is where you say the incantation that will allow you passage. Like this. She extended her hand to hover inches above the gold knob. Dominum. Purple magic flowed out of her hand. It shimmered and undulated around the doorknob, which then turned on its own accord and opened. It's that simple, she said. Just be gentle. If you're mad or upset, try to cool it before you open the door. One year, someone spoke the incantation when they were angry, and the door flew off its hinges. Oh, and don't tell anyone the password. Only spymasters up here. It was no wonder why others were upset they hadn't made spymaster. I doubted that this was the only perk we'd get. Thanks. I guess I'll see you at the feast, I said. Moving past Diana, yup, mother says she has a surprise for the whole school. Her blue eyes lit up with excitement. Can't wait. My room was the second one on the right, squished between Diana's and Alex's. After realizing that I wasn't sharing a bathroom with Eva this year, a wave of sadness overtook me. We are not roomies. I stuck my lip out. It's the end of an era. Eva gave me an understanding smile and wrapped her arm around my shoulder. I think all the spymaster level bathrooms are private. There's not even a communal toilet on this floor. And judging by all the books and desks, that room over there is a special spymaster only library. She pointed to the first room on the opposite side of the stairs. We probably should have expected that the dorms would be nicer. Remember the King's Castle? I nodded. Who could forget the Crucible dorm? That place was off the chain. Still, it's sad knowing that you won't be barging in on me whenever you want, I said. Eva chuckled. Yeah, I'm sure you'll totally miss that, but I'll be a few doors away, so I have no worries. I'll knock until you let me in. If you don't, well, I think I can do a decent Odie impression. Maybe I'll trick the voice activation enchantment. We shared a laugh, and after one last hug from my girlfriend... Everyone separated to explore their private spaces. A plaque bearing my name glimmered on my door. However, this year, the word Spymaster had been added below. I took in the title with awe, proud of my achievements. When I stepped inside the room, I found that it was at least twice the size of last year's dorm. A private bathroom stood off to one side, already stocked with plush white towels and smelling of black currant. My desk resembled one that might be in a low-level executive's office. And then there was the view. Last year, my room had looked out upon the lake, and I'd secretly thought that couldn't be beat. But I'd been wrong. As I gazed out my window, a vast expanse of the forest swept before me. In the distance, hills rose and fell, and even further away, blue mountains soared toward the heavens. Sunlight dappled the greenery, dancing off the trees. I imagine that in the autumn, the scenery would be spectacular. I sat on my bed, taking everything in, and my lips curled up. I had earned this. For months, I had been terrible at magic, and it wasn't even my fault. After Alex released the bind on my power, I'd improved drastically. It was like I'd reaped all the benefits of my hard work in mere days. But the rest of our class didn't know that, and they didn't know that I had been spellbound as a child because like Alex and my connection to Morgan and Merlin, I hadn't told them. I doubt there's a single couple in the Academy's history that has more secrets than us. Unfortunately, I couldn't make our secret public, not without putting everyone around me in danger. Chapter 4 The feast that marked the beginning of the new academic year was held in Agnes Sampson Hall. To mark the occasion, I wore my favorite green maxi dress. Eva dressed up too, sporting fitted black trousers, a white blouse, and oversized emerald jewelry. She looked as though she belonged on Wall Street. The green necklace goes amazing with your hair, I said, 
only a tad envious of my friend's bright red hair. She wrapped her arm through mine and gave me a grin. We both look awesome. The guys had said they'd be in the common space waiting for us. When we reached the bottom of the winding stairs, I spotted them among a crowd of female students. No surprise there. Eva and I had lucked out snagging the talented, charming, intelligent, and hot-as-hell Wardwell cousins as our boyfriends. People, ladies in particular, couldn't help but be drawn to our guys. Before we reached Hunter and Alex, someone called my name, and I twisted to find my friend Amethyst approaching. Hey, girl, I said, relieved to see a friendly face. A few peers, many who had congratulated me at the end of our culling year, were definitely serving me some side eye. Hey, ladies, looking good. Amethyst's brown eyes sparkled nearly as much as the shimmering black skirt she wore. Are you excited about the feast tonight? I heard Headmistress Wake is going to reveal something huge. I heard the same thing, I said. I guess that's why we were told to come back so early. A large group of our peers walked by, and yet another person, Kira Johnston, gave me the stink eye. I sighed, and Eva, catching the interaction, spoke up. The feast will start in a few minutes, she said. We should get going. She waved Hunter and Alex over, and the guys joined us. When we reached Agnes Sampson Hall, it was already packed. The staff, crucibles, and the rest of our class sat at tables, waiting. On the stage, Headmistress Wake was chatting with Professor Umbra of Conjuring. We were still scoping for open spots when an owl hooted through the halls, proclaiming the hour. Amethyst said she'd catch us later, and flitted off to sit at a table with Mina Kohler, one of her closest friends. Not wanting to be standing around when the feast started, Alex, Hunter, Eva, and I approached a table on the far side of the room. Do you mind if we sit here? I asked the two Crucible students, who were already sitting there. I recognized them vaguely, but didn't know their names. The guy's dark brown eyes opened wide, but the girl I'd pulled up a chair next to looked less surprised by our approach. Sure, she said. Once we'd settled in, she leaned close to me. I see that you're already avoiding your fellow grind students. Welcome to what it's like to be head junior spy masters. I've been in the top spot for my class two years running, which has made me incredibly popular, let me tell you. She rolled her eyes and held out her hand. I'm Sam Pines. Welcome to the club. And I'm Andre Allen. It's my first year as head junior spy master, but I am feeling the pain too. The guy smiled wide and perfect. White teeth gleamed against his onyx skin. Odette, I said, shaking their hands even as my heart sank. Sam and Andre had been sitting by themselves. I already felt set apart from the rest of my class, and we'd only been here a few hours. Were things only going to get worse? I didn't have much time to ponder the question, because Headmistress Wake stepped up to the mic and cleared her throat. The gabbing crowd quieted instantly. Welcome back to Spellcasters. She spread her arms wide, and everyone applauded. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, all healthy and well. As we embark upon the next academic year, I'm pleased to say that we have exciting surprises in store. She snapped her fingers. The lights dimmed, and I chuckled. Headmistress Wake was stern and often uptight, but she had a tiny flair for the dramatic. Usually, I like to allow our students to feast before the evening speeches. But this year, I need to prepare you for what's to come. For this year, at the end of the feast, I will ask you to make a choice. A choice? Eva whispered as a curious murmur flew up from the crowd. The headmistress clapped, and someone walked out from the side of the stage. I sat up straight in my chair immediately recognizing the man dressed in a blood-red cloak and black suit. Headmaster Ezra, I whispered. Good evening, students. Headmaster Ezra had stopped to stand next to Headmistress Wake, although his voice boomed over the hall without aid from the microphone. I thank you for allowing me back into your lovely academy. Myself and Headmistress Wake have exciting news for the grind and crucible classes of spellcasters. 
He glanced at our headmistress. She inclined her head. Please, Ezra, do the honors. Even from where I sat near the back, the vampire's long canines were visible when he beamed. Since their teeth weren't normally that pronounced, I figured he must be showing them off, which was kind of gross and freaky. Thank you, headmistress. The vampire rubbed his hands together as if he were about to give us the treat of our lives. Then he flung his arms wide, and the cloak he wore billowed up behind him. Ladies and gentlemen, the Society of Spies has been deliberating this event for decades and has finally permitted the four United States spy schools to make it a reality. He paused dramatically, and his smile grew wider. I'm pleased to announce that this year we shall hold the first inaugural spy games. Every muscle in my body stiffened. All around me, excited chatter rose, but it fell nearly as fast when Headmistress Wake clapped for silence. Headmaster Ezra continued, The purpose of the games is to promote friendly rivalry and forge bonds between the four magical spy schools of the United States, Night Dwellers, Spellcasters, the Fey Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts, and the Shifter Academy of Spies. But of course, there will be prizes too. Each champion from the winning school will receive $20,000 in addition to another little bonus. He began to walk around the stage, his eyes piercing the crowd, teasing us as the excitement over what the bonus could be mounted. As you know, each academy insists that their students undergo internships over the summer. Whoever wins the tournament will have their choice of study, or in the case of graduating students, employment. These internships include global opportunities. A gasp went up from the crowd. That was huge. The United States was home to many amazing witches, but so were other countries, especially the European and Asian schools, where witching magic had run in bloodlines for centuries. But the U.S. government didn't allow students to study with non-Americans as part of our curriculum because they needed as much control over us as possible. This was the chance of a lifetime. Yes, it's all very exciting, I know. Now for the bit you might not like to hear. Headmaster Ezra said, As each school has three academic levels in attendance, the headmasters and headmistresses have decided to select two students from each of the upper classes to take part in the tournament. Whether you will throw your hat into the ring is your choice, but I advise you not to take this lightly. If selected, you must participate in each game, and these games will be dangerous. Around me, a few people murmured excitedly. Thank you, Headmaster Ezra, for that rousing invitation, Headmistress Wake said, taking control of the mic. The vampire bowed, then leapt off the stage and went to sit at the table with Professors Umbra, Tittlebaum, and Despina. As Headmaster Ezra said, two students from both the Grind and Crucible years are eligible to participate. However, I have made the decision that for my school, the five grind and crucible year students with the rank of spy master get first pick. If they decline, I will appraise the other applicants and select those I believe will best represent our school. You have until the end of dinner to decide whether to submit your name for consideration. The headmistress paused, and her face became serious. Be advised that Headmaster Ezra is correct in stating that these games will be dangerous. They will be on par with the missions we send you on. And speaking of, those who take part in the games are not exempt from any regular schoolwork, including missions. If a spy game event takes place during an exam or on a deadline date, professors will give the school champions extensions, but not exemptions. That being said, I will leave you to your decision. She clapped her hands, and waiters rushed out from the sides of the room. Dinner is served. Servers began setting massive platters down in the center of the tables so that students could serve themselves family style. I barely noticed them stopping at ours to deposit plates of chicken, beef, mac and cheese, roasted vegetables, and other delicious smelling dishes. I was too engrossed in what I'd heard. The waiters left, and still no one at our table had spoken, and I knew why. 
everyone at our table was ranked spymaster. We had first choice to enter the competition. The quiet had almost become unbearable when someone bumped into my chair. I'm so entering. Are you guys? Diana was breathless with excitement, as if she'd run a mile and not across the room. Her gaze shifted from me to Alex and back. She would want to know if we were in, because if we were, as the head junior spy masters for the grind year, we'd get chosen over her. Still, no one spoke, and Diana moved on to stare at Hunter and Eva. They were both spy masters, same as her. Eva shook her head. I'm not even going to try. Although, I could use the money for college and grad school after spellcasters. I wrinkled my nose. Since the day I'd met her, Eva had insisted that she was not going into espionage after spellcasters. She wanted to be an archaeologist, but her parents had bribed her to attend spellcasters. They'd wanted her to have the clout that being a graduate of spellcasters assured. After our internships, I'd hoped that she'd changed her mind, but I guess not. But the grind will be hard enough, Eva continued, and after what happened this summer, I don't need the extra stress. Hunter nodded. Me either. I'll stick to my studies. He wrapped an arm around Eva's shoulders, and my heart swelled. Hunter might want to participate in the tournament. Knowing him, he probably did, but he was staying for Eva. They were so sweet together. Good. Less competition for me. Diana's gaze shot back to me. I squirmed beneath her intensity. What does she do? Take staring lessons from her mom or something? I dropped my eyes to the table. I wanted to enter. The chance to study with an elite master warper was incredibly enticing. I'd studied with a lower level master for my internship, but there was so much more to learn, like time walking. If a warper was capable of time walking, they were the best of the best. There were only a handful of them in the world, and none in the United States. My thoughts flitted to Master Mariuka, an elder warper in the wild Carpathian mountains of Romania. It was said that she had time-traveled more than any witch in living memory. She took on students, but never for money. Instead, Mariuka taught only those who had proved themselves to be exceptional. If anyone could teach me to time walk, it would be her. And if I won this tournament, I'd surely be proving myself exceptional, right? Not only that, but my judging peers could no longer deny that I'd earned my position. I'm in. Can't pass up getting first shot at the good jobs, now can I? Sam said suddenly. Me too, Andre agreed a moment later. Not me, Alex said. I have private healing lessons this year with Professor Medulla, in addition to classes. That should keep me plenty busy. Diana fist pumped the air. Yes! Alex's reasoning was as good as any, although I suspected that wasn't his only motive for turning down the games. I bit my lip and decided it was best to get this over with. I'm going to do it. Alex's face hardened, but Diana demanded my attention more by slapping me hard on the shoulder. Yeah, Dane. It's a good thing we made up last year, huh? Yeah, I agreed. Hell, if we hadn't, I would have insisted that Alex participate so I wouldn't have to partner with Diana. But there was no need for that now. Awesome. I can't wait to tell Mother. Diana dashed off and... Against my better judgment, my eyes shifted to Alex. He shook his head, and in the thin set of his lips, I read frustration. He did not agree with my choice. I inhaled a soft breath. Later, when we were alone, I was sure to be in for quite the talk. Chapter 5 At the end of the feast... I hung back to tell Headmistress Wake that I was interested in being the spellcaster's champion. Once I'd been assured a spot, I left Agnes Sampson Hall and had just caught sight of Eva and Hunter when Alex swooped in. He wrapped his hand around my wrist. Can we take a walk? His eyes blazed with intensity, even though his tone was measured and careful. I nodded as my stomach twisted into knots. Across the room, Eva shot me a sympathetic look but I couldn't say no to him. He was my boyfriend. 
And even though after eight months we still hadn't said it out loud because I was weird about relationships and needed to move slowly, I loved him. Plus, Alex's frustration over my choice was justified. I'd done the exact opposite of what Eminem told us to do. Even though I realized that about halfway through the feast, I'd stuck by my choice. In my defense, this wasn't the first time Alex and I would be separated. Our internships had been hours from each other, and after that, we'd lived on opposite coasts for three weeks. We hadn't wanted to part in either instance, but a healing internship with Tiberius Thorne had been too good an opportunity for Alex to pass up. And what would our parents have said if we'd told them we always needed to be together? It wouldn't have gone over well in my house. We broke from the crowd and walked out the front door of the academy toward the lake. Anxiety bubbled inside me. Alex hadn't spoken a word, but I knew he was angry. Sweat began to trickle down my back as I debated what to say, how to defend my actions. Why did you do that? The question burst from him as we stepped onto the lake path. Morgan and Merlin said we needed to stick together. We can't help that Headmistress Wake will separate us on missions, but there's no need for you to leave the safety of spellcasters outside of those, especially without me. A swath of nerves eased at his statement. I arched an eyebrow. The safety of spellcasters? You mean the same place where three of our classmates died last year? Alex's cheeks darkened, and my tone softened accordingly. I'm not sure we're safer here than anywhere else, babe. Alex's lips flattened. You heard Diana and the headmistress talking about all the extra precautions. They might be oblivious to what's happening with Morgan and Merlin, but they know about the demons. I bit my lower lip, still not buying it. I'm sure their wands are all fine and dandy against a lesser demon, but Ishtar or Lucifer, or even the prince and princesses of hell, no one has been up against them in living memory. I paused, realizing that my statement was no longer true. Alex, Hunter, and I had gone up against the Queen of Hell just a few weeks ago. Well, no one except us, I amended, and we needed a fair bit of luck to get through that. I patted the spot where my totem, a ruby and moonstone encrusted necklace that had once belonged to Morgan Le Fay, rested beneath the scoop neck of my dress. At my touch, the totem warmed, as if asking if I needed anything. It was strange how the magical object operated but it had saved my butt a few times. So while I wished I understood it better, I wasn't about to complain. And no offense to the headmistress, but if any of the royals of hell want to breach the academy wards, they'll figure out a way, I continued. We already know that they're experimenting with new methods to infiltrate our realm. A few wards won't stop them. Suddenly a crack rang through the night as Alex turned and slammed his fist into a tree. Damn it, Odie, why are you making this so hard? Can't you see you're putting yourself in unnecessary danger? I threw up my hands. Of course I can, but I can't help it. I have something to prove to people. They don't think I'm good enough for the spymaster position. I want to show them otherwise. You can't judge me for that. Not after taking the internship with Tiberius that was three hours away when there was a perfectly respectable healer in Portland. You can't judge me for wanting the best, because I know that's what you want, too. He jerked back. I pressed my lips together hard. Had I gone too far? We'd both agreed that Alex's internship was important, just like mine was. There were things Thorne could teach him that no other healer in the country could. Considering our circumstances, having a skilled healer around seemed paramount. And as not a single warper lived in Seattle, separating had been a fair compromise. I still believed that. So why had I thrown that in his face? It was a dick move. This choice might change my future, babe. My voice softened. Imagine if I won and got to study with a time walker. I understand the draw, and you deserve to study with the best, because I honestly think that one day you could be among them. Alex released a long exhale. But I don't like the idea of you running around other academies alone. There will be hundreds of magicals at those games, watching whatever torture the heads of each school cooks up. Three other champions from Spellcasters are going, and Headmistress Wake. It's not like I'll be alone. On our missions, we'll only have a partner, but you're not arguing about those anymore. 
I'm not fine with the arrangements of our missions. Alex clenched his fists at his sides. I've been pissed as hell all day long that Headmistress Wake won't give in to what we asked. Pissed that I can't just tell her the whole truth because who knows how that could affect our futures. And mostly, I'm furious I don't know what's happening to us. He practically roared the last word. Pivoting to face the tree, Alex struck it five more times before his hands fell to his side. I stepped back, watching his arms tremble. I'd expected anger, but this was a whole new level. He'd mentioned it before, the infamous Wardwell temper, but I'd never witnessed it for myself. My Alex remained in control, even in the most dire of circumstances. Hey, I whispered, you have to calm down. Alex's shoulders relaxed. A few seconds later, he turned to me and I saw tears running down his face. How can you say that, Odie? How can I be calm? So much shit is going to happen this year, and I won't be able to watch over you. You don't have to, I said. We're a team. We look out for each other. This isn't a one-sided thing. It never has been. Remember Ishtar? His lips quirked up a touch. How could I forget my girlfriend coming to save me from the Queen of Hell? Alex shook his head. But that isn't the point, sweets. I know this isn't one-sided. It's just that I can't bear to lose you. I would break, shatter, I... His mouth snapped shut. He gulped and glanced down at his hands. Blood covered them, but he wiped it off on his pants before closing the distance between us to inches. Odie, I love you. My breath hitched. Long ago, I suggested that I be the one to say it first. I was weird with relationships and had never told any guy I loved them. I hadn't wanted to feel pressured to move too fast. Alex had agreed at the time, but apparently the restriction had been too much. And honestly, it was kind of silly. Even though he'd been a massive dick the day we'd met, I'd fallen in love with Alex Wardwell right then and there. So why hadn't I been able to tell him in the months since then? Why had I felt the need to wait? There was too much to lose. A lump formed in my throat. There was still an enormous amount to lose. If Morgan and Merlin were right, Alex and I were destined to accomplish great things and have unparalleled love. I hadn't wanted to risk starting something like that, only to have it all crash to the floor. But just because I didn't say the words didn't mean that I didn't feel them. For months, love had burned in my soul. It was time that I told him. My hands dropped to clasp his, and I brought both pairs to my heart, which was thumping hard. They rested against my totem, and the object began to glow bright red. Alex's totem, a ring with a moonstone to match the one in my necklace, lit up the exact same shade. Red light illuminated our faces, making them shine otherworldly and beautiful in the dimming evening light. My lips tugged upward. The damn totems were so frustrating and mysterious, but they sure knew how to set the mood. Odie? I realized that I'd been silent for too long. I'd left the poor guy hanging. I pressed a finger to his lips. I'm sealing this moment in my memory, I whispered. Removing my finger, I looked deeply into his eyes and the three tiny words that I'd fretted about for months didn't seem so scary. They felt like the only truth in this world. I love you too, Alex. He didn't even speak, only pulled me close so that our lips crashed together. We kissed hungrily as our hands roamed over each other's body, all the tension of the moments before, forgotten, as if it had never been, as if the entire world was just us. Chapter 6 Our free day before classes began flew by. As spy masters, my best friends and I were among the ten upperclassmen tasked with meeting initiates upon their arrival at the academy and showing them to the first-year tower. It took hours, but I did my best to make sure that everyone felt welcomed. I didn't want any of the new culling students feeling like I had at the start of my first year. 
It was an unfortunate tradition that the spellcaster's upperclassmen ignored the first years until after February. The practice stemmed from the belief that it was dumb to waste time on people who may not be around if they didn't pass the Samhain trial or the Imbolc challenge. I thought the practice was idiotic, and that belief was validated as I met the culling students. Most of them seemed really cool. And two particular girls, Heidi and Holly, reminded me so much of Eva and me that I ended up giving them a tour of the whole academy. I was preparing for my first class and reminding myself to introduce Eva to the girls when someone knocked on my dormitory door. You ready? Alex asked as I opened the door. Mascara wand in hand, I glanced at the clock as I returned to the bathroom. But we still have 20 minutes. His cheeks pinked. It's a new class for us, new professor too. We wouldn't want to be late. I arched an eyebrow. No, we wouldn't want the healing golden boy to be late for his first intermediate healing course. I laughed at Alex's sheepish expression. He was so excited to finally be in a class focused purely on healing that he'd been talking about it for weeks. It's okay, babe. Even if you don't show up to half the classes, I'm sure Professor Medulla will think you're the best thing since sliced bread. Remind me how many other students has he recommended that Tiberius Thorne take them on as interns? Alex barged into the room, wrapped his arms around my waist, and lifted me up for a kiss. Yeah, yeah, he said when we broke apart. You've made your point. We don't have to rush. His hand slid to my hips, and he pressed himself against me. I waved the mascara wand in front of his face. Oh, no, we don't have to rush, but we definitely don't have time for that. I pointed at my face. That is, unless you want your girlfriend showing up to class with half her face done and wearing a telling flush. Alex gave me a roguish smile. I don't mind. I whacked him on the shoulder. Well, I do. Sit down while I finish my makeup. He obliged, and I went back to applying mascara. When I finished, I peeked out of the bathroom to find him playing with my totem, which I'd left on my bed with my other accessories. The piece was lighting up at his touch, just as it normally did when our totems were next to each other. I wish I knew why they did that, I said. Alex nodded. Me too. I'm tempted to ask during our totem workshop, but I know neither of us feel comfortable with that yet. Not yet, I agreed. Hopefully once we learn a little more, we can share. Don't worry, babe. There are numerous totem workshops on the schedule. What isn't on the schedule? He had a point. We'd received a notice of our full course load yesterday, and boy, it was a doozy. Every day, the grind students had seven one-hour class sessions, three of which were advanced-level magic courses. In addition to regular classes, we had to spend a minimum of six hours in the physical conditioning room every week and attend workshops every other weekend. Eventually, we'd squeeze in specialty tutoring, too. Those sessions would be erratic, as they'd depend on our mentor's schedules. And then there were our three required grind missions. They were like our initiate trials on steroids and could last up to four days. There was a reason they called the second year at Spellcasters the grind. After all, it could wear a person down. While I was excited for it to start, I knew that balancing all that, hell, getting through it alive, would take a crap load of skill and way more sleepless nights than I wanted to consider. I sighed and slipped my totem over my head. The moonstone in the center lit up when it touched my skin and cycled through the colors of the rainbow before resuming its regular appearance. Already, I said, grabbing a thin sweater to wear over my t-shirt. It was July, but the academy was an old, massive, mostly stone building, which meant it was always drafty. Some areas, like the basement where battle magic took place, were downright cold. This Californian didn't appreciate freezing her hiney off, so I carried a sweater everywhere. Great. Alex glanced at the clock and, seeing that we still had ten minutes, smiled. We'll be sure to get good seats. While I'd met Professor Medulla, I'd never seen his healing sanctuary. He'd taught us a bartending workshop in a stark, unused classroom, and I'd expected much the same of the sanctuary. So when I stepped inside it for the first time, the ambiance took me by surprise. Dozens of amber bottles filled with elixirs lined the walls. Massive bundles of dried herbs and flowers hung from the ceilings. 
Crystals of all sizes and colors charged on the windowsill, and metal devices, none of which looked reassuring, rested on tables around the room. It even smelled different from most of our other classes, like a meadow with faint undertones of rubbing alcohol. Wow, I exhaled, taking everything in. It's something, isn't it? Alex's eyes shone with excitement as he pulled me to the front of the class. Surprisingly, Hunter and Eva were already there. Hey, early birds, I said as we claimed a table next to them. What got you two here so quick? Medulla wanted to see Eva and check out her scars before class started, Hunter explained. I became more confused. Professor Medulla knew of Eva's predicament. He'd been among the many healers who had tried to erase her scars when we thought they were inflicted by a greater demon and not a more powerful royal. However, he'd since learned otherwise. If he couldn't eliminate the scars back then, why would he think he'd be capable of banishing them now? I told him there was no point, Eva shrugged, but he insisted, and since he's one of our professors this year, I thought it would be stupid to deny him another shot. Good call. Alex said. He's no Tiberius Thorn, but Medulla is prideful. Must be a healer trait, I tickled Alex's side. He scoffed playfully. Prideful? I resemble that remark. We all chuckled, but pulled ourselves together the moment tall and portly Professor Medulla waddled into the room. This is intermediate healing, the red-faced man said. If you are a crucible or a culling student, you should not be here. You should also stop by the infirmary and get your eyes checked, because none of these people are in your year, and yet you remained in this classroom. A hearty laugh boomed from Alex, making me jump. I twisted to look at my boyfriend and arched an eyebrow. It hadn't been that funny, but when Professor Medulla's face lit up at Alex's response, I understood the show. Alex hadn't been joking when he said the professor was prideful. Clearly, Alex wants to keep his golden boy status. Welcome to your grind year, Medulla continued. I trust that all of you are prepared to work hard and learn. If not, you'd better change your frame of mind as we cover many aspects of healing in this course alone. These are the subjects you will encounter this year. The professor faced the whiteboard. With the twirl of his hands, words began forming on the surface. I read them as quickly as they appeared. Syllabus. Cell biology, gross anatomy, herbalism and plant identification, healing potions, poisonous substances and their bodily effects, magical creatures with healing capabilities, energy healing, crystal healing, magical identification of pathogens, magical elimination of pathogens, a healer's toolkit to battle mental illnesses, introduction to surgery, introduction to midwifery. Holy hell, I whispered under my breath as I took in the laundry list of things I was expected to stuff into my brain. Alex didn't look surprised, but then again, he'd sat in on some grind seminars last year. He might not have been allowed to attend the regular classes, but he'd surely heard the students talking about their schedule. We will start with an overview of the basics that you should have already learned. The stage will only last a few days. I'd simply like to know how much you have retained from the survey course. Herbalism, potions, and poisons. Some of those subcategories can be transferred into healing, most notably herbalism and potions, although poisons is not to be dismissed. It's all about the dose. Alex chimed in, which made Professor Medulla beam. I pressed my lips together to keep from laughing. If I didn't know how ecstatic he was about this class, I would have thought Alex was the biggest suck-up to ever live. That is correct, Mr. Wardwell, even for herbs and normally benign potions. After my initial assessment, we'll focus on the hard sciences before learning how to apply magic for healing. A few people groaned at the mention of hard sciences, but the professor gave a dismissive wave of his hand. You may not like it, but understanding the biochemical reactions of the body is necessary for healers even those who work only with magic. Alex nodded enthusiastically. I rolled my eyes. My boyfriend was such a huge, adorable nerd. 
As for today, we will focus on herbalism. The professor raised his arm, and a swirl of teal magic flew from his hands. I followed the shimmering colors as they wove through the bundles of flowers and herbs above us to untie every ribbon and lower the bundles to the tables below. Each of these specimens has been numbered. Without talking, I'd like you to walk about the room and identify them. My heart skipped a beat. All of them? But it was only our first day, and there had to be at least 80 bundles of flowers and herbs on the desks. Sure, some of them were easy, like rosemary and sage, but some of these plants I had never seen before. Best of luck to you. One corner of Professor Medulla's lips lifted as he read the reactions in the room. Your time starts now. Chapter 7 That was beyond ridiculous. Eva threw her hands in the air once we were a fair distance from the healing sanctuary. That's one way to put it. My brain physically hurt from all the stuff Medulla considered an overview. Thank goodness you were there, cuz. Otherwise, our class would have looked like a bunch of idiots. Hunter punched Alex's shoulder, the way guys do. Alex beamed. He had correctly listed off every single plant Professor Medulla wanted us to identify and only missed one potion, and thanked the universe for his expertise. Judging by my first intermediate healing session, I would need some major help to pass the class. Studying with Tiberius helped me a lot, Alex said. I should call him and thank him for introducing me to his method of olfactory identification. I never would have gotten that last flower otherwise. Eva, Hunter, and I glanced at each other and burst out laughing. What? Alex asked, his eyebrows pulled together. Do I have catchweed on my nose again? He rubbed at his nose. No, we're laughing because you sound like a geek, Hunter joked. Alex scowled, and his eyes swept to me. Unable to stop laughing, I shrugged. Sorry, babe, the truth hurts. Alex stuck out his tongue. Fine, see if this geek offers to be study buddies with any of you. We begged for forgiveness all the way to the academy entryway, where the hidden entrance to the battle magic classroom was located. We were about to descend the staircase when Headmistress Wake swung around the corner. Miss Dane, might I have a word about the spy games? Of course. I turned to my friends. I'll see you in battle magic. They nodded, and I strode over to join the headmistress. I wanted to check that you are still interested in the games? Headmistress Wake asked once we were face to face. I know we said that once you announced your interest that you were bound, but all the headmasters and headmistresses involved decided to give their academy champions a couple of days to mull it over. We realized that... Sometimes, decisions take on a new light after the excitement of a new venture wears off. The first event of the games will occur in late September, and the other events will follow every two months. Is that a schedule you can commit to? I wanted to say yes right away, but Alex's caution stopped me. Determined to weigh all the pros and cons, I mentally ran through my reasons to enter, and then Alex's reasons not to. To me, the pros far outweighed the cons. The spy games offered many opportunities, whereas not entering felt like I was letting the bad guys win. Plus, my missions were sure to be just as dangerous, and there was no getting out of those. I'm still interested. Headmistress Wake smiled. I can't say I'm surprised. You and Diana are two of the most driven women in your class, with Sam and Andre at your side, the spellcasters team should do well. Congratulations, then, Miss Dane. She stuck out her hand. We shook, and the headmistress gave me a brief nod of pride before marching down the corridor. Did you tell her you still wanted to be a champion? I turned around to find Alex standing in the same place I'd left him. His face was hard and his lips tight. I hadn't realized that he'd been waiting for me. I told you I wanted to do it, babe. Why are you so surprised? I thought, after our discussion, our proclamation, you might have changed your mind. My lips formed an O. Babe, I never said that I'd changed my mind. I said that I loved you. People who are in love take each other's feelings into account, Odie. Alex said, I thought you would understand that. 
Excuse me? I blinked. What does that even mean? I just... Class starts in one minute. Get your arses into my classroom now. The thick Scottish brogue of Professor Thrax cut through me, and I twisted to find him walking toward us. Just because it's a first day, don't you mean you got a break? Yes, Professor Thrax, Alex and I said together. As soon as the professor had vanished down the stairs, I caught Alex's gaze again. Can we talk about this later? Like, really talk about it? Maybe tonight? Alex didn't respond, just disappeared down the stairs. My lips parted in surprise. Since we'd been dating, Alex had never turned his back on me. That single gesture told me how pissed off he really was. During advanced battle magic, Alex's anger only seemed to intensify. Professor Thrax divided us up into groups, and while Alex was not in my group, I watched him closely and winced as he pummeled Jose Valdez, Kira Johnston, and Dakota Wiley with a ferocity I'd never witnessed before. If all three of them weren't among the people shunning me for daring to earn the rank of spymaster, I would almost feel bad for them. What happened? You're not performing well, and he... Eva gestured to Alex, who was brooding on the far side of the room while we stopped to get water. Seems like he wants to tear down the classroom. I released a sigh. Professor Thrax had already commented on my use of shoddy spellmanship twice, and Jasmine Sahani, another Odie hater and one of my sparring group members, had also remarked on my lack of prowess with a smug smile. Maybe if I told Eva what was bugging me, I'd be able to concentrate better. He doesn't want me to be the champion. But I thought you guys worked through that? I hadn't mentioned that Alex and I had said the L word, but I could see why Eva would think things were all good. We'd been affectionate and carefree the last couple of days, apparently because Alex had thought I intended to give in to what he wanted. Well, we fought over the games, but ended the fight by saying I love you. I guess, in Alex's mind, that meant that I wasn't taking part in the spy games anymore, even though I never said that. It was more that neither of us brought it up again because things were good. Oh, shit. Eva shook her head. Yeah, a classic case of not talking through our issues. I facepalmed myself. Anyway, Headmistress Wake asked me if I was still up for the games right before class, and Alex heard. I gestured to where Alex had started fiercely sparring again. Now he's taking it out on his group. Eva winced as one of Alex's sizzling spells swept past Kira and singed off a thin black braid. He's definitely being more aggressive than usual. She shook her head and then turned back to me. Do you want Hunter to talk to him? He remembers last year and sees how people are reacting to you now. He thinks you should compete. Maybe he can work some cousin magic. My lips tilted up in a smile. That's sweet, but... I'm serious, Odie. We were there when everyone was treating you like shit. It's not so bad this year, but it feels similar. She nodded to Alex. I think that may be why he doesn't understand. He wasn't there at the start. He was one of the people looking down their noses at you. And even though he loves you now, I don't think he comprehends how hard those first few months were, or how badly you wanted to cement your reputation in this society. Eva was right. How could Alex understand completely? The moment he'd arrived at Spellcasters, he'd been the top student and very popular. You think Hunter can smooth it out a little before we talk? I didn't need him settling my relationship problems, but if he could calm Alex down a bit, I would be grateful. Eva waved her hand to indicate it would be a piece of cake. They get each other, you know. I'll tell Hunter to talk to him at lunch. She wrapped her arm through mine. You and I will find those two girls you wanted to introduce me to, and we'll have some lady time. I grinned. Some girl time was well overdue. Oh my god, I just about died when Despina showed us our first demon conjuring. Heidi held a hand over her mouth, and her eyes widened. I laughed, recalling my very similar reaction all too vividly. What was it? A wraith! Holly exclaimed while simultaneously batting away a pigeon that was steering a little too close to where her sandwich lay on the picnic blanket. 
So gray and wrinkly and ugly and all those teeth. It seems as though Despina doesn't like to deviate much. Eva giggled. That was the first thing he showed us, too. You should have seen Odie's face when it appeared in class. I tickled her side. Oh, and you were so tough, Proctor. We tossed a few good-natured jabs back and forth before we realized that the younger girls were staring at us with smiles on their faces. Sorry, I said, turning my attention to Holly and Heidi. We got a little carried away. Don't be sorry, Heidi said. I like seeing that you guys are so close. We've heard stories about what you two went through. It's kind of awesome that you have each other to lean on. She glanced at Holly. I hope we can stay that way, too, no matter what the Academy throws at us. My heart grew three sizes. I freaking loved seeing strong sisterhoods. And I hope you both know you can depend on Eva and me, too. We appreciate that so much, Holly said. As our lunch progressed, my anxiety over Alex melted away. By the time Conjuring and Transfiguration rolled around, I felt confident that he needed space. It seemed that Hunter had worked his magic during lunch, because the moment Alex walked into Professor Umbra's class, I noticed that he appeared less tense. We still didn't talk much, and certainly not about our issues. But he wasn't avoiding me, and even passed me a pen after I dropped it. I hadn't expected a miracle right away anyhow. Our first day of classes stretched on longer than I ever could have expected. When the torture finally ended, I retreated to my room. I had just set my book bag on my bed when a knock came at my door. When I opened it, Alex stood in the hallway, his messenger bag still sitting on his hip. He hadn't even dropped it off before coming to my room. Can we talk? Come on in. I sat on the bed and patted the spot next to me. I'm sorry for freaking out on you, Alex blurted as soon as he joined me. And I'm also sorry for assuming that because we took our relationship to the next level, everything would be fine and you wouldn't want to participate in the spy games. Thanks for acknowledging that. Although it was a little jarring, I took Alex's quick and thorough apology in stride. We'd been here before. Swift apologies was how he operated. But I know that just because you regret becoming upset with me doesn't mean you'll support me fully in this. I understood where Alex's concerns came from, but I didn't agree. Morgan and Merlin were irritatingly vague, and we'd been apart twice already and hadn't keeled over. Alex shook his head. Of course not. I love you, babe. I want you safe and preferably close to me all the time. Uh, that's sweet and a little creepy. One corner of his lips quirked up. You know what I mean. Not like a stalker, like a protector. Until we get all of this worked out, I'll feel the need to protect you. You realize the feeling is mutual, right? I'm not the only one the demons are after. I'm just the only one they can control if Ishtar makes it to this realm. I frowned. I'm aware that they want us both equally, and because of that, I have a proposition for you. He reached inside his messenger bag and pulled out a small, leather-bound book titled Magical Objects for Safety and Protection. Do we have to find something to keep us safe? Alex shook his head. There are some rare objects in here that have been enchanted by powerful witches and wizards, but there are also spells to enchant everyday objects, too. They'll let you know if your loved ones are safe. How did you learn about them? After the Beltane trials, my parents told me about this book. They wanted to make some of the objects themselves. His cheeks turned bright red. I refused. If we hadn't made up only seconds before, I would have pointed out the hypocrisy in that decision. As it was, I let it slide. I hated arguing with him. So you want to make something that lets us know if the other one is safe? My gaze caught Alex's ring, and I placed my hand over it. The moonstone began to cycle through the colors of the rainbow before settling on white once again. If only our totems would do that, we would have less to worry about. He let out an irritated laugh. I thought the same thing. Flipping to a page in the middle of the book, Alex pointed out a spell for protection. This one responds to your heart rate, which could be a little dicey. The Academy likes to scare the shit out of us all the time, but if we cast it so that the enchanted talisman responded to heart rate and another factor that we can control, I think it might be perfect. 
This way, the person in trouble can warn the other person. My eyes ran down the page. The incantation didn't seem difficult. It didn't even require any unusual ingredients or magic that Alex and I couldn't perform. I say we try it. The worst thing that happens is it doesn't work. Then we pick something else out of this book and give it a whirl. Alex gave me a small smile. Exactly. He leaned in, and our lips met in a tender kiss. Thanks for being willing to try this out, sweets. I need something to let me know that you're okay when we can't be in the same place. He closed the book and placed his hands over the top. Also, I've been thinking that maybe you should try to teach me how to warp. My eyebrows shot up. That would not have been my next logical train of thought. Warping? But babe, you know it's a rare talent. As soon as the words left my mouth, I realized how snobbish I sounded. Still, I couldn't take it back, because it was true. Warpers were one of the rarest types of witches. So rare that no one knew if the talent was genetic or not. Neither of my parents were warpers, but I suspected that it had been passed through one of them, whichever was the descendant of Morgan Le Fay. I know it's rare and difficult, Alex said. I'm fully prepared to fail. But trying would make me feel as if I'm doing everything that I can. Think about it. What if you're the one in trouble? How am I going to get to you? He was right. It was worth a shot. And while I wasn't confident in my teaching abilities at that moment, I had an idea that could work. You have a point. My mentorship with Professor Tittlebaum begins in a few days. Apparently, he's also teaching a new warper. I'll take notes on what he says, and when I feel like I can teach you well enough, we'll begin lessons. Why not tomorrow? I know this is urgent, but I want to make sure I know what to do and say. I cupped his face. I'd be pissed if I told you something wrong and made some funky warpole that screwed up your pretty face. Alex snorted. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? A tragedy. I agreed and leaned in for one more kiss. Chapter 8 The weeks passed by in a haze of classes, physical conditioning, various spymaster obligations, and long nights filled with studying. Before I knew it, August had arrived, and the first Spy Games event loomed only a month and a half away. Somewhere in the mire of schoolwork and training, Alex and I had succeeded in creating our protection talisman, a small prophetess pendant that spellcasters had gifted the culling students at the end of last term. When we'd received it, neither Alex nor I had known what to do with the charm. But after two failed attempts at enchanting it, the dime-sized emblem now had a fantastic purpose. Alex hung his around his neck, while I'd opted to make my talisman a bracelet. If we ever found ourselves in serious trouble, all we had to do was touch the pendant and say the word, supitia. The combination of an elevated heart rate, our touch, and the magic word would cause the charm's twin to glow red hot, alerting the other wearer to danger. The moment I clasped the bracelet around my wrist, Alex calmed down. Since then, our relationship had been carefree. Well, mostly. The threat of the royals of hell always lingered in the back of my mind. And probably Alex's too. But because we couldn't control it, we did our best to ignore it. Luckily, we had about a billion things on our mind to help us forget our problems. The courses we continued from last year were as challenging as ever, and the new ones were even harder. For me, the most difficult course was definitely divination and tarot. Whether we spent the hour reading tea leaves, staring into crystal balls, or sloshing water around a scrying bowl, I was terrible at all aspects of fortune-telling. In divination and tarot, we worked in pairs, so one person could read the other's fortune. Since we were all beginners, I could easily take most of what my peers said with a grain of salt. That is until the day Professor Viddens paired me with Amethyst Rhines. Amethyst had proven herself gifted in divination and tarot from day one. According to Professor Viddens, this should have come as no surprise to anyone. The Rhines family excelled at spirit walking and talking, which indicated a predilection to communicating with the other side. 
As my friend took up the stool on the other side of my table, fear over what she would predict gripped me. Do you want to go first or should I? Amethyst asked. I grabbed the cards. Determined to perform such a drawn-out reading that Amethyst would never get the chance to read my future. Unfortunately, my plans were foiled rather quickly by Professor Viddens claiming it was time to switch moments later. Ten cards is the extent of your abilities, Miss Dane. He waved his hands, and the deck reshuffled itself and landed before Amethyst. It's time to let Miss Rhines practice, the professor said. I have yet to feel a jolt from the other side in this room, and I so wish to experience that today. He gave his star pupil a gracious smile before gliding away. I thought you did well, Amethyst said kindly. Oh, please. I gave her a dismissive wave of my hand. I made all that crap up. Don't put any stock in what I said. I'm a total hack. Amethyst giggled and from the corner of my eye, I caught Joseph, a quiet guy in our year. Glance over and wink at her. She noticed, too, and her cheeks grew red. I arched an eyebrow and leaned over the table. Did Joseph wink at you? She grabbed the crystal ball and began repositioning it, her cheeks darkening as she did so. Girl! My voice dropped low. Do you have a crush on Joseph? Amethyst pressed her lips together. Maybe. A giggle rang out of my throat. You go. He is one hot hunk of a witch. My partner's face broke out in an embarrassed smile as she looked up to catch my eye. I know, right? I had a thing for him last year, but he never noticed me. And to be honest, I was struggling in a lot of classes, so I tried to push it aside. But this year, it's different. Amethyst had been struggling? I wouldn't have guessed that. Although the part about this year being different made sense. She'd clearly been practicing over the summer break, and having a new course like Divination and Tarot come easy must have boosted her confidence, too. Well, he was totally checking you out. I waggled my eyebrows. If you two are quite done gossiping, Professor Viddens came up behind me once again, and my heart rate spiked. How did he expect anyone to tap into the other side when he kept sneaking up on us like that? The man barely made a sound when he moved. I think you should proceed with your readings, Amethyst. Amethyst nodded and stared into the crystal ball. Her hands began sweeping over it, like I'd seen old fortune tellers do in the movies, and her eyes softened. She mumbled a couple incantations to enhance clairvoyance, and then closed her eyes. Appeased that we were doing what we were supposed to, the professor finally moved on. The pit in my stomach deepened as I watched Amethyst, dreading what she might predict, and partially in awe over how relaxed she looked behind the crystal ball. I was always squinting and blinking too hard in hopes that something would appear. The minutes passed, and I started to wonder if Amethyst had fallen asleep with her eyes open when her hands flung up to grasp her throat, her eyes grew round and wide, and her breathing became ragged, labored, as if her windpipe was obstructed. Amethyst, what's going on? Are you okay? I shot up and pivoted to get help, but my friend grabbed my wrist. Do not move or speak or the girl dies. My throat constricted, and my eyes dropped to my ankle, where the demon-touched mark was branded into my skin. Shockingly, it didn't burn or even tingle, but that didn't matter. I would recognize that voice anywhere. Ishtar was speaking through, no, possessing Amethyst. Yes, you have identified me correctly, mortal. The Queen of Hell said, pleasure at being recognized obvious in her tone. How did you get here? I squeaked. Why can't I feel you? The second I said it, I realized that I did feel something, it was malevolent and cold, but very muted. Nothing like the powerful energy that had rolled off Ishtar the night I met her in New York. Did I say you could speak? Amethyst growled, and her eyes began to glow red around her brown irises. I didn't answer or move, terrified that either would cause Ishtar to harm my friend. 
That's better. Now, promise not to mention that I'm here, and I won't injure the spirit talker. We're going to have a little chat, queen to queen. Queen to queen? My lips parted in shock. What did that even mean? Promise, Amethyst hissed in Ishtar's cruel voice. The sensation of coldness intensified inside me. Unable to repress it, I shuddered. I promise. Good witch. I'd have hated to destroy the soul who volunteered for this job. Not that he is much of a keeper. No one in hell is, but still. Amethyst's mouth split in a sinister smile. They're my souls, and I like to keep them around. A shiver ran through me as understanding dawned. Ishtar wasn't actually here. She wasn't even truly possessing Amethyst. She was controlling a ghost, a soul who lived in hell, to do her dirty work. And wards conjured specifically to keep out demons didn't do crap against ghosts. Amethyst cracked her knuckles. I can see you've caught up. I always knew the blood of Morgan would be intelligent. Merlin got all the credit for his genius and ability. The people of his age revered him. Amethyst snorted. <laughs> but truly... Morgan was the gifted one. She would have outshone Merlin, had her time been more receptive to a woman's intelligence. Amethyst turned her head, and her gaze landed on the far side of the room, where Alex and Kira sat. They say humans have become more progressive, but really, not that much has changed. You saved that boy and fought a legend for your rank, but few believe you deserve it. Like in the past... The blood of Merlin once again outshines the blood of Morgan. Anger bubbled inside me at her cheap shot. Nice try. Alex and I are a team. You can't come between us. I've noticed. Your devotion to one another is quite irritating. Amethyst's eyes darted to my talisman, and she wrinkled her nose. Now that we've covered all the formalities, let's get to business. She gestured to the tarot deck. I spread the cards out in front of me, albeit shoddily. I simply couldn't find it in myself to care what the cards looked like when the Queen of Hell sat in front of me. Unfortunately, at that exact moment, Professor Viddens passed by again. He glanced down at my pitiful spread and shook his head. He was about to come over and correct my poor tarot work when a hand shot across the table and began reshuffling the spread. Nice try, Odette, but you have to be more fluid than that when prepping for a read, Amethyst said in her own voice. I jerked back, shocked by the shift, and my gaze latched onto her. My friend's eyes were clear, but the tense line of her jaw told me that the demon was still there, hiding inside her and calling the shots. Okay, I said, playing along. Like this? I grabbed another deck and mimicked her. Much better, Amethyst said. She peered down at her spread. Oh, and I see something interesting. Do you mind if I read your future real quick? Appeased, Professor Viddens moved on. For the first time since the term had begun, it disappointed me to see his back. Wonderful performance. Ishtar's voice grated me like nails on a chalkboard. But clearly you're no ace at tarot. Perhaps it's better that I ensure no one disturbs us. She pointed to the crystal ball which lit up. I realize that you've already met some of my children. Amethyst's eyes glowed red. I gulped, remembering the tunnels in Portland and how many demons we slaughtered that day. However, we've grown since then. Let me show you my clan. Horrifying images were already unfolding in the crystal ball. Armies of the dead and vicious-looking demons marched down a black, rocky path. Devils with pronounced canines, wide black wings, and glowing eyes flew overhead, shooting fire at their kin down below. Hellfire rained everywhere, and occasionally an eruption would shoot up from the ground, gobbling up a body in its way. It was a grotesque sight, and how I imagined hell looked every day. As you can see, we've amassed quite the army. Lucifer and I have discovered a way to raise the dead who have joined us, and, as you know, 
We are procreating. Amethyst placed her hand on her flat belly. The implication was clear, and a question arose in my mind. The royal demons of hell didn't procreate often because every time they did, a bit of their magical essence transferred to their babe. By creating children of her own blood, was Ishtar growing weaker? I hoped so, but I didn't dare ask. Of course, our minions are still producing children, too. We're bolstering our forces in preparation for when we burst through your ancestors' enchantment on the Hellgate. My mouth went dry. The Hellgate. Its location had been lost for centuries. Although no one knew for sure who had closed it, now I did. Morgan and Merlin. And if they had to be the ones to close it, I guessed that their bloodline had to be the ones to open it. It made perfect sense. We knew that they wanted to enter our realm in mass. If they didn't need the power of our bloodlines, then why were the demons so fixated on Alex and me? Oh, don't worry, Amethyst said, every syllable dripping with Ishtar's malice. At first, we thought you two would be necessary to open the gate. But now that we have allies, that's no longer the case. I snapped out of my revelation and put on a stoic face so Ishtar didn't think that she had gotten the better of me. About those allies. I gritted my teeth. Are they ever going to show themselves? Or are they just going to keep hiding? You know so much about us. It seems unfair that we are left in the dark. In the dark. Ishtar chuckled. That's rich coming from someone born on this plane. Someone who drips sunlight from their skin. Someone ignorant to the eternal darkness of hell. Amethyst shook her head. No, blood of Morgan. I will not tell you any of our secrets. You shall have to figure them out for yourself. Suddenly, Amethyst gasped and began to tremble violently. My heart went into overdrive. Was Ishtar going back on her promise? Was she harming my friend? I was seconds from yelling out for help when Amethyst's hand shot out and gripped my arm. Don't, don't say anything. She begged, her voice once again her own and laced with terror. If you tell anyone what happened, Ishtar will return. And she swears that if she has to possess me again to speak with you, she won't leave my body alive. Chapter 9 I was in a pickle. I desperately wanted to expose Ishtar had a means of breaching Spellcaster's wards, and that the Queen of Hell had said they'd wanted Alex and me to open the Hellgate, but I couldn't because the story put Amethyst in danger. Of course, there was always the possibility that Ishtar was bluffing, but the risk was too great. Talking to Amethyst comforted me a little. Well, talk might be too soft of a word. For the rest of divination and during lunch, Amethyst clung to me. Her behavior caught the attention of Alex, Hunter, and Eva, and earned us some funny glances. But I couldn't do anything about that. Telling Amethyst to back off when she needed reassurance would be cruel. And to be honest, the more snippets of conversation Amethyst and I shared, the better I felt. My parents have only taught me how to send spirits and call them because that's more than half the battle when you first learn how to interact with ghosts. She'd explained after Alex excused himself to use the restroom as we walked to our next class. We didn't discuss how to deter them at all, but you'd better believe I'll be asking how to do that now. Are spirit walkers and talkers easier to possess? Definitely. And are you the strongest spirit walker and talker in the academy? Amethyst's cheeks grew red. I haven't spirit walked yet, and there are five Crucible students taking spirit walking and talking, but it's not in their blood the way it's in mine. They should be thanking their lucky stars for that. What would happen if a ghost possessed someone else? Say, someone who's resistant to ghostly energies? Amethyst's eyes widened. The ghost wouldn't want to. Why? Because it would be terrible. For the person and the ghost. If the person wasn't at all sensitive to spiritual energies, the ghost might even kill them. Yikes. Silence hung over us as we neared the Conjuring and Transfiguration classroom. Amethyst stopped as we reached the door. 
We're not saying anything, right? Like to anyone? Ever? She was serious when she threatened to come back. I could tell. Her brown eyes bore through me. Not a peep. I assured her. She breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you. I know that this is as scary for you as it is for me, but the way she felt inside me... She shuddered. It wasn't like how my parents described a regular ghost. I never want to experience it again. I nodded, understanding her fear. If Ishtar ever made it to this realm, she'd possess me in a hot second. I get it. We won't say a thing. Together, we walked into Conjuring and Transfiguration to find that an array of small items dotted each desk. I sat down, and Amethyst chose the table next to me. Briefly, I wondered if she ever planned on leaving my side again, but I quickly vanquished the unkind thought. I'd had months to come to terms with the possibility of a demon possessing me, but Amethyst had experienced a possession two hours ago. I needed to cut her some slack. The owl hooted right before Alex rushed into the classroom alongside Eva and Hunter. He plopped down at my table, and our friends took the one next to him. What's so funny? I asked, gesturing to Hunter, who was laughing so hard tears leaked from his eyes. Alex rolled his eyes. We saw your friends, Heidi and Holly, in the corridor. Hunter hadn't met them yet, and one, the blonde, I can't remember which is which, basically fell in love with him. That was Heidi. And? And since Hunter is the biggest flirt ever, he used it to his benefit. Eva rolled her eyes. He regaled them with a story from last year, nothing serious, and then proceeded to scare the ever-living shit out of them when he told them about the Sawin trial. The girls literally screamed when he impersonated the succubus and ran away. Hunter thought it was hilarious. Eva's lips quirked up in a way that told me she thought it was a little funny, too. Before anyone could say anything more, Professor Umbra called our class to order, and another whirlwind session began. In our culling year, conjuring had been one of my weaker subjects. Even after a year of study, I still sucked at creating objects out of thin air. And as far as making them move or act alive like Amethyst was capable of doing, those skills seemed like a distant dream. But the magical discipline of transfiguration was a whole different story. Starting with an object made it much easier for me to create another. In fact, I was pretty damn good at it. I positioned my mug carefully in front of me, and a thrill of possibility that today might be my day to level up ran through me. Mutatio. I whispered the basic transfiguration spell, and fuchsia magic flew from my hands to wrap around the plain white coffee mug. At 12 ounces, it was larger than the last mug I'd managed to transfigure into a wine glass. I squinted my eyes, hoping the spell would work, but after a few seconds, it was clear that today wouldn't be my day. Instead of transforming into a copper Moscow mule mug, it stopped somewhere in between, half ceramic and half metal. Damn it. I swore. At my side, Alex chuckled. You're doing awesome. Most people are still working with matchboxes and spools of thread. A coffee mug is ten times that size. I smiled at him. Thanks, babe. When I finally turn this into copper, I'll bust out Mom's recipe and make you the best Moscow mule you've ever had. Is that a medulla-approved concoction? Alex teased. Probably not. I laughed. I had a hunch that Mom's recipe for a Moscow mule, which used starfruit-flavored vodka, would not go over well with the healing professor. The rest of the class flew by, and I was taken by surprise when the owl hooted once more. Our next session was advanced phaeology, and we were halfway to that classroom when I ran into Professor Tittlebaum. Miss Dane. Tittlebaum clapped his hands together. Are you prepared for our session tonight? I almost groaned, but held it inside. I'd completely forgotten that my specialty class with Professor Tittlebaum was that evening. Of course, Professor, I said, trying to push all the homework that was piling up out of my mind. Wonderful, he beamed. Remember, tonight, we will have someone joining us, a crucible student who recently discovered his warping talent. Despite the fact that I would rather be sleeping than go to my lesson, I smiled. Professor Tittlebaum looked like a thin, nerdy academic who never saw sunlight. 
but once you got to know him, he didn't give off that vibe at all. He had a zest for both of his subjects, magical languages and warping, and that fervor was infectious. And you're still not going to tell me who this person is? I'd been trying to pry the student's name out of him for the last two weeks while arrangements were being made for the student to join us. Unlike a lot of private tutoring sessions, warping required lots of bureaucratic hoop jumping because it was so dangerous. I hadn't known half of the dangers when I'd created my first warp hole to banish Ishtar to hell during my Beltane trial. But even if I had, I still would have done it. Being pulled into hell seemed a much worse fate than a couple of missing body parts, or even temporary madness. Tittlebaum grinned. If you're going to be a warper, Miss Dane, you must learn to appreciate some mystery in life. Right, I said, although I totally disagreed. Who wouldn't want some of that? Perhaps the girl who's up to her eyeballs in mystery at the moment? See you tonight, then, the professor said. See you tonight, I echoed. Chapter 10 My feet dragged as I trudged to Alice Kittler Hall. Every cell in my body yearned for a nap. But the lure of learning the identity of the new warping student kept me going. Although I liked Professor Tittlebaum, it was strange having so much attention directed on me. A friend my age in the same tutoring session would be welcome, if only to take the pressure off. Andre, I said, as I entered the hall to find the professor and my fellow spellcaster's champion already there and chatting. This is a great surprise. Now you see why I didn't tell you. Professor Tittlebaum clapped his hands. Imagine the possibilities. If Andre here can get the hang of warping before the first spy game, spellcasters will have an almost certain victory. Wow. I wished I had half of Professor Tittlebaum's confidence in our team. The first Spy Games event would take place on Maybon, the Witching Sabbath in mid-September. But with a little less than a month to get through my never-ending mountain of coursework and my first spy mission, I wasn't as enthusiastic as the professor. At least, not yet. The tutoring session began, and it quickly became obvious that Andre was a total beginner. After only 20 minutes, the professor asked me to demonstrate making warp holes from one side of the room to the other, while he described the intricacies of the magic to Andre. It was interesting to hear warping taught in this way. I had made my first warp hole through sheer force of will, and had never had to think about it in such technical terms. I'd learned during my summer internship that my hands-on experience put me squarely in the minority among warpers. Many preferred a methodical approach, but not me. I always sensed my way through making a warp hole. This personal preference was yet another reason why I wasn't keen on teaching Alex how to create warp holes. He was much more technical. Plus, there was a lot of inherent risk when creating them. What if he tried my method and injured himself? Or worse, lost his mental faculties? When we'd reached the end of our session, Professor Tittlebaum set the next class for two weeks out, and Andre and I left Alice Kittler Hall together. As soon as the doors closed behind us, he turned to me. You make it look so easy. What's your secret? I grinned, pleased by the compliment. Even though it wasn't easy at all, it had taken me months to get where I was, and I still found it very difficult to warp to sights unseen. The farther away, the harder it became. An amazing summer internship where I practiced, practiced, practiced. His face fell. I was afraid you'd say that. The best tip I can give you is to listen to your body. Professor Tittlebaum has never mentioned it. He likes to be by the book, but I feel how to warp in my body and soul. I still have a lot of work to do, but each time is a little easier than the last. Andre sighed. That's something, I guess. We made our way down the hall until we reached the corridor where we'd split. You did well today, I said. See you around. Thanks for your help, Andre grinned. I took a few steps up the stairs, only to pause when Andre spoke again. Hey, the Crucibles are having a party tomorrow night. Want to come? Bring your friends, too, if you want. I think Diana plans on stopping by. We could talk about the spy games a little. Something in me seized, 
and it didn't take a genius to understand why. The last time I'd been invited to a party at the King's Castle, the ridiculous nickname the Crucibles gave their fancy dorm, a classmate had died. But surely that wouldn't happen again. Not with all the wards the Academy had put in place. Everything will be fine. So, is that a no? Andre asked, and I realized that we'd been standing there, him staring at me, and me mentally running through a lot of doom and gloom. I shook my head. Sorry, it's a yes. It's just, when you mentioned a party, I... You thought of that kid they found dead in the woods last year. Andre finished for me. Yeah. I cocked my head. Were you there too? I left before all that shit went down. Sam was there, though. She was my best friend and told me about it afterward. He shook his head. So messed up. For some reason, maybe because I hit my max of secrets for the day, the truth burned its way up my throat, and I blurted it out before I could second-guess myself. That thing that killed a frame was looking for me. Or maybe my boyfriend, Alex. I paused, feeling relieved, but also slightly dumb because Andre was staring at me with wide eyes. I thought you should know, since we'll be participating in dangerous games together. Demons want us for... reasons. Reasons you know? I shook my head, which was a partial truth. I knew bits, but not everything. Andre continued to stare at me, and it was almost to the point of becoming really uncomfortable when he shrugged. Well, they'll already be hammering us during the spy games. What's a few demons added to the pile? I'm sure we can take them on. He flexed ludicrously, making me laugh. His lips curved up. That's better. Things were getting a little too serious for my liking. He turned and walked away. See you tomorrow, Dane. You'd better have your party hat on. Will do, I called back and made my way to the green tower. When I arrived back at the dorm, I found half of my class in the common space, studying. Since we'd started our grind year, seeing the study area full of people with their nose buried in books was routine, as was someone tossing a book across the room or bursting into tears over some horrible assignment. Kira, Jose, Jasmine, and Dakota, four of the people who hated me this year, shot me sour looks as I passed. I ignored them. After almost two months of being the recipient of their envy, I didn't have the time or energy to care what they thought anymore. When I reached the sixth floor, I noticed the door to the spymaster's private study room was open, and familiar voices emanated from within. When I peeked inside, I found my best friends and Diana at various tables with books spread out before them. Odie, we were wondering when you'd get done with your tutoring session. Amethyst was looking for you earlier. Did she find you? I'll catch her tomorrow. I was sure she wanted more reassurance that I hadn't blabbed. If it had been serious, she would have waited for me in the common space. What are you guys studying? Theology. Eva and Diana called out seconds before the guys claimed to be working on the potions and poisons assignment. Awesome. I need to do all of that. I'll get my stuff. I ran to my room and grabbed my overstuffed book bag. A few minutes later, I was nestling myself into the last free table between Alex and Eva. Which are you going to do first? Alex asked. Hmm, theology. Our potions and poisons assignment dealt with a lot of science, and my brain couldn't handle that at the moment. But before I get started, I have something to tell you guys. Everyone leaned back, and Hunter placed his feet on the table, clearly happy for another break. There's a crucible party tomorrow. We're all invited. Yes, Eva shouted. I so need to let loose. The guys agreed. Diana merely nodded, reminding me that she already knew about the party. Have you been talking with Sam and Andre about the games? I asked her. Diana's eyebrows furrowed together. What? No. Why would we talk about the games without you? My lips parted at the show of thoughtfulness. I was wondering because Andre told me you already knew about the party. Diana's creamy complexion took on the slightest hint of pink. Oh, right. I actually saw him in the hall earlier, and he told me then. She spoke hurriedly, as if she wanted to move on. Well, we should have a brainstorming session at the party. She nodded and quickly buried her head in her books. I watched her, wondering why she was acting so odd before realizing that my homework wouldn't do itself. 
and followed in Diana's footsteps. Chapter 11 Amethyst stuck to my side like glue the whole day after her possession. Although I understood her anxiety, I couldn't deny that having a shadow every time I used the restroom was getting annoying. I didn't know if she stayed beside me because she didn't trust me to keep her secret, or she felt safer in my presence. Either way, when the party rolled around and Amethyst opted to remain in the green tower, I wasn't disappointed. I needed to not worry about ghosts possessing people, to forget about Ishtar for a moment, to let my hair down and be a normal college kid. As we walked through the woods to the King's Castle, the luxury dorm next to alumni housing, I was sure that my needs would soon be met. The revelry rang loud and clear, halfway down the wooded path, electrifying me. And when we emerged from the woods to view the dorm, a smile bloomed on my face. Made of glass, with the windows on the upper floors tinted for privacy, the King's Castle didn't really go with Spellcaster's main building. Lanterns illuminated the walkway, their light reflecting off the glass. There was a porch where a few students lounged on outdoor furniture. Somehow, a mass of trampoline had been brought onto Spellcaster's grounds, and a half dozen third years jumped, or rather, floated around, above it. My mouth dropped open as one guy began floating off the trampoline and over the tops of some smaller trees. He'd clearly perfected the levitation charm, a spell we'd learned at the end of last year. I still hadn't mastered it. Hunter, however, excelled at levitation, and upon seeing so many people goofing around with his favorite charm, his eyes lit up. Anyone want to go play? A familiar, mischievous expression flashed across his face. Eva giggled. I'm in as long as you catch me. Always, sugar. Always. Alex and I declined, and our friends ran off to go have fun. Where to first, sweets? Alex asked. I looked around, unsure where to begin. Besides the trampoline, there was cornhole, a massive twister board, and giant Jenga, too. It all looks awesome, I admitted. How about we get a drink first, and then decide? Alex grabbed my hand, and together we walked through the fun and games into the king's castle. Inside, the building was as polished and striking as I remembered. The foosball and pool tables stuck out as centers of rousing competition. Predictably, the bar, complete with a keg, was packed. Music thumped so loud that it vibrated the tables we passed. When it quieted for a moment, sounds of a loud car crash filled my ears. I assumed a few people were watching a movie in the theater room down the hall. Coming from Beverly Hills, I remembered feeling at home when I walked into the King's Castle last year. Yet, now it felt odd. Like it was all too much. I'd grown used to our small, tower rooms, which were still nice, but older and less amenity-rich. I guess you really can get used to anything. Alex and I stopped by the bar. He grabbed a beer while I opted for a glass of white wine. We were about to mingle when I noticed Sam waving frantically at me from fireside seats that looked out over the front yard. I waved back, and she motioned for me to join her. When I saw who she was with, I understood why. Sam sat in a chair across from Andre and Diana, who were next to each other on a love seat. They were a touch closer than friends would sit. The way Diana's cheeks had reddened at the mention of Andre last night came rushing back, and I grinned. I'd bet a whole lot of money that Diana and Andre were into each other. Sam probably wanted backup, and of course to talk about the games. Hey, I squeezed Alex's hand. The other champions want to chat. Do you want to join? He shook his head. Nah, I'm good. There are a few people here I want to talk to. Catch you later, sweets? He dimpled at me. We kissed and split off. Alex headed straight toward two Crucible students who were in his healing tutoring session. My lips curled up. Alex was so driven to excel in the subject that he enjoyed. Even if I teased him, it was truly one of the things I liked most about him. When I neared the other champions, Sam rose and pulled me into an awkward half-hug. Thank God you're here, she whispered.
If I had to put up with the covert flirting without backup, or Diana's ex-boyfriend sending death looks for a moment longer, I was going to throw someone across the room. Probably Diana, because Andre is too heavy. My ears perked up. Diana's ex-boyfriend? She had been single during our calling year. It must have been a guy from before she was enrolled at Spellcasters. How scandalous. Unable to help myself, I scanned the room. My gaze landed on a guy with shoulder-length blonde hair, full lips, and a scowl directed straight at Diana. He looked like a young Brad Pitt. And for some reason, I found it hard to believe that he and Diana had been an item. That guy? I whispered and aimed a finger behind my other hand. Sam followed the direction that I pointed and nodded. Jackson Hall. They dated during our calling year. He broke up with her right before she took her entry exams and dated someone else during the grind. When she earned Spymaster for your class at the end of last year, it pissed him off something fierce. Jealous, I think. He's never gotten a rank of sorcerer spy. But now that she and Andre are... whatever, Jackson's been a nightmare. Clearly, he's not over her, even though he was the one who dumped her. Avoid him at all costs. Damn. Memo to self. Ask Diana about her ex later. Sam and I joined the other two, and right away, the topic turned to the spy games. The first event will be at Night Dwellers, Sam said. Does anyone know anything about that school, other than that it's full of vampires? Andre and I shrugged. Hell, I'd known basically nothing about spellcasters before I enrolled. The other schools were complete mysteries. The students do three terms at the school, but they're more like semesters rather than years, Diana offered. After that, they transfer to work under a real spy for a year. Sam nodded. Because vampires have natural stealth, strength, and keen senses, the PIA accelerates their training. That makes sense. But I meant information about the Academy's location, what they study, what's nearby. Diana shook her head. Sorry, Mother has never talked about that stuff. She's more the type to let me learn by experience. If you asked, would she tell you? Andre asked. Uh, no way. Now that I'm a champion, she'd see it as cheating. Diana rolled her eyes. Which is annoying because I bet Headmaster Ezra is telling his champions everything he can about spellcasters. Mother is way too by the book. That's okay. I'm assuming most schools will choose challenges more suited to their students' strengths. I said, trying to bring the conversation into a more positive light. We don't need to know where Night Dwellers is to brainstorm a challenge that would benefit a vampire. I think that's a good place to start. Great idea, Dane. Sam agreed. Let me get something to write with. Sam went to the bar to grab a notepad, and I used the time to take a bathroom break. On my way back, I spotted Alex clear across the living room in a rousing discussion with his fellow tutoring students. I smiled and waved, and he returned the gesture. Sam had already jotted down two options when I arrived back at my seat. I leaned over the arm of the chair and gasped. No, those would be awful. That's a vampire for you, Andre said. What else? Sam asked. What about an obstacle course of sorts? Diana offered. One that would require super strength and speed? Sam squished her lips to the side. Maybe. It sounds a little too simple, but depending on the environment, I could see it. I'll put it down. She paused, and a look of fear flashed over her face. Does anyone else hear that? The music inside was blaring and difficult to hear over, but Sam's reaction pushed me to try. I tuned out the music, and after a few moments, the sounds of growls and screams hit my ear. I hoped they were emanating from the theater room, but my senses informed me they were coming from the opposite direction, outside. A sickening sense of deja vu came over me, and I shot out of my seat. Spinning toward the window, I let out a yelp as a massive, black beast 
soared over the front lawn. I watched, mouth agape, as it flew over the trampoline and snatched someone straight out of the air with a vicious roar. What was that? Diana appeared at my side. It had moved so fast that I wasn't sure, but the answer came a moment later, when a skinny third year burst through the front door. A spell, obvious by the amber magic that spewed from his hands, flew up around him. The Fae are here! The guy's voice boomed over the music, magically amplified. And they brought a dragon! Help! A dragon? What the actual shit? All of us champions dashed toward the door, my heart hammering harder with each step. I had no idea how we were going to fight the Fae. The only other time I'd tried to fight one, he had gotten away. And a dragon? My stomach sank. Magicals had banished dragons to fairy centuries ago. Occasionally, they emerged into our world, as they had when my parents were assigned to wrangle a wayward mated pair in their spy days. But mostly, the royal fey courts kept their dragons on a tight, metaphorical leash, which meant few people outside of fairy knew how to subdue the beasts. But just because I'm ignorant doesn't mean others are, I reasoned, trying to calm my raging mind. Someone here had to know something about taming a dragon, right? My rational thinking lasted until I exited the front door and came face to face with what we were really up against. Chapter 12 At least fifty fey ran across the lawn and through the woods, cackling with glee and igniting fires with magic. Ropes made of vines bound my peers' legs and arms, while gusts of air tossed people around like leaves in the wind. But what caught my attention most were the two students trapped in separate spheres of water. Their fists slammed against the aqueous walls, and desperation lined their faces as bubbles escaped their screaming mouths. I sprinted toward the water spheres. Somehow, although the chaos was all around me, everything else fell away as I worked out how to save the drowning students. I wonder if I could... My head snapped to the side as a body came hurdling my direction and tackled me to the ground. Not so fast, pretty, a deep voice growled as someone pressed me into the dirt. A nail raked down my neck, burning the skin there as the creature tried to pull my hair back. Get off of me! I screamed. Magic flew from my hands, but since the fae had me stomach down, my aim was poor and I didn't hit my target. Perhaps after I send you into slumber, we are always looking for pretty and docile slaves in Dark Court. You might need help with the latter attribute, but it's nothing a little fey wine can handle. My blood froze. Send me into slumber? Docile slaves? Oh, hell no. I kicked and tried to yell for help, but my throat felt tight. After a few more attempts, I could barely breathe, let alone scream. For a moment, I thought it was due to the fey's prodigious weight. But when my lungs began to burn, the truth hit me. The fey was siphoning the air straight from my lungs. My heart rate sped up, burning the little oxygen left in my system. I bucked, but the movement was weak. All my senses dulled. My hand flailed, a last-ditch effort to draw someone's attention. Suddenly, hot liquid splattered onto my back, and air, precious air, flooded my lungs once again. I gasped as the phase weight fell off of me. Holy shit, Odie! Eva yanked me up off the ground. I swayed, disoriented. What did he do to you? My friend asked as she held me up. I cringed, noting the blood dripping off her face. Then I stiffened, dripping like water. I gasped. Eva, those people in the water! I spun to find they were all still trapped, passed out. A trio was trying to save the girl, while Andre and Diana were working to free the guy. We have to help them. We dashed over to help Diana and Andre. Sweat poured off them as they used spells and battle magic against the sphere. Any luck? Eva yelled. My eyes darted to the guy in the water globe. His skin was blue, and his eyes closed as he floated lifelessly in the sphere. None, Andre grunted. We've tried dozens of spells, but they're either not powerful enough 
but they aren't effective against elemental magic. Or both. Diana yelled as she hurled a ball of glaring purple light at the water sphere. I watched it fly right out the other side. Your magic can go through there, though? I asked, making sure that hadn't been a one-time thing. Diana nodded. Our magic can, but when we touch it, the damn thing is solid. Otherwise, I'd yank him out. I had an idea. Andre, I'm going to make a warp hole into the bubble. If I can't get out on my own, pull me back through. You might even have to keep it open if something happens to me in there. Andre's eyes grew round. Yeah, okay, I got you, Dane. I felt a little bad. He was still so new to warping. Even so, he was the most qualified witch around, and we were running out of time. I didn't have to go far, and I could see my destination, so setting up the warp hole was easy. Just a visualization, a calling and redirecting of energy, and the hole appeared before me. Inside the bubble of water, a black dot lined with fuchsia opened. As it expanded, the water cage expanded too. I watched as it doubled in size, then tripled. So the warp hole wouldn't pop the globe, but the bubble wouldn't expel my warp hole either. There was a chance this would work. I seized the opportunity and stepped into the warp hole. The familiar sensation of heat, then cold, enveloped me, but it was only momentary before water splashed in my face. My eyes snapped shut on instinct, but I forced them back open. The drowning student was three or four feet away, but when I extended my hand past the safety of the warp hole, I discovered that the current in the ball of water was crazy strong. Thankfully, I was a California girl and a good swimmer. I took a large breath and plunged. It should have only taken a few strong strokes to reach him, but because of the current, it took more. When my hands wrapped around his arm, he was ice cold. My sense of urgency amplified. Pulling him back to the warp hole was ten times more difficult than reaching him had been. He was heavy, and my lungs started to burn. We were a foot away from reaching the safety of my magic when something inside the globe shifted. The current became a whirlpool, and I gripped the guy I'd saved tighter, only seconds before we began spinning around. Stupidly, I let out a scream, releasing all my air. Outside the globe, I heard Eva yell my name, but I couldn't respond. Stars already dotted my vision. Flailing, I tried to expand the warp hole toward me, but panic filled me, and manipulating warp holes required a clear mind. This was it. I was about to meet my end. Ishtar would be so pissed that she never got to best me. And Alex. I didn't even get to say goodbye. Darkness descended. My grip on the guy loosened. But I used all my remaining energy to hold tight. I didn't want to die alone. The blackness had almost taken me over when two strong hands grabbed onto me and yanked. I tumbled through hot air, then cold. Whirlpool energy, and landed on something hard. I sputtered. Someone began pounding on my back, and I sputtered more. It felt like an ocean full of water was exiting me. Move over. I know CPR. Diana's voice cut through me, and I forced myself back to the moment. I couldn't slip off into unconsciousness. Fay and witches still battled all around me, and the guy I'd pulled from the globe might be dead. Odie, are you okay? Eva squatted in front of me, while Diana and Andre tended to the guy I'd saved. Hey, help us! Another voice called out. She can barely breathe! Eva clutched me and screamed back. Shit, the other water sphere. Eva, I have to help. I'm the only one who can. I said as I worked myself out of her grasp. Damn it, of course you are. Eva's voice cracked as she helped me to my feet. Make sure Andre watches my back, I said, sparing her a smile before turning and jogging toward the other sphere. This time, I created a warp hole on the fly and dove back in. As soon as my body hit the water in the second globe, I gasped. The current here was much stronger than that of the first water sphere. It felt like a riptide and tore me away from the drowning girl after a single stroke. I glanced around in panic and noticed that this globe was larger, too, its size comparable to that of a backyard shed. It wasn't this big seconds ago. Oh, that little shit. Fury rushed through me as the truth of my situation became clear. 
The Fae who controlled the sphere was manipulating it to screw with me. Using all my strength, I kicked and paddled. The effort gained me a few inches, but the girl's body was still much too far away. My heart began to beat dangerously fast. I still hadn't recovered from saving the guy, and I'd already lost more oxygen than the first time. I had seconds, maybe less, to save the girl and get out of the globe alive. I gnashed my teeth together, determined to give it one more go before backing out. And then, three goddamned piranhas appeared in the water and zoomed straight at me. I flipped around and swam the opposite way. I'd almost made it to the war pole when one of the little assholes bit my leg. I let out a scream, releasing the rest of my precious air. Another bite, another drowned scream. Within seconds, my entire leg was on fire. My vision clouded, and my body began shutting down, giving up. God, I'd been so stupid. Why had I tried to save her when I hadn't even recovered? Now we would both die in this damn bubble. A piranha moved up my leg to my hip, but I could no longer find the energy to fight it. I was through. The fae controlling this fear would drown me. The piranhas would eat my body. Or at least... That was what I thought until I caught a flash of crimson light. It streaked across the lawn, straight toward me, and pierced the water bubble. My eyes popped open as the red light connected with my totem, and a sphere of air surrounded my head. Alex. I didn't know where he was, or how he'd given me oxygen, but he'd saved me. Him and his totem. Gratefully, I breathed in the fresh air and my strength returned. The fish were no longer an issue. Alex's magic had killed them on impact. That gave me an idea. Just as I had done the night we faced Ishtar, I grabbed my totem and asked for help. Immediately, the necklace created a bubble around me. Thanks to Alex, I already had air, so I figured the bubble must serve another purpose. I pressed the side, and ever so slightly, it moved in the direction of my applied pressure. My heart leapt, and I pressed my hand toward the girl. The bubble responded, moving closer to her. The harder I pressed, the faster it rolled, like I was a hamster in a wheel. I reached the girl in no time and pulled her inside my protective sphere. Then I directed the bubble back to the war pole. Finally, when I was right next to the war pole, a hand reached through. Dark fingers waved at me. Andres. I extended my hand to grasp his, and he wrenched us out of the sphere. This time, when I emerged from the water sphere, I shoved the girl into Andre's arms, instructed the others to perform CPR, and scan the lawn. A flash of crimson helped me find who I was looking for, and when I laid eyes on my boyfriend, my heart stopped. Alex was battling the freaking dragon. The beast's razor-sharp teeth snapped at him in between streams of fire that Alex narrowly dodged. Oh, hell no, you're not messing with my man. I sprinted toward Alex, intent on being with him, on helping him. I was almost there, too, only a dozen yards away, when a blast of magical energy flew across the yard. I blinked and saw the headmistress and a dozen spellcasters professors rushing out of the woods their magic knocking out at least twenty fey in one go. Another blast swooped in, and terrified and elated in equal measure, I hit the floor. Their magic overwhelmed the space. Shades of gray, blue, navy, violet, and scarlet soared toward the fey, and otherworldly screams filled the air. Professors spread out and became warriors, but one instructor was even more awe-inspiring than the rest. Ms. Seely twirled and struck as she raced through the onslaught of Fay toward the giant lizard. Every target she attacked fell, and when she had a clear shot, our Fayology professor went for the big guy. I watched as a blast of violet magic ten times as large as any I'd seen from her streamed savagely toward the dragon. It struck the beast right where his head and neck met, and the creature let out a pitiable roar as it fell to the ground with a violent thud. Its eyelids fluttered closed as the last wisps of flames died in its mouth. But the professor didn't stop moving. She dashed right up to the dragon, conjured a massive sword, and sliced through the creature's neck, finishing the job. I choked out a sob, 
only then noticing that the dragon's head had landed a mere two feet from Alex. I leapt up from my crouch and sprinted toward Alex. He met me halfway and wrapped his arms tightly around me. It's okay, Odie. We're all safe. Alex stroked my hair as my tears fell fast and free. He smelled like smoke and burnt hair, confirming that he'd had too many close calls. Somehow, I almost lost you to a freaking dragon in that bubble. I sounded a little hysterical, but holy universe, both calls had been far too close. I know, babe, but we're okay now. The professors, they did something to the Fae, Alex said. They all look asleep or dead. The words sprang to my mind, vicious and cutting. Although the reasonable side of me knew it would be smarter to leave some of the Fae alive, I couldn't help but hope they were dead. When I pulled my head from Alex's chest and saw the carnage, the bodies of my peers lying on the ground, I didn't regret the violent thought. Chapter 13 The following day, classes were canceled, and representatives from the Paranormal Intelligence Agency descended upon spellcasters. After they took in the scene at the King's Castle, analyzed the Academy's wards, and closed the open ferry holes, the PIA agents interviewed students who had been present during the attack. I was one of the first called upon. When I arrived at the interview room I'd been summoned to, I found David Chena waiting for me. Odette Dane, David said with a grim smile. You always seem to be in the middle of all the trouble, don't you? As a top spymaster for the United States government, David knew what had happened during the last Beltane trial and my internship in Portland. In fact, he knew almost everything we'd been up against. Everything except Alex's and mine's relationships to m and and Amethyst's possession. Seems like it, I said, returning a smile as I sat down. How have you been? David shook his head, and I took in the dark circles beneath his eyes. Being a PIA spymaster was taxing work. I could imagine that with all the strange demon and fairy stuff happening, it had become even more draining, especially for a human with no inherent way of defending himself against the creatures that kept popping up. The poor guy probably didn't sleep. Things have been hectic for a few weeks, and then this... massacre... David's voice broke, and he hung his head. I gulped down the lump, threatening to rise up my throat. Massacre. That was exactly what it had been. The professors and the headmistress had arrived only ten minutes after the dragon, but those ten minutes felt like a lifetime of blood and terror. There were countless injuries. What was worse, five crucible students and two of my classmates from the grind year were dead. Their parents were arriving later in the day to collect their bodies, and a quiet service was to be held for them that evening. The girl I'd tried to save from the water sphere was among those who had perished. Although I'd done what I could, a veil of responsibility for her death hung over me. If I'd been faster, would she still be alive? Andre felt even worse, although unjustly so. He was a brand new warper, unable to even create a true warp hole on his own. But me, I'd been doing this for months. I should have been able to save them both in time. So, Miss Dane, do you mind if I ask you a few questions about last night? David asked, his tone soothing. I nodded. Fire away. Although, you should know that I might not be too helpful. I was focused on a single task for a lot of it. He nodded. I heard what you did. That boy owes you his life. My gut twisted at his omission of the girl. Still... We like to interview everybody about their personal experience. You never know who might have witnessed the one key piece that brings a case together. He began questioning me. Most of his inquiries were expected. Who infiltrated the school? Had I seen them actually get onto the grounds? Had anybody from the academy been acting suspicious at the party? I answered everything to the best of my abilities, although none of my answers felt fully sufficient. Why hadn't I paid more attention? It was like I'd forgotten all of my training when it counted most. After David finished his questions, he leaned back in his chair and rubbed his temples. Thank you, Miss Dane. You are dismissed. When you leave, would you please tell my assistant to send for... 
He looked at the sheet in front of him. Evanora Proctor. I nodded. She's my best friend, so I can send her myself if you'd like. Oh, that's right. Proctor was with you in Portland. David sounded as if just thinking about Portland exhausted him. She was. She's still sensitive about it. I said protectively. I'll send her in. I walked across the room and placed my hand on the doorknob. I was about to let myself out when something I hadn't considered in a while, but had obsessed over constantly after it happened, filtered into my conscious. David, do you remember when last year's culling class came to the PIA for a field trip? His lips quirked up. How could I forget? Your group is a small but very curious bunch. I laughed. That was a kind way of saying that a few members in our class had asked him a billion questions. You're right about that. I was wondering, can I ask you a question about that day? If you can't answer, I understand, but I'm curious. Of course. David placed his elbows on the desk and leaned forward. Do you remember the witch I ran into in the hallway outside the cafeteria? The one being brought in by agents for questioning? David's face went blank and his eyebrows knitted together. I don't believe I remember. The one who yelled at me not to trust anyone? I hadn't wanted to say the last part, since she'd been referring to the PIA, but I suppose there was no sense in keeping that from the spymaster. He'd probably been in on the case in some way or another. David's confusion cleared, and something else flashed across his face. Anxiety? Oh, yes, I remember the witch you're talking about. Why do you bring her up? I was actually wondering what happened to her. Sometimes she shows up in my dreams. I didn't add that when I dreamt about her, I often awoke to my totem flashing like crazy on my nightstand. The connection between the dream and my totem made me question if the witch was a demon sympathizer or something of that nature. David squirmed a little in his seat. I'm sorry to say that witch died after being brought to the PIA. She refused nourishment while under questioning. As you might recall, she was already quite ill when she arrived. Oh, yes, I remember. A pang of remorse for the woman cut through my heart. I'm sorry to hear that she passed. So sad. Yes, it was quite sad, but nothing could be done to save her. My hand landed on the doorknob again, and I twisted it. Thanks for answering my question. I'll see you around, David. Chapter 14 For the next five days, all the students could talk about was the Fay infiltration and how the PIA had questioned everyone at the party, the professors, staff, and even headmistress Wake. The culling students were the most skittish about everything that had happened, which made sense. It was only early September, and the poor newbies hadn't even undergone their Samhain trial yet. The scariest thing they'd seen was probably Professor Despina's demon conjurings. To be fair, those still made me shudder, and I'd seen some real shit. So hear any interesting theories about who they suspect? Eva asked, taking a seat at my table for our final class of the day, Intermediate Potions and Poisons. I shrugged. The PIA had detained Ms. Seeley for two whole days because she was half fae, which prompted a lot of ignorant people to believe that she had something to do with the Fey invasion. I thought all those people were idiots. There was no way Ms. Seeley would allow those monsters onto Academy grounds. I remembered all too well how distraught she'd been when one little redcap had opened a fairy hole and tried to take first Mina and then Amethyst back to fairy with him. Nothing? Eva looked disappointed that I didn't have new gossip. To be honest, I can't imagine anyone here would do such a thing. Of course, I had a personal theory. Because Ishtar could possess a ghost and gain access to spellcasters, it didn't seem too far-fetched that somehow she could get the Dark Court Fae here, too. But I couldn't tell anyone that, because I needed to provide proof, and proving it meant putting Amethyst at risk. Miss Dane? Professor Bain... A younger woman who wore round green glasses stopped at my table. A crucible student who I'd often seen trailing headmistress Wake and taking notes stood at the professor's side. Yes, Professor Bain? The headmistress would like to see you. 
I cocked my head. Okay, right now? Professor Bain nodded. Leave your things. You may return to class after your meeting. Eva placed a hand on my shoulder, questions plain in her eyes. I don't know. I whispered, guess I'd better go find out. The Crucible student introduced himself as Tim and led me to Headmistress Wake's offices. I could have gotten there by myself, but this was part of his job, so I rolled with it. When he knocked on her door, the headmistress answered right away. Enter? Tim poked his head in. Headmistress Wake, Odette Dane is here to see you. Send her in. Tim gestured for me to enter, and the door shut behind me once I'd walked into the office. Welcome, Miss Dane, the headmistress said without looking up from a pile of paperwork. Please have a seat. I obliged and crossed my legs. You wanted to see me, Headmistress Wake? She nodded, and after a moment, shoved the pile aside and gave me her full attention. Yes, it's about your schedule this month. My schedule? Like how it was so full to bursting that I rarely got even six hours of sleep and thought I might fall over from exhaustion any minute? Something told me that wasn't what Headmistress Wake was referring to. As you know, the first Spy Games event is at the end of September, during Maybon. She looked pleased that the game organizers decided to hold a challenge on one of the four Sabbaths that many witches celebrated. All Grind students must complete one of their three missions before Samhain. Since I do not want to risk you being injured for the games, I've scheduled your mission to be the first in your class. As in, I'm going soon? My mouth dried up. With a partner, right? I hope that it was Eva or Hunter. She nodded. A very suitable mission arrived from the PIA. And yes, in the grind, you will always work with a partner during your missions. Yours will be Phoebe. She passed her makeup Beltane trial the other day. All right. I sighed, but tried to contain my disappointment. At least it wasn't one of the people who had been snubbing me for four months. In fact, now that Diana and I had made up, Phoebe had been civil too. Do we get any hints as to what we'll be doing? During our calling year, we'd gotten hints about what we'd encounter prior to the Sawin and Beltane challenges. None, Headmistress Wake said. You and Phoebe will be on your own in almost every sense of the word. She opened a drawer and rifled through it before producing an object that looked like a pin. This will be your single lifeline. If you find yourselves in a position requiring immediate extraction, all you must do is press down on the center of these pins. Professor Tittlebaum will wear a pin linked to yours. He will open a warp hole to your location, and a team will bring you here. Phoebe has already taken one. This one is yours. I took the circular pin. It didn't look like anything special, just a small gold daisy-like flower. But I guess that was the point. Is that all, headmistress? I asked, and prepared to rise. Actually, Miss Dane, I have one more question. My stomach clenched. Yes? You were at the crucible party, correct? I nodded. Rumor has it you saved a student. Thank you for your bravery. Spellcasters is indebted to you for that. Thank you, but... If they'd been able to, others would have done the same. Perhaps, she said, and pressed her lips together briefly. Other students mentioned that the dark court of fairy took responsibility for those actions. Did you hear such rumors? I did. A fae who attacked me said the same thing. So I believe it. The headmistress nodded, and her gaze dipped to my ankle. Suddenly, I knew it was coming. I couldn't believe that I didn't expect it sooner. Considering the strange portals and otherworldly interference that have been prevalent lately, I must ask, did your demon-touched scar hurt when the Fae were present? No, and to be honest, I don't understand that. The headmistress tilted her head. Hmm. It does seem like they should be linked, doesn't it? She paused and exhaled a soft sigh. And there is nothing else about that night or any other that you wish to inform me of? The ghost-possessing Amethyst was the obvious choice. But I couldn't tell the headmistress that. 
It would put Amethyst's life in danger. I shook my head. Nothing. Headmistress Wake studied me as if I was an interesting specimen she'd never seen before, then nodded and waved her hand toward the door. Thank you for your time, Miss Dane. I'll send instructions pertaining to your departure very soon. After dinner that night, Headmistress Wake summoned me to the foyer of spellcasters. Knowing I had little time, I found Eva, Hunter, and Alex in the spymaster's study area and said my goodbyes. She said that this year our missions might last up to four days, so I'm not sure when I'll be back. I hugged first Eva and then Hunter. Take good notes for me, okay? You know the notes are all on Alex. Eva waved her hand dismissively and pointed to her temple. I keep my knowledge locked up tight. No need for a bajillion notes. I laughed. Hear that, babe? I wrapped my arms around Alex's trim, muscular waist. You can count on me, sweets, Alex said. Our lips met in a kiss. When we broke apart, Alex grinned. Come back safe to us, okay? I nodded and descended the stairwell. I didn't see Phoebe in the common area, so I assumed she was already in the entryway. My hunch was proven right a few minutes later when I entered the academy foyer and found the headmistress, Phoebe, and oddly enough, Professor Despina waiting for us. I eyed the handsome young demonology professor. Any last tips? He chuckled. Unfortunately not, but Headmistress Wake requested that I look at your mark before you leave. She would like me to make sure it hasn't changed since the last time we examined it. Inwardly, I groaned. Professor Despina, or a healer from the infirmary, had been checking on my scar every two weeks since the beginning of term. It was routine, and often over quickly, so I didn't think much of it. But for some reason, Professor Despina's presence here bugged me. It made me think that Headmistress Wake didn't believe I was telling the truth about the night at the King's Castle. Plus, Phoebe was looking at me all weird now. It was pretty common knowledge that Ishtar had touched me, although few people knew what it meant because it had happened so rarely in history. I doubted Phoebe would ask me about it, but she'd probably grill Diana when we returned. Way to alienate me even more, guys, I thought as I pulled up the leg of my pants and placed my foot on the step. Despina bent down and inspected the mark. He never touched me, although sometimes the intensity in which he stared made it feel as if his fingers were probing my skin, searching for irregularities or remnants of evil within me. After a minute or so, Professor Despina stood. Miss Dane appears to be fine. Headmistress Wake nodded. Thank you, Professor. You may leave. Despina turned and strode down the hallway toward his classroom. When he was out of earshot, the headmistress turned to Phoebe and me and handed us each an envelope. These are your mission instructions. A car is waiting out front, and there are credit cards and plenty of cash in the denominations you need to complete your mission. Phoebe shot me a wary glance. We are not going to warp there? She asked, disbelief dripping from her tone. No, Miss Pudiator, unless Miss Dane is now capable of warping across state lines to an unseen destination. She looked at me. I shook my head, and Headmistress Wake nodded. I thought not. Except for the emergency pin I provided, you two are on your own this time around. Every year we will treat you more and more like regular spies of the Paranormal Intelligence Agency. As they have not had a warper on staff for thirty years, regular spies do not get warped from one assignment to the next. I stared down at the envelope, a sense of unease washing over me. No wonder these missions took longer. Who knew where in the world we would have to travel before we started our mission? If there are no other questions, the headmistress said, I will leave you two to it. Phoebe and I exchanged glances and shook our heads. Best of luck, girls, headmistress Wake said and walked away, leaving us to our own devices. Chapter 15 My lungs strained as we drove deeper into the Colorado Rockies. Phoebe had offered to drive, so I was relegated to the role of navigator for the duration of our journey from Denver to Crescent Springs, the old mining town turned resort mecca. As far as I could tell, 
We were due to arrive at our destination at noon, and I couldn't wait to get there. Hour by hour, the reason they gave the grind year students four days to complete a single mission became more clear. Without Professor Tittlebaum to warp us wherever we needed to go, missions took way longer. I might soon warp myself, vast distances to sights unseen, but without a vivid photograph as a guide or a prior visit, my confidence wasn't there yet. Are we close? Phoebe asked. I leaned over the old school map the car rental agency had provided. Traveling without cell phones was a pain in the ass, but I'd have to get used to it. Spellcasters confiscated our phones at the beginning of each year, and even if I had a phone, I wasn't sure it would work this deep in the woods. The map was our only option. I think it's five more miles and to the right. My finger followed the line representing the desolate mountain road we were driving down. Crescent Springs was at least an hour off a major highway, with no nearby towns. When we'd asked about it at the car rental agency, only two people had even heard of the place, and their reactions weren't promising. Our checkout agent had wrinkled her pert nose and claimed that Crescent Springs used to be a dump where only biker gangs lived. Apparently, about five years ago, some rich family had bought up most of the property in town and built a spa near the natural hot springs. Nowadays, it was a pricey boutique mountain village where tourists spent beaucoup money to relax in nature. And that wasn't all. Another agent overheard our conversation and added that if we planned on hiking, we needed to be careful. Lately, unidentified animals had been attacking visitors in the area. They had killed six people in the last month. Phoebe and I soaked up all the information, knowing that anything and everything might prove useful in completing our mission. And we needed all the help we could get because the objective the PIA and spellcasters had given us was vague at best. We were to find an object, supernatural in nature, and extract it from Crescent Springs for the PIA. I feel like I should say something before we really get started on this mission, Phoebe said, ripping me out of my musings. I turned from staring out the window to face her. Her arms were unnaturally stiff as they gripped the wheel. What's that? I want to apologize for how I treated you last year. I blinked. That was unexpected. Phoebe darted a glance at me, clearly gauging my reaction. Obviously, you hold no ill will toward me, and Diana said that you accepted her apology, so I don't know why it took me so long, but still, I wanted to throw it out there. She inhaled a big breath. So, I'm sorry, Odette. I was a jerk last year. I hope that you can forgive that. It was uncalled for, and I don't want my past actions to interfere with our ability to carry out this mission, or any future relationship we might have. Like her bestie, Phoebe didn't give half-assed apologies, and even though I hadn't actively been holding a grudge, the energy in the car shifted, telling me she'd given me what I needed to hear. Thank you, Phoebe. I appreciate that. And there are no hard feelings. My mission partner let out a massive exhale. No, thank you. I wanted to clear the air for a while, but didn't know how to bring it up. She gave me a sheepish look. Sometimes the simplest things are the hardest, I guess. At least that's what my mom says. Wise woman. Phoebe nodded and then leaned forward over the steering wheel and pointed up ahead. Is that the turn? I directed my attention to where she was pointing and nodded. That's got to be it. A minute later, she turned onto the road, and smooth cement became jostling gravel, occasionally broken up by potholes the size of roasting pans. It would be slow going the rest of the way. My finger followed the line on the map. Looks like we have about two more miles, and then the road becomes the main street of Crescent Springs. There are no turns or anything until we get into town, so we can't miss it. And they definitely won't miss us, Phoebe added. She was right. Outsiders would be obvious in a town this small and secluded. Gradually, the trees thinned and a town emerged. My lips parted in shock. I'd expected Crescent Springs would be a sweet little resort town filled with tiny but chic boutique establishments. I was so, so wrong. Every single building on the main street was either a classy-looking restaurant, a large hotel, or a legit mansion some that rivaled those back in Beverly Hills. I peered down a side street and saw more of the same. 
The overt lavishness seemed weird, not because it was unexpected for wealthy people to enjoy rustic places. I knew better than that, but all my parents' friends preferred their fancy vacation homes in places they could fly directly to. Crescent Springs had taken us five hours to get to from Denver. I couldn't see many of my parents' friends committing to that sort of travel regularly. And who in the world would have trucked supplies this far out? The construction costs of transporting and building this place must have been astronomical. Phoebe found a parking spot right in front of a little French bistro. When we got out of the car, the tantalizing aroma of baked bread filled my nostrils. You hungry? I asked, my mouth already watering. Maybe we can grab a croissant and coffee and walk around to get the feel of the town? Phoebe nodded, and we veered into the bakery. It was empty except for a girl our age behind the register who wore a name tag proclaiming that she was Leslie. Hi, what can I get for you? I'd like a coffee with cream, no sugar, and a pan au chocolat, please, I said. Leslie nodded, got what I ordered, and rang me up. I tipped her generously. First impressions in a town like this were extremely important. For the first time, she broke a smile. Thanks so much, she said, and then took Phoebe's order. My partner wasn't as prepared as I had been, so it took her a few minutes to decide, which suited our purpose as well. It gave me a moment to look around. My eyes roved over the bistro. It was tastefully decorated with black and gold fleur de lis. Photographs of people in muted, natural surroundings lined the walls closest to the register. Are those the owners of the bistro? I asked, gesturing to the nearest photo. Leslie's eyes shot to the pictures, and she nodded. Yup, and a couple of their friends are in the others. If you guys are staying at the Crescent Springs Hotel and Spa, you'll probably see those two. She pointed to a picture of a handsome couple, both brunettes and in their mid-forties. Even though the picture was taken from far away, something about it caught my attention. The couple's eyes were a strange shade of amber and seemed to glow back at me. My spine stiffened as I realized what type of supernatural we might find in Crescent Springs. Shifters typically had amber or silver eyes, depending on their animal aspect. The brighter the color, the more powerful they were. The ones in this photo must be very strong, if the shade of their eyes was any indication. We haven't booked for the night, Phoebe said. Should we have done that in advance? We heard it was the slow season. Leslie shook her head and handed over Phoebe's latte and a pastry. Nah, you're good. In two weeks, no one will get in without a booking. But you two came at the perfect time. It seems like right now everyone is staying away. Staying away? I asked, intrigued by how she'd phrased her explanation. Why? Animal attacks. When tourists come and stay here, they like to visit the spa and hike. As half of those activities are off the menu, it's less appealing for them to come here. She shrugged. You know, it's a long drive and all. A bell tinkled behind us and I turned to see a man dressed in slim-cut jeans, a Nordic sweater, and rich brown leather loafers. He was an extremely good-looking man of around 35, confident in his gait and body. When I turned back around to see that all the blood had left Leslie's face, my brows furrowed. Any guy who looked like that was someone I'd flirt with, if I were single. Why did she look so scared of him? Hi, Taylor. Leslie said, her tone shaky. What can I get for you today? The closer Taylor drew, the more obvious it became that he was a shifter. If his silver eyes didn't give it away, the pulse of his shifter magic as he leaned over the counter toward Leslie did. Leslie, honey, be a doll and get me a cappuccino and one of those lemon muffins I like so much. Leslie nodded and shot away from the counter to get his order. She seemed so uncomfortable. There was no way I could leave her with the guy. I motioned for Phoebe to grab a table a few spots away from the counter. Leslie returned with Taylor's order and handed it to him. I watched as his hand grabbed hers instead of the coffee, and he pulled her slowly but firmly across the counter and licked her cheek. The girl gasped and reared back, spilling coffee everywhere, including down the front of the man's pants. Oh, Dollface, you'd better help me clean up before you make another coffee. Grab a rag and get to wiping. His voice had lowered to a level that I was sure he thought we couldn't hear. 
Truthfully, if I hadn't been paying such close attention, I probably wouldn't have noticed. But tough luck for Taylor because I heard every word and saw how Leslie's eyes dropped nervously to the counter. Maybe you're feeling shy. We could go to the back and get me taken care of. Taylor growled suggestively. Leslie's jaw tightened, and her hand darted to grab a towel that she tossed at him. There you go, that's clean. While you're doing that, I'll grab you another coffee. On the house, of course. Honey, I insist that we go to the back. You know how I like to spend time with you. I've already told you, Taylor. Leslie's voice cracked. I am not interested in a relationship, or anything, really. Too bad. You owe me, dollface. My gaze shot to Phoebe's, and we stood. Get away from her, Phoebe commanded. Yeah, she said no. I crossed my arms over my chest as Taylor turned to face us. You should leave. I don't see what all the fuss is about, ladies. I'm waiting for my coffee. No, you weren't. Phoebe snarled. You propositioned her, and she's not interested. We might be visitors in this town, but you can bet your ass we'll be able to find the police station easily enough. She pointed to the door. Leave. Taylor's eyes narrowed. Fine. He spat and snatched up the muffin. But I'm not paying for this. You owe me, doll, and you can bet that I'll collect later. He pushed past us and stormed out the door. As soon as he disappeared, Leslie burst into tears. Thank you so much. He's been pushy lately, and I don't know how much longer I can hold him off. You should go to the police, Phoebe said. Leslie sniffed. I know, but... But what? I pressed. Did he threaten your life? If so, let us help. No! Fear rippled across her face. No, I'll do it. I'll do it today. I, I close up soon. I'll go then. I hope you do. I sighed and grabbed my coffee off the table. Do you need us to stay with you? Leslie shook her head. You've done enough already. Thank you so much. Don't worry about it. Phoebe smiled at her. But please, go to the cops. We left the bistro and made it halfway down the street when Phoebe inched closer to me. That messed up situation aside, did you sense the energies coming off those two? Two? Not Leslie, but that asshole was definitely a shifter. Leslie is a shifter of some type, too, she said. Weak blood, though. Much weaker than that douche. When Leslie gave me my change, her skin brushed mine, and I recognized it. I hummed trying to calm myself and collect my thoughts. And in the photo she pointed out, there was a shifter couple too, probably strong blood considering the glowing amber eyes. We walked another half block in silence, both considering what this meant. Finally, Phoebe spoke up. So it seems like whatever we're here to do, we'll be up against shifters. Hopefully they're not all assholes like Taylor. I wrinkled my nose and shook my head. I've never really dealt with them, but I know that their behavior depends on their animal aspect. The more aggressive the animal, the more aggressive the shifter. Even in human aspect. So finding that out is paramount. Phoebe nodded and bit her lip. I agree that we need to find out what subspecies live here. Her gaze darted right and then left before she leaned close to me. What do you think about the shifters having something to do with the so-called animal attacks happening in the area? I hadn't even considered connecting the two. Most shifters never attacked humans. They were more likely to fight or attack competing packs or prides than humans. What, you don't think so? Phoebe asked, taking my silence as skepticism. No, it's not that. Actually, I think you might be right on the money. I wonder if the attacks are related to the object we're supposed to find? I shook my head. I wish spellcasters had given us a little more info. Phoebe snorted out a laugh. They always want to make things a challenge. There was no doubt about that. After a couple of hours of walking around the tiny town and seeing mansion after mansion, we discovered the area where people of more modest means lived. 
the neighborhood was a ways away from the main strip and run down, although I understood why the town would want to put its best face forward. It still struck me as very odd that finding a single normal home outside that neighborhood seemed impossible. It reminded me of a slum, which was strange. Shifters usually took better care of their own kind. After Phoebe and I received a few shifty looks walking through the ghetto, we made our way back into the town center and checked into the hotel. There were plenty of rooms, and the desk clerk, yet another young, weak-blooded shifter, mentioned that the hot springs were in the far back of the hotel and that we should take advantage of them. There are a large group of guests arriving tomorrow, but tonight there are only a few, so they should be nice and private, the teenager said as he handed us our room key. Phoebe and I figured that hot springs were as good a place as any to talk, so we went to our rooms and changed. Ten minutes later, clad in shorts and tank tops, because neither of us had thought to bring swimsuits on a mission, we slipped into the mineral pools. Phoebe sank deep into the pool. So far I've only met shifters, and they all seem weak, especially the young ones. Do you think that it's their species' blood has weakened over time? I asked. Like they mated with humans or something? It's a possibility, Phoebe said. But since we arrived, have you seen a single person you would say is straight up human? I thought back. Every person I'd passed had radiated magical energies. No, you're right. I didn't sense a single human. Phoebe opened her mouth to say something, but the door to the spa flew open. And two ruckus couples glided in. Hi there. Phoebe waved good-naturedly. Enjoying your vacation? The woman in the group's forefront stopped laughing and turned to face us. I sucked in a breath, immediately aware that we had misjudged them as tourists. The woman in front was the shifter from the picture in the bistro. Her amber eyes glowed even brighter in real life. We're not tourists, darling. I'm Rita Hayes, and this is my husband, Bob, the woman said. We live in town. Henry and Judith here, she gestured to the other couple, are the proprietors of this hotel, and I own half of Main Street. Her nose tilted up in the air. I pressed my lips together, trying to hold in my mirth. I'd led a charmed life, and money no longer impressed me, but there were always people whom it impressed a hell of a lot. More often than not, those people were new money and loved to flaunt it. This is Odette, and I'm Phoebe, my partner gestured to each of us in turn. We visited a lot of places on the main street today. As a matter of fact, we seem to have covered most of the town already. She lifted herself out of the pool to rest her arms on the stone side. Since you're locals, maybe you can suggest a few hidden gems we might not have noticed that we can try tomorrow, or a safe trail, or even a place to commune with the magical elements around here. At the mention of magic... The couples exchanged glances. Henry's nose twitched, telling that he had the best sense of smell out of the four. Witches? He asked tentatively. We nodded. We go to UC Boulder, I said, and gave them a conspiratorial grin. We just needed to get away from campus for the weekend. The mountains were calling, as they say. The foursome exchanged glances again. It was almost as if they were conferring with each other. I wondered if one was Alpha and could speak mind to mind with the others. After their conference ended, the group moved toward us in unison. Their movements reminded me of prowling wolves, and the strong shifter vibe intensified. I shot Phoebe a glance and noticed that she looked a little wary. As a matter of fact, Rita's lips curled into a smile as the group paused next to our pool. I do have suggestions. There are a few trails close to town that are safe. We'll leave a map of those at the front desk. But, she pursed her lips playfully, as college girls, you might have fun at our party tomorrow night. A lot of the town leaders are getting together for drinks and a good time. Her friends nodded, and Rita wiggled her eyebrows. If you two are looking for the real Crescent Springs experience, we'd love to have you. There will be a lot of shifters there, romping under the full moon. Some of them young like you, and very handsome. We'd love to come, I said, hiding my shock at the invitation. 
It wasn't unheard of for magical species to mix, but being invited to a pack gathering when we just met was odd. But since we were spies in training, oddities were welcome opportunities to investigate. Can we bring anything? I asked. Oh, no, girls. We'll supply everything. You'll be our honored guests. We want to show you a good time. Rita pulled a tiny notepad out of the bag she carried and jotted something down. Here's my address. The party starts at nine. I smiled and took the scrap of paper, praying to the universe that it was a lead. Chapter 16 After a day of searching fruitlessly for clues, we returned to the hotel to change into party attire. It was strange to be looking forward to a party in a strictly professional capacity, but as we hadn't come across a single lead all day, I was beginning to see the get-together as our last shot. More than anything, I wanted to find the item spellcasters had sent us to Crescent Springs for and return to the Academy pronto. My fingers sought my protective talisman, and I rubbed the pendant for comfort. I take it that's more than the emblem they gave us when we were inducted into the Society of Spies? Phoebe asked. I knitted my brows together. What makes you think that? You've been wearing it almost all year, even when it didn't go with your outfit. I might not know you well, Odette, but I know you like to look good. Phoebe gave me a pointed look as she shimmied into tight leggings that she'd paired with a long, torso-hugging sweater. On the hem of the sweater, as if it were merely the emblem of the brand, was the pin Headmistress Wake had given us to use in case of an emergency. Phoebe looked put together, but not like she was trying too hard. And most important of all, not like a spy. I nodded at her astute observation about the talisman. Alex and I charmed it so that we'd know that the other is safe. Phoebe smiled. I know Di hated seeing you guys together last year. But now that everything is cool between you two, I have to admit, you're a cute couple. There's something about you. It's like you belong together. Thanks. If Phoebe only knew half of what was between Alex and me, an unexplainable connection that seemed to span centuries, she'd be gobsmacked. Not wanting to think about Eminem at that moment, I turned to pick out my outfit for the party. Like Phoebe, I chose leggings and a loose tunic top that complemented my emergency pin. I almost went for a pair of ballet flats, but reconsidered and pulled out a pair of floral patterned slip-on sneakers that looked nice but were also comfortable. It was important for spies to be able to run. Ready? Phoebe asked. I nodded. Let's hit the town. Rita's home was located a block away from the main street, and buzzed like a million bees swarmed inside. Phoebe leaned close as we approached the door. So after we get the lay of the land, we call for a bathroom break, and then you'll warp us into other rooms so we can inspect them, right? Yup. We can't stay in the bathroom forever, but it's a good place to start. Phoebe nodded. Flying under the radar for as long as possible was a necessity. There was no way either of us could outrun or outfight a pack of shifters without some sort of advantage. If we find what we're looking for and can't leave nonchalantly, we'll return to the bathroom and I'll warp us to the car. We'd already packed up our stuff and moved the car to a side street in the crappier neighborhood in case shit hit the fan. Perfect, Phoebe whispered as we climbed the front steps. I rang the bell, and the door flew open immediately, making me jump. Girls, Rita crooned, so glad you could make it. She motioned for us to come in, and we obliged taking a few steps into a foyer that looked like it was straight out of Versailles. Phoebe took the front position and began engaging Rita in small talk. This enabled me to take in my surroundings, which I'd need a thorough understanding of to warp us effectively. Already, my witch senses were tingling harder than they had all day. I was almost positive that our intuition about the party had been right. We need to find whatever we're looking for in this huge-ass house and leave fast. Suddenly, Rita took a hard right into a shallow alcove and pushed open a set of double doors. Phoebe let out a little squeak and stepped backward, right into me. I peered around her, and my eyes popped open. Holy shit. As you can see, this is our coupling room. 
Rita threw her arms wide, as if she was showing off a priceless piece of art and not a bunch of shifters ripping each other's clothes off. I wasn't sure if joining in on the full moon festivities would interest you girls, but I thought I should inform you sooner rather than later. Her eyebrows wiggled. She looked delighted by the scene. If you want to join, walk on in, with or without a partner. As the night wears on, this room will become more popular. There are also more rooms upstairs if you prefer more intimacy. Um, thanks. Phoebe choked out. We'll pass, but it's good to know our... Uh, options. Rita's grin grew. Do as you wish. I realize that witches are more prudish than shifters, but there is no judgment here. She shut the door. Follow me, ladies. Note to self. Do not warp into that room. Rita continued the tour, showing us rooms with pool tables, an offshoot into an actual pool, and finally, the main party space, where people huddled around a bar. You're free to explore, although I dare say most of the fun will be had in this very ballroom. We even have dueling pianos scheduled to start in an hour. Rita's grin grew as she twirled around in ecstasy. I scanned the ballroom. There had to be at least 80 people here, way more than Rita had led us to believe would be at the party. I was about to ask if she'd had a few last-minute RSVPs when my eyes latched onto a familiar face. Leslie stared back at me from behind the bar, a bottle of vodka raised as if she had been about to pour a shot. I waved, and her eyes grew as wide as saucers. Interesting. This is fabulous. Thanks for inviting us, Rita. Your friends look like a fun bunch, I said as I latched arms with my partner. Want to get a drink? Sure, Phoebe said, looking confused. Her reaction wasn't unwarranted. Spellcasters allowed us alcohol during our missions, especially in situations which it would look odd not to indulge. But one of the first rules of espionage was to get a lay of the land before ingesting any substance that may hinder your mental capabilities. Rita clapped her hands together. Go get liquored up. Our bartenders make mean martinis. We'll take you up on that, I said and pulled Phoebe away. I thought we planned to scout a little first. She whispered as soon as we separated from Rita. She looked left, then right, and scooted closer to me. Also, do you notice that the staring is super intense? I nodded. We were probably the only witches here, and outsiders to boot, so it made sense that people were interested. But something else lingered in their gazes, too. Something that sent chills up my spine. They looked hungry. Recognize the girl behind the bar? I asked. Phoebe's attention shifted. Leslie, she looks shocked to see us, frightened, like someone we should question. There were two other bartenders, but we strode over to Leslie's third of the bar. Thankfully, fewer people crowded her side, so we weren't crushed by people or at risk of being overheard. Leslie finished serving a man and hustled over to us. What are you two doing here? I arched an eyebrow. Rita invited us to the party. I take it that's uncommon? Leslie bit her lip. Less so than you'd think. I just didn't know they'd invited outsiders tonight. This party was supposed to be... I leaned over the bar top. Pack only? She sucked in a breath. How did you know? We're witches, Phoebe said, looking shocked that Leslie couldn't figure it out. I suspected that had something to do with her being such a weak shifter. Oh. Leslie seemed to grow more tense. That explains things. A guest called to her from down the bar, and she assured him she'd be right there. Do you girls want anything? Ricardo will only take drinks from me, and he gets stupid pushy if I'm not quick. We both ordered champagne, and Leslie poured the drinks. And when she handed them over, she held the glass for a second too long and leaned closer. Be careful tonight, she whispered, and then rushed off to help Ricardo. That was odd, Phoebe said. I nodded. Something is totally up around here. It's time we give ourselves a tour. We moved to the side of the room and slipped down a hallway where a few people mingled. Phoebe asked where the restroom was to deflect attention. 
Luckily, it was almost all the way down the passage, so we got to peer inside room after room as we went. Most were empty, although people were engaged in quieter conversations in a few spaces. One room looked to be the home base of the old boys' club, with bountiful cigar smoke pluming in the air and whiskey in every glass. We were nearly to the bathroom when a slight shift in energy raised the hairs on my arms, and then, to my astonishment, my demon-touched scar began to burn. My blood ran cold, and I stopped suddenly. Did you feel that? Phoebe nodded. The strange vibration? It's further down the hall, I think. Yup. Darting a glance backward, I caught sight of a group of shifters at the end of the corridor staring at us. I beamed at them, and for good measure, leaned into Phoebe, locking arms with her sloppily. The shifters must have thought I couldn't hold my drink, because they grinned and turned back around. Suspicion averted, at least for now. We should hurry, before others notice that we're nosing around, particularly Rita or her husband. We walked further down the hall, aware that people were probably still watching. I added a few stumbles and exaggerated sways to my gait. None of the doors this far down were open, which had my witchy senses pinging. Most of the vibrations were coming from the right side of the hall, and everything inside me screamed that we needed to open the last door. Something down there was putting off the wrong energies. I suspected that wasn't a coincidence. Rita had put it far away from the ballroom for a reason, but it would look too suspicious if we just went in for it. We needed to warp inside that room and discover what it was. I loosened my grip on Phoebe and swayed to the side. Oopsie! I cried as my shoulder slammed into the closet door. I expertly twisted the handle as if to save myself, and for effect, I sloshed half the champagne out of my flute. Dang, that stuff is strong! Phoebe's eyes darted to the end of the hall. You're such a lightweight! She scolded loudly for the benefit of those watching. Need another drink? Someone called. I giggled and held up my nearly empty glass. She won't let me. Then darting a glance into the room I'd opened, I gestured inside. We found the library. I think I need to sit down until the spins stop. The shifters nodded, and Phoebe and I shut the library door behind us. She bit her lip. They're watching us like hawks. Yup, I said. Lock the door. She arched an eyebrow. What if they come to check, or Rita does? Hopefully we won't be here still, I said, setting my empty glass down and facing toward the hallway. Phoebe set her glass down, too. Can you warp in there, sight unseen? It helps that it's not far, and I know exactly where the door is located. I need a moment to visualize the area. Phoebe didn't respond, so I hopped to it, closing my eyes and visualizing the hallway. Mentally, I moved toward the end and then opened the final door on the right. I had no idea what was inside, but the strange energy still vibrated within me, and my demon mark burned dully. Okay, when the warp hole is open, let me go through first. When I say the word, you follow. Got it. I wasted no time altering the surrounding energies, pushing and reshaping them so they formed a tunnel through space. When the warp hole was complete, a rush of heat washed over me. I opened my eyes. It was getting much easier, even if it still took loads of concentration. My lessons with Tittlebaum were paying off. Let's do this, I said, and stepped through the warp hole. The moment I emerged on the other side, my heart stopped. We hit the jackpot. Chapter 17 What's going on in here? Phoebe breathed as she scanned the space on the other side of my warp hole. I'm not sure, but that thing must be what we came here for. A circle lined with bones and lit with votive candles was in the center of the room. A glowing gem that I couldn't take my eyes off of rested in the middle. On one wall, an altar of sorts held various golden goblets, and although it was possible one of those was the item we'd been sent here for, Every bone in my body screamed that the stone was our quarry. Let's grab it and get out of here. Something in this room feels very, very wrong. 
Phoebe glanced at the banners that hung along each wall, all of which portrayed wolves in violent acts, and shuddered. I couldn't agree more. My demon mark burned like the dickens, and the very air in this space seemed to vibrate with malice. I wanted nothing more than to leave, and we would, as soon as I got that glowing stone. I walked carefully toward the circle, trying to suss out any wards or harmful spells before I entered. It was unlike shifters to interact with magic other than the kind that allowed them to shift, but something was different about this pack. The fact that they were making circles meant that magic was not out of the question. They were dangerous, too. The burn of my demon mark assured me of that much. Phoebe stayed back. Her hands directed at the door in case something happened, so I crossed the bone and candle threshold alone. The moment I did, the creeptastic factor intensified. My scar seared, as if I had set my ankle on a stovetop. An image of Ishtar flashed in my mind, and the ruby-red gemstone in the center of the circle glowed even brighter. My heart began to thunder, and my pace quickened. I'd reached the center of the circle when the doorknob jiggled. Girls, are you in there? This room is off limits. On the other side of the door, Rita's voice was high and falsely cheery. Odette. Phoebe shot me a glance. I know. I have to make us... Before I could even bend down to pick up the massive hunk of ruby, a key clicked in the lock and the door swung open. I whipped around to find Rita, her nose transforming as she took on wolf shape. There were other shifters at her back, already in their snarling wolf aspects. Well, well, Rita sneered. I see you two aren't what you seem either. Her eyes changed color to match the otherworldly glow of the red stone. My mouth went dry. Oh, shit. We were in major trouble. I lowered into a squat to scoop up the gem. Stay away from my demon stone, Rita screamed. The ruby lifted off the ground, floating into the air, and a yelp escaped me as I fell backward onto my butt. Stupid witch. Not many of our sacrifices like to expedite their demise and give their life force to my stone. Rita shook her head as if we were the biggest idiots ever. You didn't even indulge. A pity, as this will be your last night on this earth. The candles flared, and the bones began to glow an eerie red that matched the stone. I gulped as what was happening, what had likely happened to all those tourists who disappeared, crashed over me. You've been siphoning life force from visitors. My voice came out in a terrified croak. Rita cackled. Yes, yes. We started with the omegas of our pack, but had to put an end to that. The children kept growing weaker. It wasn't sustainable. But visitors, especially other magicals, are the perfect target. Why? Phoebe asked, her hand still extended defensively. Have you ever been destitute? Rita snapped. This town was nothing. A decrepit mining town that survived on social services. I was sick to death of being the joke of the entire state. So I made a deal to change my fate and soon realized I could elevate the status of my home, too. I shuddered at the implication. Rita had made a deal with a demon for power, and now all she had to do was spill a bit of blood to maintain it. The government knows, I said. Give us the stone, and maybe they'll go easy on you. Spellcasters, Rita's eyes narrowed, and as if the shock of discovering who we were was too much, she reverted to a woman. I always thought they'd send other shifters. She threw her head back and laughed. The Furies were right. We're the most powerful of our kind. I love it. The shifter extended her hand and squeezed her fingers inward. The demon stone, which had been hovering in front of me, soared toward her. I jumped forward to stop it, my hands reaching outward. Fuchsia magic burst from them, and the stone stopped in midair as my magic fought Rita's power for control. Rita gasped, and her magic, the power she'd gotten from the stone, faltered momentarily as the shifter thrust a finger at me. Fuchsia, it's you. My stomach dropped as I realized my mistake. The leaders of this pack had made a deal with the Furies, a three-in-one aspect of a royal princess of hell, which meant they knew about me and that the royals wanted me for their own purposes. 
By order of our masters, capture them. Rita screamed, confirming my worst fear. The wolves burst into the room. I moved to grab Phoebe and get us out of there, but the crazy girl leapt away from me toward the jaws of ten wolves. My blood skittered in my veins, and a shield flew from my hands, weaving together as it traveled and wrapped itself around Phoebe with only seconds to spare. Two of the wolves rammed straight into the protection and fell to the ground. Hurry! I screamed as I manipulated a second shield around myself and prepared to open a warp hole. Phoebe was there in a second, snatching the stone out of the air and running back toward me. I pictured where we parked the car, and a warp hole opened up between us. I dropped our shields, which were protections that warp holes did not allow for, and dove through. Heat and then chilling cold engulfed us, reassuring me. No matter where we ended up, we'd no longer be in Rita's mansion. That was... I released a scream as teeth snapped down on my foot seconds before I crashed onto cement. Close it, Odette. A wolf is coming through. I squeezed my eyes shut in pain and, following Phoebe's instructions, released the warp hole. The sickening sound of ripping flesh and liquid dripping onto the ground hit my ears. The sensation of teeth piercing my skin disappeared. Oh my God, Phoebe said. And even though I knew the horrors I would see, I couldn't stop myself from looking. A hand flew to my mouth as vomit climbed up my throat. Half a wolf lay in the middle of the road glassy-eyed, with its intestines smeared on the ground. I closed the war pole around him and sliced his body in half. My stomach heaved, and I wanted to fall apart right then and there. But I couldn't, because at that very moment, an eerie howl broke through the night, sending chills down my spine as it snapped me to attention. I sat up and scanned our surroundings. Even though we'd gotten away, we weren't safe yet. I hadn't landed us precisely where I wanted. We were still about half a block from the car. Help me up, I said. We have to get to the car. Phoebe hauled me to my feet and slithered a shoulder under mine. We'd made it almost halfway when the howls grew louder. I twisted to look behind us, and all the breath flew from my lungs. At least a dozen wolves were sprinting straight for us. Faster, I screamed. Despite my foot throbbing each time it contacted cement, we picked up the pace and actually reached the car, where I saw something that made my stomach drop to my knees. Someone had put a goddamn boot on it. Make another warp hole, Phoebe urged. I closed my eyes, but the terrifying howls made it difficult to focus, and when I tried to create a portal, my magic didn't respond. Hurry, Phoebe urged. I, I can't. Let's use the pin. Ugh. Someone grabbed my arm roughly and pulled. Come with me. Leslie screamed. And using the strength that she certainly didn't look like she possessed, she took half my weight and yanked me to a jeep in front of our rental. Get in. We did as she said, and Leslie hurled herself into the driver's seat and started the engine. Then she stepped on the gas, and we hauled ass to the main drag and then out of town leaving a pack of wolves howling and snarling in our wake. Chapter 18 Holy crap, you had one crazy mission! Eva squealed so loudly that an elderly patron of Potions and Pastries Cafe shot her a disapproving look. She lowered her voice. I feel so bad for that girl. Leslie? I nodded. I know, right? How much would it suck for members of your own pack to be siphoning off your magic all your life? I shook my head, unable to believe what the girl had told Phoebe and me as we booked it out of Crescent Springs and back to Denver. But it worked out. Phoebe and I got the Demon Stone, which I guess gave the pack leaders immense power that no one was brave enough to challenge. Leslie escaped that hellhole and gets to start her life over. And the government apprehended Rita and the other pack leaders. Eva grinned at me. Damn, girl, you guys did good. I couldn't help but smile back. We did, didn't we? And I have to admit, it felt amazing to do something on our own. Eva sighed. I can't wait for my mission. I can definitely wait for the next one. I gestured down at my wrapped foot. After Phoebe, Leslie, and I arrived back at Spellcasters, I'd stayed under quarantine in the infirmary for two nights, 
The head healer had released me only a couple hours before. After I was free, I'd met up with Alex for a few minutes before his tutoring session. Once he was gone, Eva insisted that we venture to Wandstown for some girl time. I bet. What kind of special potion did they give you to heal? I huffed out a breath. They didn't. After they were assured that I wasn't infected with a shifter disease, the healers decided that the wound should close naturally. They said it would be best for my body to do the work so my immune system will be in top form for the spy games. Oh my god, girl, you are on the move. I can't believe that's in a week. Eva took a sip of her Earl Grey tea. You and me both. A wave of exhaustion rolled over me, and I changed the subject. Anything happen while I was away? Alex said it was business as usual, a lot of classes and physical conditioning, but you know how he is. Eva shrugged. Not much, no quizzes or tests. The classes were hell, but that's par for the course. I had a rune reading with Professor Adito, which was interesting. Eva trailed off for a moment before her eyes lit up. Oh, Diana and Andre are a legit item now. I saw them kissing in the halls. About time. Yeah, they were all over each other. Any other juicy gossip? She leaned close to me. It's not so much gossip, but I have noticed Amethyst is acting strange. She kept asking about you, almost obsessively. As if I would know what was going on with your mission. Alex mentioned it too. Have you talked to her since returning? I nodded and bit my lip. Amethyst had found me right after I was released from the infirmary. After assuring her that I hadn't mentioned the possession, she'd backed off, but her persistence was a little unnerving. It made me wonder if she wasn't telling me something. Had the ghost possessed her again while I was gone? I wanted to bring it up, but was worried that it would freak her out even more. Hey, you've gone all serious. What's going on? I thought Amethyst was worried about your mission, but now I feel like it's something else. I gulped. It's nothing. Don't lie to me, Odie. I can tell that something is up. Eva studied me. Her eyes narrowed. Why won't you tell me? Something in me broke, and a wall, an admittedly flimsy one that I hadn't really wanted to hold up in the first place, came crashing down. It's not that I don't want to, it's that I can't, or someone will get hurt. Amethyst? I nodded, but clammed up again as the owner of Potions and Pastries, Miss Iris, appeared at the table and asked if we needed any more tea. We declined, and Miss Iris bustled off, content to let us chat as she took care of her other customers. I cleared my throat, desperate for someone else to know what had happened. The same things that will hurt us will hurt her. Eva's eyes popped open wide. This demon? She touched her face. I shook my head. So it's got to be that one. She gestured toward my ankle, and I nodded. The queen spoke to her? I bit my lip, but even as the hesitation rose, I knew there was no backing out now. Eva knew the most important part. And honestly, if I was going to free Amethyst from this threat, I needed help. Lots and lots of help. Spoke through her, in a special Rhine's way. Eva's hand flew to her mouth. Spirit talking? Through a freaking ghost? Her arm dropped to her lap, and a look of awe spread across her face. Well, damn, that sucks. Impressive as hell, but still, sucks. And Amethyst has been freaking out about it, I'm not supposed to say anything or the queen will return. Any ideas on how to keep her safe and prevent it from happening again? Eva was quiet for a moment. Have you thought about asking Amethyst if she can confer with other ghosts about this? Perhaps they'll have answers. My mouth dropped open at the obvious and genius idea. I haven't, but you can bet your butt I will now. And I'll want your help when I do. I had a lot to catch up on after my mission, and didn't particularly want to confront Amethyst about thoroughly considering what to say and all the possible scenarios. Plus, that girl was damn busy. Of course, everyone in the grind year was busy, but Amethyst seemed extraordinarily so. In the end, it took the rest of the week for Eva and me to find Amethyst alone in a library study pod. The pods were basically rooms for those who needed a small group space or extra quiet. I generally avoided them because they smelled of old books, which wasn't a scent that I loved, but Amethyst spent a lot of time in the pods because the green tower could get noisy. 
At least we have an out if Amethyst gets too upset, Eva said. Dinner starts soon, and you need to be there right when they open the cafeteria. I plan on making you eat all the food, because who the heck knows if that vampire school will have normal food? What if they only serve you liquid? I chuckled. I highly doubt that. But there'll be at least 12 of us there who eat normal food, and they wanted us to come a day early. Headmistress Wake wouldn't agree to that if they weren't providing regular food. Fine then, carb loading. I'll load your plate up with your faves, all the Hawaiian pizza you can eat. An envious expression crossed Eva's face. Damn, when I think of carb loading, I kind of wish I was a spellcaster's champion, although I appreciated her attempt to remain lighthearted. Her mention of the spy games tied my already testy stomach into deeper knots. The champions were scheduled to leave early the next day for Night Dwellers Academy, the first host of the games. It was exciting, but also a lot to take in. I felt like I was just getting my feet beneath me after my mission, and now I had to leave again. That's the grind, I reminded myself for the millionth time as we knocked on the door to the study pod. Amethyst looked up from the text that she was scrutinizing, and a smile blossomed on her face. She waved us in. I shut the door behind us. Hey, girl, can we talk? Amethyst's eyebrows furrowed together, but she shut her book. Sure, what's on your mind? First, I want to know, are there any ghosts around right now? Amethyst's gaze darted around the air for a few moments before she shook her head. Nope, just us. Good, because it's about that day in tarot and divination, I said, and the poor girl's eyes practically bugged out of her head as they shot from Eva to me and back again. I know I'm not supposed to tell anyone what happened, I added quickly so Amethyst wouldn't keel over, and I haven't, but Eva guessed that something was up. Sort of, with some help. When? Amethyst demanded, her jaw set in a hard line. Earlier this week, Eva kept her tone measured and her face neutral as she sat across from Amethyst. I followed her lead, hoping that if we stayed calm, Amethyst would too. And you're still here probably because Odie and I were careful not to mention any names or specifics. Amethyst shook her head and stood. Her shoulders trembled with anger. I can't believe you put my life on the line. I trusted you. We might have a way to get you out of this, I interrupted before she could work herself into a furious frenzy. Her eyes narrowed. What do you mean, a way out? How can we outsmart a royal of hell? I arched an eyebrow, somewhat offended. You act as if I haven't already done that. Don't you remember who I fought during the Beltane trial? Amethyst colored slightly. It, I, it's not, that's not what I meant. This is different. She knows, Eva said. And this is not the time to get all butthurt, Odie. Let's stay on track and see if what we came up with would even work. My cheeks heated. Eva was right. I'd just grown so used to having to defend myself against haters that sometimes a little attitude slipped out. Go ahead, then, I said. It was your idea. Eva turned her attention to Amethyst. Have you considered asking other ghosts about the possession? Amethyst's spine straightened. What do you mean? I assume that there are lots of other ghosts here, Eva gestured around. A school like this is a perfect place for them. Amethyst nodded. Spellcasters has about 50 in residence. Some pop in and out. I'd say half of those live here full time. Holy crap, 50 ghosts were floating around me all the time? I shivered, suddenly glad that I didn't seem gifted in spirit walking and talking. Do you talk to them often? Eva pressed. Two or three like to chat. But most I can't reach yet. I'm not a fully trained spirit talker, and I haven't even started spirit walking yet except for that time in divination. Which doesn't count because you weren't in control, Eva said, as if she knew everything on the subject. No. Amethyst lowered herself into her chair and placed her hands flat on the table, as if they would help ground her to one spot. Well, since you can access a couple of ghosts, Eva's voice dropped, and I inched toward her, as if I didn't know what was coming. Do you think they could tell you something about the ghost that inhabited you? She reached across the table to lay a hand on Amethyst's. Are you willing to ask around and get the information? If you do and want to share it with us, maybe we can help you banish the ghost or something. 
You may have noticed Eva and I are pretty good at evading powerful beings, I added, hoping to ease the lingering tension in Amethyst's shoulders. It worked, and her lips twisted up in a small smile. I would have to be blind not to see that. She sucked in a huge breath and released it slowly, clearly processing the idea. I'll admit, it's a decent plan. I'll start asking around tonight and hope someone has an answer. Amethyst's eyes turned on me. Thanks for looking out for me and trying to prevent another possession. Sorry I lashed out. No worries, girl. We'll do everything we can to help. I said, hopeful that, together, we could find a solution that wouldn't put her life in danger. Chapter 19 Later that night, as I perched on my bed, I groaned and grabbed my stomach. Eva wasn't joking when she said she'd make me eat all the food. I totally overdid it with the Hawaiian pizza. I have a food baby. Alex shut the door behind us and came to sit next to me. We were finally getting a rare moment alone since I'd returned from my mission, and already I knew it would be too brief. I asked him to stay the night, but he'd declined. He didn't want to keep me up too late because less sleep could affect my performance during the spy games. I'd wanted to argue with him that not being at my side the night before the start of a massive tournament might cause me to lose sleep too, but the excuse didn't work. This is what I get for dating a healer. He's always looking out for my health. Eva's making sure you're prepared for the games in the best way she knows how, Alex said, just like I'm about to do. My ears perked up, and my hands went to the buttons on his shirt. They were only there for a second before he gently grabbed them and set them back in my lap. Not like that, sweets. I pouted. Tease. At least not yet. He winked. Hope surged like fire in my blood, and giving in to whatever he had planned, I leaned back and propped myself up on my elbows. So how are you going to help the spellcasters team win against the other schools, if not by allowing me a much-needed reprieve from stress? I waggled my eyebrows, and Alex laughed. The sound warmed my heart. Outside of classes, I hadn't seen much of him, or anyone really, as I would have liked. Alex reached into his pocket and pulled out a small golden vial. My eyebrows knitted together. What's that? Part of how I'll keep you safe, he said as he pulled off the top. Hunter and I made this potion. We had to sneak into the potion room to get some of the rarer ingredients, but I think it will be worth it for the peace of mind. It's supposed to repel vampires. Oh. I trailed off. I'd appreciate it if you took it with you to the first Spy Games event, assess the situation, and the vamps at Night Dwellers. If you trust them and think it's all friendly competition, don't drink it. But it's better safe than sorry. If any of them seem off... I plucked the vial from his hands. I'll take it. I kissed him on the cheek. Although, I hope I don't have to use it. Me too, sweets. Me too, Alex said. His gaze dropped to the talisman on my wrist. I raised my hand. I'm not going to use this, you know that, right? This is for real danger, not fabricated games. He shook his head. I know, but still wear it. None of the other schools will be as warded as spellcasters. I'll want to know if the demons show up and you're in trouble. I nodded. I wish you were going with me. Having someone there who knows everything that's happening would be so nice. I pushed the fact that Alex didn't know about Amethyst from my mind. He worried enough as it was. He didn't need to hear about that. At least, not until we had a solution. Me too, he said. Honestly, I kind of wish I'd entered the damn spy games. You and I had top choice, and I blew my chance to be at your side. I even considered going to the headmistress and demanding that I join the champions at the other academies, but that would raise too many questions. I figure I'll wait until the first game is over to become the overprotective boyfriend. As much as I loved Alex, I so did not want him becoming that, and I want the chance to prove myself. As if you haven't done that a hundred times already. Alex whispered and leaned in. He wrapped his arms around me and pulled me close. The next thing I knew, we were kissing. Alex's hands roamed my back sending a thrill up my spine. I wanted him close to me, as close as we could be. So I pulled back slightly and peeled off my shirt. An appreciative look that never got old washed over his face. 
I've been saving it for a special occasion, I said, trailing a finger over the black lace of my new bra and the undies to match. Alex's lips parted. You've been hiding that all day, and you let me go on about vampire-repelling potions and how I feel like a lame boyfriend for not joining the games? His blue eyes bore through me. You're a cruel woman. I batted my eyelashes. How can I make it up to you, Mr. Wardwell? Alex's eyes drifted to my chest. There are ways. Ways? Like? Alex's hands gripped my shoulder as he laid me down on the bed and straddled me. His lips found mine, and I arched up to meet him. If this was how I'd serve my penance, so be it. Chapter 20 My stomach jumped and twisted. The spellcaster's champions would soon travel to night dwellers for the opening of the spy games. Headmistress Wake had instructed us to pack an overnight bag, but I'd packed for a week because I like to be prepared. I loaded my duffel up with clothes, makeup, and some snacks that Eva had procured from the cafeteria at breakfast and insisted that I take with me. When the bag was almost full, I added the vampire-repelling potion, nestling it between a pair of jeans and my socks so it wouldn't break. Finally, I placed the name tag had Mistress Wake had given me around the handle. Once I felt ready, I exited my room to find Diana waiting for me at the top of the stairs. Alex, Hunter, and Eva stood with her. Didn't know you guys were out here, I said, walking up to meet the crew. We never let you leave without saying goodbye. Hunter strode forward first and wrapped his arms around me. Knock their socks off, Odie. Eva sidled up to hug me next. You got this, girl. Kick their asses. Alex was last, and his eyes went straight to the talisman on my wrist. Good. You didn't forget to put it on this morning. As if I could. You only remind me 52 times last night. I teased. I packed the potion, too. I just want to keep you safe, babe. He squeezed me tight. I love you. Love you, too. I returned his embrace. When we broke apart... I gave them all one last smile. See you guys when we get back. Shouldn't be later than tomorrow night. Alex's lips tightened. Maybe a little later for me. He pulled a scrap of paper from the pocket of his pants. I found this taped to my door after breakfast. I'll be leaving soon, too. It seems that Headmistress Wake wants to take no chance that we might try to be together during missions. I shook my head. That woman was so damn thorough. Any idea where you're going? Nope. Ms. Seely will meet Mina and me with all the details at two, but that doesn't matter. We'll handle whatever they throw at us, so don't worry. I'll be rooting for you and missing you. Same, babe. We kissed one more time, and then I broke off from my friends, who waved Diana and me down the stairs. When we were at the bottom, I turned to the headmistress's daughter. I didn't expect you to wait for me. Diana shrugged. I figured we might as well go together, you know. Start bonding early so we can kick the competition's ass. A small smile broke on my face. Diana had sucked during our culling year. I appreciated that she was attempting to be a better person. Maybe even a friend. Only time will tell. We made our way to Alice Kittler Hall, where Professor Tittlebaum preferred to open warp holes. Despite being five minutes early, Sam, Andre, and Headmistress Wake were already waiting. Ready, everyone? The Headmistress wasted no time as we joined the group. Everyone confirmed that they were, and Professor Tittlebaum opened a warp hole. One by one, we stepped through, and when I emerged onto a grassy downslope on the other side, I gasped with delight. The school was a castle, black as night and gleaming in the morning sunlight that just managed to fend off the chill in the air. Hundreds of onyx spires twisted toward the sky, and a dozen towers rushed up between them, all vying for the status of tallest. To top it all off, the school was smack dab in the center of a ring of mountains so majestic they made my heart skip a beat. Holy crap, Sam said, inching up toward me. Took the words right out of my mouth, I said, unable to rip my eyes from the gothic wonderland down the hill. How do they protect themselves? Diana, ever the practical one, asked. I don't sense any wards. Just because they're not right in front of you doesn't mean they don't exist. The headmistress pointed upward. 
We followed her finger, squinting up into the sun. It took a few moments, but I caught the telltale signs of a shield shimmering and slightly pulsating in the sunlight. Only in the sky? Diana's gaze dropped to meet her mother's eyes. Like, to hide the school from planes? The sky and all the way down to the tops of the surrounding mountains. When Night Dwellers was founded, witches created the shield and spelled the castle so that humans felt disinclined to climb the mountains. That sounded like a lot of work. I wondered if the Fey Academy had to take even further precautions, as Fey looked otherworldly without their glamour. The spellcaster's delegation has arrived, a boisterous voice called from behind us, startling me out of my admiration. I whirled around to find the tall, gangly form of Headmaster Ezra rushing down the mountainside. My eyes widened, taking in the incredible speed at which he ran, and the cohort of vampire students at his back. It was the first time I'd seen the headmaster up close, and without a black hood. I was surprised to see that he was younger than I had imagined, no older than forty. His dark brown hair showed no trace of gray, his eyes gleamed with youth, and there wasn't a wrinkle on his pale skin. While many people would opt to remain in their twenties if given the chance to turn into a vampire. Looking at Headmaster Ezra, I disagreed. The headmaster had been changed in the prime of his life. I apologize that I was not at the door to welcome you, the headmaster said. We were finishing up our exercise for the morning, and I saw you pop into existence. He held up a fist and flung his fingers open to demonstrate our sudden appearance. No matter, Headmistress Wake said. You're here now. Shall we proceed inside? Headmaster Ezra motioned to his students. Inform the kitchens we have guests who will require solid nourishment. Matthias and Jules, take the champion's bags and place them inside their rooms. Ensure that everyone knows that wing of the castle is off-limits. If the champion's privacy is breached, the offender will suffer time in the dungeons. My stomach tightened. The dungeons? What the hell kind of school is this? When should lunch be ready for them? Jules, the girl, asked. Three hours should be long enough. It will be served in the solarium so they might enjoy our mountain views, the headmaster replied after a moment's musing. Three hours? That seemed like an exorbitant amount of time to prepare lunch. But then again, as Eva had pointed out to me before I left, people in Night Dwellers probably didn't cook often. Take all the time you need, I thought, hoping we wouldn't get served up a bowl of blood stew or some other revolting dish. We followed Headmaster Ezra inside the castle. As soon as the thirty-foot-high doors shut behind us with a thud, a chill washed over me. While Spellcasters was dark inside from its rich wood walls and decor, Night Dwellers was unlit to the point of verging on gloomy. I glanced up and saw that the chandeliers were forged of cold silver and had the bare minimum of candles lit to provide light. The walls were pitch black, and the few portraits that eased the starkness were of disturbingly pale or ashen people. Every single one seemed to be competing for the most dour expression award. And then there was the other art. It was as if, between vampire portraits and cold black walls, the only other suitable adornment at Night Dwellers was something that Goya might have created in his darkest period. Paintings rivaling the depravity of Saturn devouring his son stared down at us, making me cringe. That's not creepy at all, Andre whispered at my side. The government allows vampires to spy for them? They don't merely allow it, my boy. They wish to employ more of us. Headmaster Ezra twisted to look at Andre, who blushed at being overheard. Something to do with our keen senses, immense strength, and incredible speed. At that, everyone fell quiet, and Headmaster Ezra began to lead us around the school. I'd expected a short tour, followed by time to rest and get acclimatized. As it turned out, however, my expectations were not met. The headmaster spent the next two hours and 45 minutes playing tour guide. He particularly seemed to delight in regaling us with the creepy history behind the decorations of Night Dwellers. Finally, lunch was pronounced ready, and Headmaster Ezra led us to a long, dark hallway. He pointed to the door at the end. That is my suite. The spellcaster students will stay in rooms sharing my hallway the evening before the games. 
The rooms are labeled and your bags are already inside. Why are we not rooming near the students we're supposed to be getting to know? Sam asked. I thought this event was for making friends with other magicals as much as friendly competition. Of course you will have time to meet them at the feast this evening, and, if you wish, I can arrange new accommodations afterwards. However, be aware that my students have a competitive streak. I would not put it past them to sabotage your chances, Headmaster Ezra commented. If you were to sleep near me, there would be less chance of such tomfoolery. Where are the Fey and Shifter champions staying? Sam asked, quickly picking up on the fact that the hall didn't have enough doors to house all the visiting champions and their chaperones. The Fey will stay one hallway down this corridor, where my most trusted staff lives. The Shifters, however... The vampire shook his head, as if he were amused. Well... Let's just say the shifters and my students have a bit of healthy rivalry. They declined to room under my protection. I suspect that after the inaugural feast this evening, much mischief will be had. Alpha Conan always had an interesting leadership style, Headmistress Wake said, clearly unimpressed by the shifter headmaster. I thank you for placing my students here. Now why don't you four go wash up for lunch? Afterward, we shall have some downtime. We all nodded, and happy for a moment alone, I slipped through the door to my room and shut it behind me. Chapter 21 Chatter and laughter rang in my ears as we approached the dining hall of Night Dwellers Academy for the first Spy Games feast, I inhaled softly to quell my rising nerves and squared my shoulders, preparing to be in the spotlight. You two ready for this? Sam slid up between Diana and me. I think so. Mentally, I ran through the last-minute etiquette tips that Headmistress Wake had given us about interacting with vampires, fey, and shifters. I didn't want to embarrass my academy. If you're at a loss, let Andre and me lead, Sam suggested. We've had more diplomatic training and experience with other creatures. My lips pulled up in a smile. Although I was sure that Sam was as nervous as the rest of us, I appreciated the offer. There had to be a leader of our little foursome, and it was nice to lean on someone else when my nerves were jangled. Done and done, I agreed. Diana nodded her agreement, too. We slowed down to let the third years pass us to walk in front. A vampire gripping a steel staff that was taller than me stood at the entrance to the dining hall. When we approached, he motioned for us to stop and bang the rod on the ground. Voices in the chamber fell to a hush, and a wave of respect rolled over me. Night dwellers totally creeped me out, but it was obviously regimented, and the students seemed to honor the headmaster and those above them. The final champions have arrived, the staff-wielding vampire announced. Please allow me to introduce the Witches of Spellcasters. He stepped aside, giving us a view of the room. I gasped. Headmaster Ezra had referred to the space where the feast would take place as the dining hall, but the name didn't do the luxurious Gothic hall justice. As with the rest of the castle, darkness prevailed, but strategic applications of light highlighted the room beautifully. Twisted metal centerpieces on every table held at least a dozen flaming red candles, Above, silver chandeliers dripped a stream of black crystals so long that they hovered only a few feet above the candle flames. The firelight made the crystals glow beautifully. Around the circular table sat high-backed black velvet chairs studded with steel. The entire room was striking and unlike anything I'd seen before. But four tables in the middle of the room, the champions' tables, stood out the most. At the far left of the line sat the vampire champions, all in suits and gowns, looking elegant and poised. As my gaze scanned the table, I locked eyes with a female champion with hair so black it appeared almost blue. Her eye contact was hard, unyielding in a way that sent shivers down my spine. Uncomfortable holding her gaze, my eyes flitted to the chalice before her. Bad choice. The glass brimmed with blood, and my stomach heaved so I had to place a hand in front of my mouth. The girl caught the gesture and smirked, and brought her goblet to her lips. 
Instead of sipping it, however, she bared her fangs and poured the red liquid on her lips. It cascaded down her front, coloring the pale skin of her décolletage crimson. Her classmates burst out laughing, and even Headmaster Ezra looked amused by the girl's antics. Aware that the raven-haired vampire wanted to intimidate me, I arched what I hoped looked like an unimpressed eyebrow and turned toward the Fae. The Fae delegates and their chaperones retained their glamour, but a strong, otherworldly energy vibrated off them. I'd felt a similar sensation before, wafting off of Ms. Seeley. Standing before five full Fae, however, made it clear that Ms. Seeley's witch side was more dominant. The shifter participants sat sandwiched between the Fae and vampires. It was impossible to tell what sort of animal they shifted into, but their amber and silver eyes glowed in the dark, hinting at their power. Our table waited on the far right, and as soon as we settled in, Headmaster Ezra stood and moved to an empty space in front of the four champion tables. Now that everyone is present, it is time to meet the champions of the first annual Spy Games. I withheld a groan. Why couldn't we eat and then do all the rah-rah crap? We'd spent the hour since our surprisingly tasty lunch in the solarium studying the magical races of our opponents and working out so that our muscles would be ready for the start of the games the next day. As a result, I was freaking starving. In this corner, for night dwellers, Headmaster Ezra swept back over to the vampire table. His exaggerated motions and obvious excitement reminded me of an announcer on a wrestling program. Are the vampires. The room roared on cue. Students pounded their fists on the tables, and a few leapt onto the tabletops and released a proud hiss. I sighed and reluctantly settled in for what was sure to be a drawn-out spectacle. When the cheering died down, Headmaster Ezra held a hand over a vampire with albino white skin and vibrant blue eyes. First up for the host academy is Francis. Francis stood and began blowing kisses and waving to the crowd, who voiced their pleasure loudly. Headmaster Ezra moved on to introduce the other three champions with equal fanfare. Magdalena was a short, Hispanic-looking girl who seemed like she'd been about my age when she was turned. Compared to the headmaster and Francis, she was meek, merely waving and smiling at the crowd as she received her applause. Anton sat next to Magdalena. He was a stack of pure muscle who might have hailed from the snowy plains of Russia. And then there was the final vampire, Simone, the girl who had poured blood down her front. When the headmaster introduced her, she jumped onto the table, raised her arms to the sky, and released a chilling vampiric hiss in the direction of her competitors. I exchanged a glance with Sam, who looked about ready to burst into laughter, and rolled my eyes. Headmaster Ezra, however, seemed delighted with Simone's theatrics. He patted first her and then Francis on the back, but ignored the other two. I took this to mean that the flashier champions were the headmaster's pets, which meant they were, most likely, the strongest of our four vampiric opponents. After the vampires were done putting on their show, Alpha Conan stood to introduce the champions for the Shifter Academy of Spies. He did so perfunctorily, requesting that his students stand and move to the space in front of the champions' tables. Only one shifter champion was female, Dasha, and it seemed to me that the three males, Heath, Howley, and Gregor, were all a touch infatuated with her. She was beautiful, with glowing golden eyes and golden tresses that grazed her booty, so I couldn't blame them. And yet, it felt like something more drew them to her than her beauty. Perhaps she possessed alpha blood? I made a note to ask her later. The Fay Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts was next. Headmistress Crystalla swept toward the front of the room, her blue silk dress fluttering behind her like butterfly wings. My students are pleased to be here, competing for the honor of our academy. The Fay Headmistress smiled, and the effect was almost blinding. Her teeth were so white. It is with great pride that I call up Ayla Torna and Sana Torna. Two female fays stood and glided to the center of the room. My eyes darted from one to the other, searching for differences I couldn't find. They had to be sisters. Probably twins. Though the Tornas hid their true fay nature beneath a glamour, it was easy to see they were not fully of this world. 
Their red locks were a little too bright, their green eyes too vibrant, and their skin glowed even more than the vampires. The girls joined their headmistress and beamed at the crowd. Something in the air shifted, and a few of the vampires sitting in the sea of tables stood up, their eyes glowing red and their mouths open to reveal extended fangs. Oh, shit. My heartbeat sped up as I remembered that the blood of magicals appealed to vampires even more than human blood, and they generally considered fey blood the most delicious. A lot of times, a fey's glamour dimmed this effect, but clearly the Torna twins were too tasty-smelling for their own good. Girls, headmistress Cristalla admonished while the vampire headmaster signaled for the affected vampires to leave. Apologies, Cristalla said. As we do not want to reveal our true nature until the first game, the girls were trying to give a mere taste of their power. However, they don't know their own strength. Oh, snap. My gaze shot to the night dweller's table. Simone and Francis were frowning. They'd caught the indirect jab, the suggestion that the Fae Champion's power could affect how vampires acted, and they didn't like it one bit. And now to introduce our male champions. Livan Iaro, and Valwyn Valar. Won't you join me? The male fae joined the females. Although their size and build brought to mind gladiators, they didn't quite hold the same aura that the girls did. I suspected that while the men might have been chosen for physical strength, the females were the ones with the magic skill. Note to self, watch out for the tornas. Once everyone had gotten a good look at the fae, the champions returned to their seats, and Headmistress Wake stood. A shiver rolled up my spine. It was our turn. Immediately, trusty mantras began rolling through my mind. I've got this. I'm here because I've proven myself capable. With enthusiasm and charm somewhere between the shifter and fey leaders, Headmistress Wake introduced us, starting with the Crucible students. She hadn't requested that we move to center stage. So Sam and Andre simply mimicked the headmistress and stood from their chairs. Diana followed suit, her face stony compared to the other two. If I hadn't been so nervous, it would have made me giggle. But then again, maybe it shouldn't. Diana was obviously trying to put up a tough front so no one would underestimate us. And finally, headmistress Wake's words snapped me back into the moment. I was next. Prematurely, I began to rise. The other grindier student participating in the spy games for spellcasters is Odette Dane. My stomach twisted as a collective gasp filled the room, and every single eye in the place shot to me. Even those at the champion's tables perked up, and a few began studying me like I was some sort of mythological creature. My face warmed at the intensity of it all. I doubted that my own reputation would garner such a reaction. Clearly, people in the crowd had heard of my parents and all their exploits. Oh, joy. Thankfully, Headmistress Wake requested that we sit quickly, which I did, and Headmaster Ezra took the reins once again. Wonderful, wonderful. The Headmaster rubbed his hands together. We are so pleased to meet all of you, and we look forward to the games starting bright and early tomorrow. For now... Let us get to know one another, as friendly competitors should. He clapped, and a deluge of servers darted into the room carrying trays weighted down with food. The headmaster threw his arms up and tossed his head back. Let the spy games feast begin. I waddled sleepily to my room after the feast, alongside the other witch champions. It had been a long three hours of small talk with other magicals, who had either been attempting to suss out our weaknesses or intimidate us. I'd met both tactics with the same response, eating more. Now my belly was so full, I regretted stuffing myself, although, truth be told, I wouldn't have been able to stop. Any fears I had about vampires not being able to cook were very misguided. All the food I'd been served at Night Dwellers was on par with Michelin-starred restaurants. Oh my god... I hope all that cake doesn't weigh me down tomorrow. Sam moaned as we reached our rooms. Same, I agreed. Why couldn't I have stopped at two slices? What time is everyone getting up tomorrow? Diana asked, ever the business-oriented witch, 
as she leaned against the door to her room expectantly. The games start at ten, so eight, I suggested. To eat and prepare? Don't even talk about eating, Sam quipped. A few minutes later, we decided we'd all wake at eight and breakfast together. Putting on a united front was important, and that would give us time to discuss last-minute strategy. We said our good nights, and I locked myself in my room, put on my PJs, and brushed my teeth. I was about to wash my face and crash when a knock came on the door. Turning off the tap, I went to check who it was and found no one was there. A moment later, Sam poked her head out of her room, then Andre, and lastly Diana. Everyone looked as confused as I felt. Did someone knock on your doors too? I asked. They all nodded, and then Sam gasped. Look, under the rug. She pointed to her feet. I glanced down, and my lips parted in surprise. Tucked beneath the hallway runner, almost out of sight, was an envelope bearing my name. Chapter 22 I don't think this is a good idea, Diana said as we tiptoed through the halls of Night Dwellers Academy. What if it's a trap? Or what if it's a party, like the invitation said, Sam retorted. I wasn't sure what to think. Diana could be right, but then again, the vampire champions might actually have invited us to a party. All I knew is that it would look chicken shit not to go. I hear voices up ahead, Andre said. I tilted my head. I heard them too. When we reached the tea in the hallway, we discovered that the voices belonged to the Fae champions. They'd obviously received the invite too, and even more apparent was the fact that they were walking the wrong way. Hey, guys! Sam waved her arms as if the Fae weren't 20 feet away. The champions spun around, and the twins beamed. Did you guys get invited to a party too? One twin asked as their group jogged over to meet us. I nodded, and upon taking in her outfit, I wished that I'd brought something cuter to wear. The sisters were decked out in short navy dresses and tall brown boots that hit mid-thigh. They looked hot as hell, and even though I'd felt confident in my shiny black leggings and tight-cut sweater before, now I felt frumpy. I'm surprised that you guys are going, Diana commented. Didn't those vamps want a taste of you earlier? Levon, the larger male, stepped forward and grunted, but a twin pulled him back. She didn't mean it that way, Levon, she said, her tone smoky. Sorry, he's protective. And don't worry about our fey essence. Our headmistress helps strengthen our glamour, so we shouldn't affect even the most sensitive vamps anymore. Huh, that was interesting. I hadn't known that a fae could manipulate another fae's glamours, but I suppose that made sense. Only ether-blessed fae could create glamours, and they were rare. Judging by the stunned looks on my team's faces, I hadn't been alone in my ignorance. There was an awkward silence, which the smoky-voiced twin broke. Since you probably can't remember which one of us is which, I'm Ayla. You can tell by the gold jewelry. She lifted her arm to reveal a stack of gold bangles and pointed to a gold necklace around her neck. Santa is wearing silver. That way, people who meet us can remember. Santa gestured to the guys. They're easy to remember. The dark-haired one is Levon, and Valwyn is the blonde with the beard. Both guys look tense, not at all as if they wished to be going to a party. Um, hi, I said and Valwyn scowled. Santa batted his shoulder. Seriously, stop it. They're trying to be nice. You can chill on the guard duty. Guard duty? My eyebrows pulled together. They had introduced the guides as champions, not guards, and why would Santa and Ayla need guards anyway? Santa looked like she wished she hadn't said anything, but Ayla waved her hand dismissively. It was bound to get out anyway, sister. She focused her attention on us. Santa and I are of the Riverlands' royal line, so we travel with a guard. I gaped. They were royalty? Why were they here and not in fairy? Ayla rushed to explain. Not like real royals, 
I'm sixth in line for the crown, and Santa is seventh. Even if all of our relatives died off, it's unlikely that the Riverlands court would crown one of us, as we've only been to fairy once. But our parents don't see the difference. She rolled her eyes. They're so protective. They wouldn't let us attend spy school without escorts. We're hoping that if we do well in the spy games, they'll loosen the reins a bit. Or at least stop commenting that we should leave the school because it's too dangerous, Santa said. Oh my god, it's like they're me from last year. When no one said anything, Santa bit the inside of her cheek. It might sound dumb to you guys, but... No, I blurted. It doesn't. I can relate. I smiled, and she beamed back. Why don't we all walk to the party together and you can tell us about your situation? The twins moved to either side of me, and their guards winged them. As we walked, I learned about the twins and a bit about the Fey Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts. There were many similarities to spellcasters, but many differences too. Like how in their final year, the Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts expected the Fey to spend a month at court in Fairy. When we reached the Dark Tower, where the party was being held, I was disappointed to have arrived so quickly. I really wanted to find a quiet spot and keep chatting with the twins, but showing our faces was what we'd come to do. So instead of asking the twins to hang out with me in the corridor, I followed the group into the party. Unsurprisingly, the tower was dark, although the strobe lights that pulsed from every nook and cranny alleviated that effect somewhat. Music blared, but even so, most of the people in the tower had very sensitive hearing. They turned to study us as soon as we walked in. Excellent. The Witch and Fae champions have arrived. Francis, the albino vampire champion, swept over to meet us, somehow not spilling a drop of blood from his shallow cocktail glass as he moved. We worried that the Fae wouldn't show due to the New Blood's revolting manners earlier. My mouth fell open. New Bloods? I croaked. New Blood vampires were freshly turned and possessed terrible impulse control. It took months just for them to stifle the urge to jump on someone and drain them dry. Why would Night Dwellers allow them at the Academy? Not real New Bloods. Magdalena, the Hispanic champion, joined Francis. It's just what we call first years here. A wave of relief washed over me, and apparently it was obvious because both vampires chuckled. Not wanting my opponents to think me nervous and naive, I straightened my spine. So what's the party for? Francis smiled a sly smile. If it were up to our headmasters and headmistresses, we'd only interact at proper dinners and the games. But we wanted to have a little fun and get to know everyone in a lighter manner. That's half the reason for the games, right? Magdalena supplied. We'll all be working for the PIA one day. It would be nice to see familiar faces when we get there. At Magdalena's reassurances, my shoulders relaxed. Although they were both my competitors, I trusted her way more than flashy Francis. Great point, Sam said and cast a glance around. So where are the drinks? Francis wrapped his arm around her shoulders, and shockingly, Sam didn't balk at the attention. He then proceeded to lead our group to a bar on the far side of the circular tower. On the bar top, all the usual drinks stared back at me, and since we were at a vampire school, bottles of dark red blood were present too. In fact, the bartender had placed them front and center, which I found a little strange. That is, until a vampire approached and gave Diana a hearty sniff as he reached for a bottle. I shot Francis an accusatory glance. He held up both hands. I swear he's not a true new blood. The swine merely has poor manners. They don't even allow new bloods into night dwellers. You have to have been a vampire for a decade to apply. I pursed my lips. Good to know. We ordered drinks, and I began making a loop around the tower. Almost right away, I found the shifter champions. They were huddled near the fireplace, nursing beers, and looking as if they were ready to bolt. I steered that way, curious about the group and intent on getting some answers. Hey, crazy party, huh? I said as I approached them. It's like a gothic rave in here. I gestured to the wider room with my soda and lime. Dasha, the female, grinned at me. It's interesting, not quite my taste. Still, I figured it would be worth it to check out the competition. But you're all alone, 
I teased. The burliest male grunted. Finally. Dasha rolled her eyes and ran her hands through the man's long red hair. Please excuse, Gregor. We just broke away from Simone. She claimed that she needed to go nourish herself. She was quite intense, and the guys don't like people trying to dominate me. I tilted my head. Can I ask what might be a dumb question about shifters? We're here to learn about each other, aren't we? One of the males held out his hand. He wore glasses and had a slender, muscular frame beneath his tight black t-shirt. He wouldn't have looked out of place in a tech company. I'm Hallie, by the way. If I recall, you're a Dane? I nodded, but not wanting to get caught in my family history before I figured out the dynamic, I caught Dash's eye and blurted out my question. Are you an Alpha? I sent something between you four, but I can't place it, probably because I haven't been around a lot of shifters, and those I have been around were unusual. Memories of Colorado flooded my mind, and unable to stop myself, I cringed. Dasha's eyes widened, catching the gesture. To answer your question, yes, I'm Alpha Blood, but that's probably not what you sense. Slowly, she moved to stand between the guys, and their attention followed. She caressed Howley's arm and batted her eyelashes at the one who hadn't spoken yet, Heath. I'm not technically an Alpha yet. I won't be until my mom dies. In the meantime, I wanted to spy for my country. But the magic in my blood is already working to make sure my reign is powerful. It's chosen a mate for me. Actually, three. I gulped. Holy crap. I'd heard of fated mates among shifters, but never of anyone having more than one. My gaze swept Howley, Heath, and Gregor. All three were super hot and clearly infatuated with Dasha. As long as they didn't tear each other to bits, she was one lucky lady. It's unusual, Dasha admitted. But then, you're unique too, aren't you, Dane? She sat in the armchair in front of the hearth and patted the one next to her. I've heard about your parents, but most recently, word of your latest mission reached our academy. I joined her by the fire. How? Dasha's lips curled up in a smile. Leslie is now enrolled full-time at the Shifter Academy of Spies. She had a lot of valuable information on the Crescent Springs pack. The PIA asked how they could reward her for divulging it. She chose a career in espionage. I'm mentoring her. I didn't realize that. Good for her. I hope she's doing well. She is. I bet once I tell her we met, she'll be excited to see you when we host the games. A smile broke on my face. Tell her I'm looking forward to seeing her again. I... The music cut and the sound of cymbals crashed through the room. I sat up in my armchair. What the hell? Oh, for shit's sake, Gregor muttered. She's back. I twisted to face the room, and my eyes went straight to Simone, sitting in a chair raised up over the crowd by four other vampires, like she was a queen. Quiet, quiet, peons. Champions of the spy games, may I have your attention. It is time for the festivities to truly begin. I rolled my eyes. This girl is seriously into herself. If my fellow champions will join me at the bar, we at Night Dwellers will have a special treat for you, a hosting surprise that you've surely never experienced before. Simone's perfect red lips formed a dazzling smile. I glanced at the shifters. They looked as resigned to the situation as I felt, and also like they were having a mental conversation. We should go. We're trying to make friends, not enemies, Howley said out loud, probably for my benefit. A low growl emanated from Gregor, lifting the hair on the back of my neck. He's right, Gregor, Dasha said with a sigh. The future alpha stood. You coming, Dane? I noticed that Diana, Sam, and Andre were making their way to the bar. The Torna sisters and their guards were already there. Guess so. Wouldn't want to be the odd one out and put a target on my back. It would be a poor strategy to begin the spy games with, Dasha agreed. We approached the bar. All around us, vampires watched Simone, eager to see what she had in store. Thank you for joining us at our prestigious academy. Simone leapt gracefully from her throne to the floor and sashayed toward the other champions. As most of you know, vampires are creatures who honor tradition. She extended her hand toward the bar top and with long, slender fingers, plucked a bottle out of the offerings. Did you know that in Victorian times, vampires ruled most of London? The Torna sisters frowned, 
and Simone, having caught the expression, chuckled. Other magicals had their say, but humans especially love vampires. She took the bottle. And this little drink was partially to blame. Francis, the showboater, slung his arm around Simone's shoulder. She snuggled into him, and I realized that the pair weren't just champions and headmaster's pets. They were an item. This bottled delight is creme de violette. Victorians were obsessed with violets, and as you can tell, its dark color resembles blood. The taste is potent, much more so than wine. It can cover up many sins and even a bit of blood poured into a glass. This allowed vampires to take part in society like they never had before, and our kind took advantage of it. Simone tossed the bottle in the air and caught it with the opposite hand. This brand of creme de violette was the favorite of Queen Victoria herself, a treat worthy of royalty or champions. It's basically impossible to find in the modern world, she arched her eyebrows. Tonight, we'd like to share it with you, fellow champions. My shoulders loosened. Shots? They want to take shots? A trill of laughter flew from my lips. Shots weren't really my thing, but if it meant tossing one back for camaraderie's sake, I would do it. Well, what are you waiting for? Andre spoke up first. Pour the damn shots. The bartender obliged. All champions toasted one another, and on three, we slung back the drink. I was surprised by the taste. Obviously, it was floral. It was also a little medicinal, and way more appealing than I thought it would be. I could see how blood could hide within the drink and allow for vampires to move through society without attracting attention. Another. Anton exclaimed. Magdalena giggled and motioned for the bartender to pour everyone one more. The second one went down just as smoothly, and I sighed as creme de violette flowed through my body, warming me and erasing my anxiety. A cloying laugh hit my ear. I twisted to see Dasha pressing her lips to Gregor and then turning to kiss Heath. Jealousy that Alex couldn't be here and then worry over his mission filled me. My party vibe plunged and I set down my shot glass. Not wanting to be a total downer, I stepped away from the bar. Right away, Diana was at my side. Are you trying to make a graceful exit, too? She asked. I hadn't been, but now that she mentioned it, I did want to leave. After all, the games would start tomorrow, and I wanted to be well-rested. I shrugged. Yeah, let's get out of here. Although a few people protested that we were being party poopers, Diana and I left the Dark Tower together to prepare for the start of the spy games the following day. Chapter 23 The moment my alarm woke me in the next morning, I knew something was wrong. My stomach rolled, and nausea swept through me like a wave. Moaning, I grabbed my gut and sat up slowly. Despite my precautions, the world spun from the pain. I blinked, unable to see straight. Am I sick? After a brief self-assessment, I realized that only my stomach hurt. The rest of me felt completely fine. I shook my head, unable to understand. Diana and I had left the party before 10. I'd had two shots and drank water when I got back to my room. I'd felt good then, too. Tired and lightly buzzed, but not drunk. My eyes popped open wide. Did the vampires roofie that drink? Taking care to stand, I left my room to find Diana. When she opened the door, the sweat that glistened on her face told me I wasn't the only one feeling ill. Is your stomach killing you? Diana nodded. Those bastards! I clenched my fists. I think the vamps drugged us. Diana's blue eyes grew as large as saucers. Oh my god, I think you're right. I thought Simone was way too happy when the Fae took another shot. My jaw tightened. All I know is that neither of us should feel this sick with how little we drank. And I chugged some water before I went to bed. I'm sure you did too, right? Diana seemed to be the type who would avoid dehydration, which could cost her the edge in whatever she was doing. Absolutely. Hydration is key for any physical competition she said, confirming my beliefs. And since we're going up against vamps, I figure that a physical challenge is the most likely scenario. I groaned. She was right. 
and at the moment, any sort of physical activity sounded horrible. Then a terrible thought struck me, sinking my aching gut. We need to wake up Sam and Andre, I said. They stayed behind. What if they... As if he knew I was talking about him, Andre's door opened, and he stuck his head out to vomit on the hallway runner. Shit, Diana screamed as Andre continued to cough and sputter. I'm going to go check on Sam. My fury at the vampire champion somehow dulled my pain, and I raced to Sam's room. I knocked, and when she didn't answer, I knocked again. The minutes ticked by and still nothing, so I threw courtesy to the wind and opened the door. My eyes just about bugged out of my head when I saw Sam lying face down with a pillow over her head, still in the clothes she'd worn last night. Sam, we have to debrief. The game starts soon. A muffled groan came from beneath the pillow. I bit my lip. You feel like shit, don't you? Another groan, this one even more pathetic, met my ears. Crap, crap, crap. We so did not have time for this. I needed to do all that I could to get my team feeling better fast. I pulled the pillow off Sam and flipped her over. Her face was red and swollen, and there were huge bags under her eyes. But at least she hadn't been laying in a pool of her own vomit. Get up. I rushed to the adjoining bathroom and filled a glass with water. Drink this. Sam brought her hand to her mouth, her gaze tentative. You have to flush whatever poison the vampires gave us out of your system. Water will help. With trembling hands, Sam took the glass and sipped. I gave her an encouraging nod, and she sipped again. As Sam drank, I was filled with hope that she could turn her condition around. I encouraged her, and she managed to finish half the glass. My tension had just started to dissipate when suddenly she lurched forward and threw up, barely missing my sock-clad feet. I swore under my breath and fetched another glass of water. Miraculously, Diana and I patched up our teammates well enough that they could walk to breakfast on their own. The only thing they could stomach was water, and they occasionally broke out in sweat from just looking at the food. But I told myself that was good. It meant they were sweating out the toxins. I was thankful that the vampire champions were notably absent, and that Headmistress Wake sat at a table with the other heads of school. It gave us time to regroup in peace. When, at the end of the meal, the headmistress approached us and motioned for us to join her in the hall, we put on our bravest faces and followed. I've gathered information that the first challenge will be held outside, Headmistress Wake said in a low voice. We must make sure you are properly attired. Go to your rooms and put on warm clothes, then meet at the front door. I was still considering the possible scenarios for outdoor events when we rejoined Headmistress Wake at the door to Night Dwellers. All the other champions were already there, but my gaze latched onto Simone, Anton, Francis, and Magdalena. I gritted my teeth. My fingers itched to strangle the cheating little shits. So much for interschool relationship building. Rise and shine, witches, Simone chirped. How are you feeling this morning? My fists clenched, and I prayed to the universe that Sam and Andre wouldn't vomit again. At least if they did it during the event, we could claim it was from exertion. Here, it would be too obvious that the vamp's plan had worked. We're doing well. How about you? Diana played it cool as ice. I hope nothing befell your health last night. Simone arched an eyebrow and her gaze roved over us. She paused longest on Andre and Sam, who puffed up their chests and beamed as if they weren't dying inside. Simone seemed to deflate a little. Done with the vampire shit for the moment, my attention moved to the shifters and Faye. Both looked healthy. My eyebrows furrowed. Shifters have high metabolisms, Sam whispered. They probably quickly burned through whatever poison we drank, plus, they stopped drinking after those two shots and left ten minutes after you and Diana. And the Fay? I asked. I don't get why the girls aren't falling over. They took at least two more shots than me, and they're teeny tiny. I think the guys only took the first one because of guard duty. Before I could respond, Headmaster Ezra swept down a staircase and clapped his hands. Good morning, champions. Today is the big day. He made a show of cupping his ear and gestured to the door. It seems that others are as excited about the start of the first spy games as we are. 
I realized that there was a low humming noise, the drone of voices coming from outside the main door. Probably half of Night Dwellers was waiting out there, and I'd been too busy being pissed at Simone to notice. That wasn't a good sign. Get your head in the game, Dane. I straightened my shoulders and tilted my chin up. Even if I felt like shit and was worried about my team, I didn't need to look like it. Today's event will take place outside, Headmaster Ezra beamed. Why don't I lead the way and reveal what it is? Everyone nodded, and the vampire headmaster practically skipped to the front door. He was clearly having such a great time that it was kind of cute. It almost made me forget my aching stomach. Almost. We gathered behind the headmaster, and he opened the massive castle doors with a flourish. Thank God. I thought I would die from the stench of vomit, someone whispered. I twisted my neck to see Simone smirking knowingly at me. A snide retort was on the tip of my tongue, but the crowd outside began to cheer, and a cold wind swept over me. Stealing the words from my mouth, I looked outside, and my heart dropped. It had snowed overnight, and at least a foot of the white stuff covered the ground. I'd been so busy that morning trying to get myself and my team in order that I hadn't even noticed. Snow? In September? What the hell? Whatever we were about to do, I was sure the snow would only make it more difficult. Someone had cleared a path leading to where a red ribbon had been strung between two metal poles. We followed the path, and when we reached our destination, the sound of humming generators filled my ears. Two large screen televisions played footage of a tranquil mountain scene on either side of the metal poles. The event is an obstacle course. Headmaster Ezra pointed to the red ribbon. The course will begin and end here. And there are markers along the way to keep us on track? Andre asked as he glanced at the snow. His voice was raspy and he sounded exhausted. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Simone and Francis smirk. So help me, I would punch them both in their faces. There are red flags to guide your way and another positioned at each obstacle. Those at the obstacle should be plain, just as the obstacles themselves will be. The headmaster's arms swept up the mountain. My gaze followed the motion, and once I caught sight of what he was referring to, my mouth dropped open. About halfway up the tall mountainside stood a pole with a massive red flag. Next to the flag were four towering trapeze apparatuses that made my heart skip a few beats. The headmaster continued to point to the right, and against my better judgment, I followed with my eyes. My heart sank to my knees. Miles and miles of snow-covered mountainsides spanned the space between each obstacle. We were at such a disadvantage. Hell, even if half my team wasn't sick, that would be the case. Vampires and shifters were both super fast. The Fae were still glamoured, but I thought it was likely that at least one of them had wings. Rules are as follows. Headmaster Ezra clapped to ensure the crowd's attention. Everyone on your team must complete each obstacle. Impartial representatives from each magical race are present at the obstacles to ensure that no one skips a step. They have been instructed to remain invisible, so just because you don't see them, do not assume they are not there. A sly smile crossed the vampire's face. First place gets ten points, and every team after gets two fewer. That scoring will be standard throughout the tournament. Understood? I nodded because my throat was too dry to speak. Splendid. Now if the champions would line up behind the red ribbon, we'll begin on my mark. Chapter 24 The starting pistol went off, and the Night Dwellers champion shot out of the gate, their legs moving so fast that they seemed to hover above the snow. Within seconds, they disappeared into the trees. Just behind the vamps, the shifters transformed. My mouth dropped open when they revealed their animal aspect for the first time. White wolves. Of course they would be wolves acclimated to snow. I grunted as the wolves entered the forest while my team ran laboriously through the powder. The fae remained only slightly ahead of us. But the moment their glamours began to fade, I knew we were in for trouble. My fists clenched as Luvan and Valwyn sprouted wings, grabbed Ayla and Sana, and soared after the shifters and vamps. Damn it, Diana swore. I knew how she felt. 
We hadn't even gone 100 yards, and already Andre had fallen, and Sam clutched her stomach like she would die at any second. Oh my god, what if we don't even finish the first challenge? This can't be happening. Diana shook her head as she helped Andre haul himself up. Why would they even bother poisoning us? It's obvious we're at a disadvantage. I huffed out a breath of air. Yeah, it's not like we have super strength or super speed or wings. All we have is... My mouth snapped shut, and I whirled to face my team. Warping. We have warping. Diana's eyes grew round. Can you do it even though you haven't seen the obstacles yet? It will be hard, but being able to see those flags should help. I won't have enough juice to get us through all the obstacles and back to the finish, though. My eyes shifted to Andre, whose dark brown skin had taken on an off-putting gray tone. He looked awful. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't ask him to expend his energy, but he was the only one who could help. If you waited until the very end and saved your strength, do you think you can get us from the third obstacle to the finish line? Andre looked doubtful, and I didn't blame him. Besides being sick, he'd only created two whirlpools in the few lessons that we'd had so far. You can do it, I encouraged, because he looked like he needed it. I'll talk you through it. And if I have any energy left over, I'll help. We might be able to morph our energies together. Alex and I had used our totems to create a whirlpool once. Andre didn't have a totem that connected to mine, but it might still work. I'll try my best, he said, and shot Diana a look. I might need help getting through the obstacles, though. You know, to save my energy for warping. His dusky cheeks grew red at the admission. I felt a little bad for the guy. Diana was a formidable woman, and to have to admit he needed her help in physical challenges when he was supposed to be the stronger, older guy, well, it would suck. To Diana's credit, however... She merely placed Andre's arm on her shoulder. I'm here for you, she said. I have a bit of experience helping people through trials, just like Odette here. Diana gave me a small smile. Not wanting to waste any more time, I thrust my hands out and called on the energies all around me. Then it looks like I should get a warp hole started. It took two tries, but I got us to the first obstacle, when I looked down the mountainside, I was astonished to see how far we'd come. The Night Dweller students standing at the starting line looked like insects. When we arrived, the shifters and vampires were already flying through the air on their academy-specific trapeze apparatuses. Unsurprisingly, the vampire champions were almost done with the obstacle, and yet, seeing the outraged looks on Simone's and Francis's faces when we popped into existence made their clear lead less annoying. Plus, now that we had a plan, I was sure that if we could complete the obstacles within a decent time frame, we wouldn't come in last. After all, we hadn't regularly experienced the hell of physical conditioning since our first week at Spellcasters for nothing. I sucked in a breath to amp myself up. We were strong. Even if half of us were severely poisoned, we could do this. I looped my arm through Sam's and helped her shuffle to the trapeze station designated for our school. I'll climb first. Diana, you're good at levitation spells, right? She nodded. Then you go last and levitate Sam and Andre if they need help. I'll assist from the top. Sounds good. The climb was hard and taxing, which made me worry about Sam and Andre. But when I got to the top, I saw that Sam was already halfway up the ladder. She grimaced with every rung she conquered, and she looked super sweaty, even from where I stood. But the determination etched on her face gave me hope. Since she was still a ways away, I scanned the area. A camera was positioned on our platform, and judging by the blinking red light on the other platform, the end one, too. The televisions down by the starting line sprang to mind, and I realized that the students were all watching us, and would be the whole time. Wonderful. I thought, my gaze trailing down the line of trapeze apparatuses. The vampire champions were long gone, and the fae, who had arrived just after us, were already finishing up the task. As it turned out, trapeze was cake when you had wings. The shifters, however, were a different story. Although they were athletic-looking in their human aspects, both Howley and Heath had already fallen into the safety net below. Only Dasha had made it across. She was now trying hard to coax Gregor off the ledge so she could swing out and get him. 
Even from a distance of 30 feet away, I could see Gregor tremble. I felt bad for the guy, but also a little bolstered by his reluctance to make the leap. It gave us a fighting chance in the competition. In the time it took for my team to make it up to the top of the platform, I watched both Howley and Heath swing across the expanse once more. Heath succeeded, but Howley fell again. Now that I'd seen an example of the right and wrong techniques, I had a plan. Unfortunately, warping is no good here. The bar moves too fast for accuracy. But what do you guys think about a magnetism or sticking spell? Although I didn't know how to do those spells, I hoped that the Crucibles would have learned something along those lines. Genius, Sam said, and her tired eyes brightened a bit. I can do that. Let's try the sticking one first. I held up my hands, and Sam cast the first spell on them and the bar. When I wrapped my fingers around the bar, my grip felt strong, like I could hold on for a really long time and not slip. A smile broke on my face. Perfect. I'll cross first. If I give you the thumbs up, that means the solution worked well, and you should enchant the other's hands, too. You got it, Sam said. I turned and faced the vast expanse between platforms. My hands stuck to the bar, but that didn't stop my anxiety from rising. There was a shitload of open air below me. I wasn't sure of the exact distance that we had to swing, but the second platform was really far away. Even with the safety net, the idea of falling terrified me. But I didn't have a choice. We had to move. Taking a massive breath, I stepped off the platform. Cold air whistled in my ears, and my stomach dropped to my knees as I plummeted down. Suddenly, the line pulled tight, and with a terrifying snap, I swung forward. Although I wanted to close my eyes, I kept them wide open. The bar on the other side was clearly magically enchanted, because it soared toward me at the same pace that I was approaching it. I just needed to grab it in midair. My stomach twisted as the bar came closer. I hoped that spelling my hands to be sticky wouldn't work against me. I hoped that I could continue to hold on with one hand as I reached for the other. I hoped I was dexterous enough for the transition. I hoped... Nope. The bar was almost to me. I was all out of hopes. With trembling arms, I released one hand off the bar. To my surprise, the stickiness of Sam's spell was a little difficult to overcome, but not really that bad. I'd have to ask Sam exactly how it worked later. My heart thundered as my fingers stretched. Suddenly, they hit something hard. The bar. And I clung to it. Oh, crap. I squealed, caught between two bars and carrying a crapload of momentum, my body twisted wildly. Instinctively, I let go of the first bar to grip the second for dear life. Cheering rose from behind me, but I didn't dare twist my neck around. The second platform was approaching fast, and there was no way in hell I would miss my landing. When my feet hit the platform with a thunk, I let out a massive sigh of relief and released the bar. Amazingly, it stilled, waiting in midair for the next champion to traverse the expanse. Now that I wasn't moving, the deluge of sweat running down my spine became apparent. Thank the universe that's over. I twisted to face the spellcaster's starting platform and gave my team a thumbs up so they knew it was safe to proceed. Nice work, a voice called. From one platform over, I saw Dasha waving at me. Back at the starting line, I'd been a little annoyed at the shifters and Faye, thinking maybe they'd known what the vampires had done, but Dasha's genuine smile said otherwise. Thanks. I helped the others make it too. I called back. Yeah, same, if Gregor would ever freaking jump, that is. I turned to face the starting platform and saw that she was right. Howley was on his third swing, but Gregor remained planted on the platform. Andre leapt next. The bar next to me swung into action the moment his feet left the platform. It should have been beautiful, the way the bars soared toward each other at the same speed, but Andre kind of ruined it by barfing his guts out a quarter of the way across. Keep it together! I screamed. My eyes glued to him as he flew closer and closer. He was almost to the middle, and I wanted to close my eyes so as not to witness the tragedy of Andre missing the bar. And then, to my everlasting glee, he released the first bar before I ever would have had the guts to, and flew toward the other bar like a legit acrobat. There was a whack when his hands met the wood, and unable to help myself, I let out a whoop. Hell yeah, baby, Diana screamed. 
Andre flew toward me, and I reached out to grab him. Thanks, Odette. He managed to mumble before hurling his guts out over the side of the platform. Vomiting aside, this trial was turning out better than I could have imagined. We were keeping up with the shifters. When Sam stepped off the platform, my hopes had already started to rise, which was why it crushed me hard when Sam missed her transfer. No! I whisper screamed. To make matters worse, Howley had finally gotten the timing right and landed on the final platform. The shifters yelped and jumped with glee as my stomach sank. Sam swung back to the first platform, and Diana caught her. The third year appeared to be swaying violently, and I realized that while she wasn't puking, Sam was as bad off as Andre. I needed to help her, or she'd never make it. At my side, the trapeze bar hovered, waiting for Sam to leap again. Following my instinct, I placed a hand on it. Diana, Sam, I waved to get their attention. The ladies had been discussing something, but their necks twisted at the sound of my voice. I'll meet her in the middle. Sam gave me a thumbs up. It was go time. Once again, when Sam leapt off the other platform, the bar hovering on mine soared toward the middle. The only difference was that this time, I clung to it. Let go on my call, I screamed as Sam and I flew toward one another. Got it, she yelled back. Closer and closer we came until only a few feet separated us. Release! I screamed. Sam complied and she barreled toward me, arms outstretched. Serving caution to the wind, I unlatched one hand and reached for her. Her fingers grazed mine and I closed my hand. And we missed. Sam plummeted and reflexively, I kicked my leg out at her. Grab on! Ugh, she grunted as my legs smacked her in the face and torso. But I'll be damned if she didn't latch on like a baby monkey. Correction, a desperate baby monkey. Her nails dug deeply into my skin as she tried to climb my leg. I winced and grabbed for any part of her to hold on to. Unfortunately for Sam, the first thing I grabbed was her hair. She released a yelp of pain as we soared backward toward the second platform. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I chanted, as if it was one of my tried-and-true mantras. She held steady, and when we reached the other platform, Andre caught us. That was so amazing, he said as soon as we were stable. Quick thinking, Odette. Thanks. I said, glad I'd taken the risk even though my legs ached. Sam said nothing, merely crawled over to the edge of the platform and vomited. Andre watched her, pity in his eyes. It sucks, but I think it's better she gets it out of her system. I've puked four times now, and I actually feel a lot better. I think I can rally for the rest of this course. Examining his face, I noticed that he was no longer sweating, and his cheeks seemed to have a healthier glow. Maybe he was right, and Sam needed to purge. I didn't have time to dwell on the idea, though, because a few seconds later, Diana joined us on the final platform. Let's get moving. She gestured to the ladder. Hold on. I held out a hand to stop her. I can see the second flag, so I'm going to warp us from up here to save some time. Excellent idea, Diana said. Everyone stand behind me, I ordered. They complied, and I focused on the flag and pushed my magic out. A war pole appeared in front of us, and throwing up a prayer that it would lead us directly to the second obstacle, I led the way through. Hot air, then cold, enveloped me. No longer did I find the contrast striking. It was simply a part of making a warp hole. When I stepped out of the warp hole, frigid, thin mountain air caressed my arms. I shuddered as I took in my surroundings. My mouth fell open with relief. By some miracle of the universe, we'd exited only about 20 feet from the flagpole. I can't believe it. I shouted and began jumping up and down. My team piled out after me, and Diana was so pumped that she actually wrapped her arms around me. Thank God you're on this team. We'd be so screwed otherwise. I blinked. Having her like me was still so odd, but it was way better than the alternative, so I rolled with it. Let's figure out this next challenge. We approached the flagpole, which was pressed up against the side of a cliff. Four holes barely large enough for a person to fit through dotted the mountainside, 
each with a little sign over it indicating which species should enter which tunnel. I moved closer to the hole bearing the sign of a witch and peered inside. It was black as night. My skin began to crawl as flashbacks of walking through the underground of Portland hit me hard. Well, shit, this sucks. We have to go in there? Sam croaked. It appears so, Diana sighed. I can go first this time, if you want, Odette. I cast a good illumination spell. I'll spread it on the walls, too, so everyone else can see. Sounded fan-freaking-tastic to me. My nerves already tingled at the idea of army crawling through a dark tunnel, and visions of demons were popping up left and right in my brain. I was in no position to lead this time. I nodded, and Diana wasted no time climbing in the hole and disappearing into the mountainside. Chapter 25 I wasn't sure how far I army crawled into the tunnel before my breathing became labored and I started shaking with fear, but it definitely didn't seem far enough. Instead of giving in to the sense of the walls closing in around me, I tried to zero in on Sam's feet jostling and kicking in front of me as we progressed. With each inch, the jagged rock we squeezed through soaked my clothing a little more, leaving me cold and wet. The ceiling mirrored the ground, dripping cold water onto my backside. With each tiny drip, terrifying visions of the mountain collapsing on us ran through my mind. I shuddered. You'll get through this. You're strong enough. You're brave. I chanted a few mantras, although they didn't have the effect that they usually did. What was worse, the appearance of multiple tiny red dots in the tunnel, the recording lights of cameras, assured me that hundreds of people were watching me break down, this was a shitty time to discover that I had a fear of caves. Somewhere up ahead, a rock fell. I screeched and tensed. It was just a pebble, Sam called back. But I was already too far gone down the rabbit hole. My eyes were squeezed shut and my body trembled. Strange sounds were coming out of my mouth, reminding me of a caged animal. I couldn't move another inch. If I don't make it out of here... Oh my god, I need to stop thinking that. We'll fail, we'll... Hey, I found a cavern. Diana's voice echoed down the tunnel. My eyes popped open wide, and for a moment, my trembling ceased. A cavern was still a cave, but at least it was bigger. The train of witches in front of me sped up noticeably, and somehow, I found the strength to follow. Thank the universe we're out of there. I breathed my first full inhalation in what felt like forever as I emerged from the tunnel after Sam, who had her eyes closed and was taking long, slow breaths. Agreed. Andre rubbed his arms with his hands, presumably to stop them from shaking. Diana was the only one who didn't seem phased. In fact, she was already walking around the cave, examining it and looking for how to proceed. Aware that the sooner we found the exit, the sooner we'd be out of there, I turned to explore in the opposite direction. Right away, I noticed that the four holes designated for the magicals to enter had all exited next to each other. Noises came from one, the tunnel I thought belonged to the Fae. I leaned close to it, cupping my hand around my ear. I'm stuck. A gruff voice. Levon's grunted. I'll help push you, Ayla said, her smoky tone worried. Why not just use earth magic and clear the way? Another male voice, Valwins asked. No. Santa cried out. We need to try every possible avenue before trying earth magic. I can't guarantee that it won't collapse our tunnel or the others. It's a last resort only. My eyes popped open wide. Diana, the Fae are considering using earth magic. We need to get out of here. So stop standing around and look for an exit on that side, Diana said right before disappearing behind a rock that jutted up out of the ground. She'd been out of sight only ten seconds when a blood-curdling scream cut through the cavern. My heart rate spiked. I rushed to her aid and turned the corner just in time to see Diana fall to the ground and the ghost-white visage of Francis zoom away. Hey! I chased after him but he was a vampire with super speed who darted to the side of the cave and vanished. I approached where he'd disappeared and sighed. 
It was yet another godforsaken tiny tunnel. Pissed, I slammed my fist into the rock. You won't get away with this. An evil laugh echoed back at me. Odette, Diana wheezed. Help. I whirled around and ran to her. Andre, Sam, get over here. When I reached her side, I dropped to my knees. What did he do to you? Diana's hand covered her arm, and when she pulled it aside, a cut glistened up at me. It was small, but pulsed and oozed a white, foamy substance. Where the foam touched her skin was slightly swollen. I reared back, disgusted by how alien the wound looked. What the hell? Diana shook her head. I thought I heard something and still came over here alone. How stupid of me. My hand landed on her shoulder. This is not your fault. That asshole attacked you. If anyone is to blame, it's him. Our friends appeared, and Andre pulled Diana into his arms. Diana released a long breath. <sighs> All I know is that we need to move. I'm almost positive that the blade he cut me with was dipped in a turjo potion. Oh, shit, Sam whispered. Yeah, oh, shit is right, Diana agreed, especially considering where we are. If I don't get an antidote in an hour or so, my whole body will swell. I won't be able to fit through any exit holes if they're the same diameter as the entrance ones. I didn't question how she identified the potion. Diana excelled in potions and poisons and had independent study with Professor Bain, who taught the subject at Spellcasters. We have to get going then, I said, all too aware that now three-fourths of my team was injured or ill. Can you crawl? I'll try my damnedest, Diana replied. I saw Francis escape out of an exit hole. It's right over here. I pointed where I'd seen the vamp dive into the rock wall just as a scream emanated from one of the entrance tunnels. Someone was in trouble. My stomach clenched. I liked the other teams, but this was a competition. Plus, if we didn't get Diana out of here fast, who knew what would become of her? I shivered, and not just from the persistent chill. Let's go, I said, making a choice. Before anyone else catches up and clogs up the hole, I'll lead. Andre pulled Diana to her feet and helped her to the exit. I bent down, murmured an illumination spell, and peered inside. My insides chilled. Sweet holy universe, is this my imagination, or is this tunnel even tinier and darker than the first? Another sound came from the opposite side of the cavern, and I gulped. Even if this was the smallest and blackest tunnel in existence, we didn't have a choice. This was the way out. It had to be, or else Francis wouldn't have taken it. To bolster my willpower, I imagined that on the other side of this tunnel, light and fresh mountain air called to me. A spark of hope ignited within me, and using that as fuel, I crawled into the darkness. The exit tunnel was largely identical to the entrance tunnel, or at least it was until about ten minutes in when I encountered a freaking fork in the mountainside. I did my best to hurl a ball of light down the fork to the right, but considering the cramped conditions, it didn't make it that far. All I could see was darkness and more darkness. Everyone on my team trailed behind me and could see even less. In that moment, I would have given anything for a shifter's sense of smell or a vampire's keen eyesight. I bet the damn vamps could see the outside light from inside the cavern. I never thought I'd think this, but being a witch sucks right now. I paused for so long that Sam, who had been bringing up the rear, asked what was going on. Her voice wobbled, like she was terrified too. Realizing that sticking in one place wasn't doing anyone a bit of good, I made an executive decision. Go left when you hit the fork, pass it on. I yelled and was reassured to hear my words echoed down the line. My hands and feet had long since gone numb from the cold and my arms ached from all the scratches on them. Needing to reaffirm my strength, I ducked my head to turn inward as I crawled and began reciting my mantras. You can do it. You can do it. You can. My head collided with hard rock. Ouch. Rubbing my head, I extended my hand and bid the light in my palm to flare. A solid wall of rock stood in front of me. I'd run right into a dead end. Tears filled my eyes. No, no, no. 
Moving forward through the tiny ass tunnel had been hard enough, but moving backward? Another possibility, even more terrible, entered my mind. What if this wasn't the exit at all? What if Francis had hidden in here and exited while I checked out Diana's arm? He was a vampire and could move in perfect silence. I probably wouldn't have heard him. I groaned and then yelped as someone rammed into me from behind, sending my skull into the rock wall a second time. Ow! Andre yelped. What's going on? Why are you stopped, Odette? It's a dead end. We have to backtrack to the fork, I said, my voice small. Andre spat out a curse, and I heard Diana moan. I'm so sorry. My voice came out in a defeated squeak. I chose wrong. I should have... Don't blame yourself, Andre interrupted. You're the only reason we've even made it this far. There's no way you could have known which direction to take. We'll figure out how to back up and get out of here. And that was exactly what we did. Painfully slowly, we inched our way backward. What seemed like an hour later, we got to the fork and reversed the order of our witch train and took the right tunnel. When light began to pierce through the darkness, I nearly burst into tears of joy. Or maybe it was frustration. If I had just chosen correctly the first time, we would have been out of the mountainside forever ago. Don't dwell on it. There's no going back. Just forward. I was still telling myself that when I emerged into the brilliant sunlight. Air filled my lungs, and a sense of appreciation for how fresh it tasted rushed over me. I was about to close my eyes to savor it when a voice from the tunnel we'd just emerged out of cut through my serenity. I can smell the witches. The trail is fresher this way. Go right, Dasha instructed. I loosed a sigh. The shifters were hot on our trail. I raised a hand over my eyes to shield them and spotted the third flag. Everyone ready to warp? Andre had been trying to clean Diana's wound out with snow, but at my word, Diana shook him off. She stepped forward with a look of determination on her face. Let's finish this. All righty. Here we go again. I conjured up the warp hole. The instant we stepped out of the warp hole, a powerful, horrible stench hit me so strongly that I almost wished I was back in the tunnel. We were in a large clearing. The pristine white snow was dotted with copious amounts of red blood. Horrifyingly enough, the source of the smell and the blood was a massive creature lying on the ground a few feet away. Blood poured from its neck, and a mouthful of rotten teeth was open wide in death. My stomach heaved, and I clapped my hands over my eyes, wanting to block out what I could never unsee. Released the spellcaster's troll, a voice boomed from above. My spine stiffened. The spellcaster's troll? Was that what the thing on the ground was? Now we had to face one, too? In answer, the sound of lifting metal gates hit my ears, followed by a groan. Andres, don't tell me that is what I think it is, I whispered, still unable to uncover my eyes. Okay, I won't tell you, but I'm guessing you know, seeing as some asshole just announced it, Sam muttered, her tone dark. Somewhere in the woods, a creature roared, deep and furious. My stomach tightened. Fine. We had to defeat a mountain troll. I opened my eyes once again. Hesitantly, they flitted to the dead creature on the ground. Someone, the vampires I suspected, had already completed their task. No doubt they would finish the event at any minute. Confirming my beliefs, cheering arose from the mountainside. A whistle pierced the air and celebratory music began to play. Yup, the vampires had just finished the first event of the spy games. I didn't have time to dwell on that annoyance for much longer, because the next second, our troll made an appearance through the trees. He was bounding toward us, knocking over full-grown pines with a sweep of his arm as he went. The creature was at least 25 feet tall, with a forehead like a Neanderthal's, and lips that were puffy and red and covered in blood. I didn't want to think about what the troll had been eating before they'd released him, although I was glad that he'd eaten something. Surely a troll that had just been fed would be less likely to want to chew on us, right? I hoped so, but truth be told, I didn't know the slightest thing about trolls. They weren't something that spies had to deal with, at least 
I hadn't thought they were. Clearly, whoever designed the spy games believed differently. Anyone know of a spell to knock out a troll? I hoped unconsciousness would be sufficient. As gross as the creature was, the idea of killing it for sport made my stomach roll. Coming up blank, Sam said, her teeth chattering. Same, Andre agreed. Oh my god, what's the use of having third years with us if they don't know everything? I turned to Diana, who had remained oddly silent, and saw she was gritting her teeth so hard that the blood vessels in the side of her face were popping. My eyes shot to her arm, and I gasped. The gash there had widened and become puffy. Now her arm was the size of her thigh. Everyone circle up around Diana, I said. Diana, if you get a good shot, take it. Otherwise, do what you can to protect us. She jerked a nod, and we formed a ring of protection around her. Since no one knew what they were doing, I prepared to take the first shot. Using techniques I'd learned in battle magic, I harnessed the prodigious fear and anger I was experiencing and aimed it at the troll. Fuchsia magic burst from my hands and slammed into his chest. The creature stopped dead in his tracks. He glanced down, and my gaze followed. There was nothing there, not so much as a tiny cut. Apparently, coming to the same conclusion, the troll released another roar and continued his charge. Crap, I muttered. We can keep pummeling him with battle magic, but unless you guys have some serious pent-up issues, I don't know if that will work. I don't think it would anyway, Sam said. For the first time since we started this stupid event, her voice sounded strong and sure. But I actually might have an idea. Andre, conjure me a blade. My eyebrows furrowed. As a crucible student, she should be able to conjure a blade. I can do it. Sam assured me, reading my expression, but I'll need every ounce of energy I possess to enact my plan. What do you need us to do? Andre asked, handing her a dagger. A troll's skin is notoriously thick, which is why Odette's magic wasn't effective. I need you to distract him so I can latch onto his leg. My heart began to thunder. The freaking ground was shaking with the troll's steps, and Sam wanted to ride its leg? Why? I squeaked as I shot off another blast of magic, hoping to hold the beast off. It slammed into his cheek, but didn't do jack. So I can carve a rune into his skin, Sam said. It's the only way. I decided to take her word for it, because the next moment, the troll was upon us, his stinky breath bearing down as he released a hair-raising roar. Andre and I flanked him and hurled beams of power one after the other to distract the beast. Diana remained just behind Sam, shooting magic at the creature when she could get a clear shot. Sam, the crazy-ass girl, continued to inch closer to the troll. At one point, the troll lashed out at her, swinging his hand. By some miracle, she leapt out of the way and twirled to land behind his calf. He noticed but I spewed a blaze of fuchsia magic at him to distract him. It worked, and the troll focused on me once again. He swiped at me. I darted backward just in time. Hurry, Sam, Andre shouted, attacking the troll from the other side. I'm going. It's got to be just right, and he keeps moving. A massive hand swung by me again, reminding me that I should be paying attention to the grunting beast and not Sam. Retreating faster this time, I came up against the body of the dead troll before spinning and slamming the living troll's kneecap with another stream of magic. The troll roared and lurched at me. My heart raced, and I turned to run. But like an idiot, I forgot where I was and tripped over the dead troll. My arm landed in its mouth, and when I tried to yank it back, it wouldn't budge. Crap, crap, crap. I twisted and caught a flash of our opponent flying toward me, but before I could figure out a way to save myself, he slammed into my body, and my world went black. <laughs>